Okay, <laughs> we're live, how exciting. It's all a bit new, uh, an event completely online like this, but um, thank you for joining us, um, whoever the, whoever's with us now or for watching on replay. Um, I'm John Bingham Hall, I'm the director of Teatro Mundi. Uh, we're a research center based in... I can hear myself. I'll continue, or shall I start again? Um, yeah, so uh, I'm the director of Teatro Mundi. We're a research centre um, based in both London and Paris uh, and working between the two. Um, and we, this is Crafting a Sonic Urbanism, Listening to Non-Human Life, co-organised by Teatro Mundi and by the Institut de Recherche Interdisciplinaire sur les Enjeux Sociaux, led by Arnaud Esquire, who is with me as well. Um, so Teatro Mundi um, takes the idea of the world as a stage, uh, of the city as theatre, uh, to open up new approaches to, to city making and urban, urban um, practice. In one sense, we take this metaphor um, as a way to think about the physical and cultural infrastructures that stage public life. Uh, and in the other sense, we take the stage as a kind of real set of crafts, of ways of making reality that we see on stage, things like choreography, composition, writing, uh, even lighting and sound design. Teatro Mundi was founded by Richard Sennett, a sociologist and musician. Um, and in his work, he takes the arts, uh, particularly the performing arts, not as a product to be kind of analyzed uh, or as a metaphor, but actually as a way of engaging with materials, uh, with materiality, with ideas, with other people, uh, things that can teach us how to both uh, stage, mettre en scène, uh, and to inhabit complex worlds, uh, complex urban worlds with sensitivity and with imagination. So, Sonic urbanism uh, for us, for Teatro Mundi, is not about soundscapes uh, as a product of urban life, but more about sonic crafts for understanding, inhabiting, imagining, and making cities. Uh, this series of colloquia, of conferences, uh, of which this is the third, is an attempt to map out some of those crafts. Uh, to build a body of knowledge and a network of practitioners that can support a widening of what it means to do urbanism through contact and, and exchange with a whole range of ways of working coming from sound. Like much of Teatro Mundi's work, um, this uh, series of conferences has its genesis in a set of informal discussions and workshops that took place uh, in Paris in 2016 and 17, um, as part of Richard Sennett's research chair at the Collège d'Études Mondiales. This um, set of meetings, Atelier Théâtre Mundi, we called it, brought together architects, urban designers, composers, opera makers, um, and asked them to start from a shared set of questions, like, what does a sociable acoustic sound like? From, this, from these conversations uh, grew a creative project in social acoustics. Um, in our first meeting, the opera director, Alexandre Lacroix, led an experiment using voices and names to explore the acoustic space of Chapelle Chabon, a wasteland at the time in the north of Paris. And after three years of workshops, uh, performance experiments, artistic residencies, discussions with planners, architects, and landscape designers, uh, Teatro Mundi and Alexandre Lacroix uh, will see a project, uh, Voix, V-O-I-E-X-S, uh, see its conclusion in a major public performance at the new Chapelle Chabon Park uh, in the 18th arrondissement on the 15th of May. But this uh, colloquium, this series of events was imagined in the first place as a setting to kind of discuss this artistic project as an example of sonic urbanism, as an example of uh, the ways that performance can make an empty place become social, uh, then how the amplified voice within this performance can be a political act, uh, giving us uh, part of the background for our second colloquium um, in 2019, Sonic Urbanism, the Political Voice. 
And then finally, this theme continues to resonate with, uh, with this project, the way that the wild overgrowth of Chapelle Chabon is captured in sound uh, by composer Marta Gentilucci and brought back into life in the new park. Uh, so before we go on to explore further uh, what we mean by listening to non-human life, I just want to thank a few key people for helping make today uh, possible. Firstly, all of those, of course, who generously proposed uh, presentations, performances, films uh, to share with us today and who you'll be seeing throughout the rest of the day. Uh, all of those who helped um, to, um, who gave their intellectual input in the difficult task of choosing between those proposals <clears throat> and helping shape the theme of today. Uh, Ossian Ragusi, Garcia Zunian, Justinian Tribillon, and Arno Esquerre, the scientific committee that uh, co-organized this event. All my colleagues at Teatro Mundi, uh, particularly in this case, Lou Marcelin, for her work in organizing this event, um, and also the incredibly supportive team at Gaëté Lyrique for welcoming and hosting us uh, today, even if we would have hoped to be with you all in this wonderful room that we're in, but who are helping us stream to you, uh, Clémence, Paul Elliot, uh, Alexis, and, and also many others, I'm sure that uh, I, I've forgotten or haven't met yet even, who work here at Gaëté Lyrique to make it um, possible. And finally, again, Arno Esquerre and uh, Estelle Girard and all of their colleagues at the Institut de Recherche Interdisciplinaire, so les enjeux sociaux, at the URSS uh, in Paris uh, for supporting and co-organizing this event. Uh, and with that, for now, I'll hand you over to Arno. Thank you, thank you, John. Um, so I'm Arno Esquire, director of the Institute of Research Interdisciplinary sur les enjeux sociaux. And the COVID has uh, an effect on the language. John's French is now perfect because he lives in France. <laughs> and for me, my English has become worse. <laughs> um, but during the, the previous edition, in uh, 19, we, we look at the political voice in the city. We asked uh, ourselves in particular how voices of protest could be heard in urban space without being covered by charter, or how it was possible to speak to give voice, or what were the spaces of silence in urban space. But we had remained limited by human voices. The idea of this new discussion is to broaden the reflection on how voices are emitted and heard in the city to the non-human. When we speak of non-human, we are talking at the same time to animals, plants, stones, and to any artifact which emits a sound or a wave. Since the 80s and the 90s, theories have developed from science studies that takes more account of non-humans in the way they are networked with humans. These non-humans can be robots, jellyfish, blackbirds, or of course, viruses. At the same time, we also took account the fact that in anthropology, artifacts could have an agency. This work, and in particular, the work of the philosopher Bruno Latour, became very important with the awareness of climate change and the concept of the Anthropocene, because it was necessary to take into account in the organization of human collective life or non-human on Earth. One question today is what kind of relationship humans have with the non-human beings since they have so many different modes of existence. And among these relationships, we can ask the question of voice and urban space. Another question is, at what point in time listening to a non-human sound can be recognized as a voice and if a dialogue can be? The horizon always remains political. It's a question in a collective occupying a space of giving a place to
to a non-human beings by making them audible. Merci beaucoup, Arnaud. Um, et uh, oui, bonjour aussi uh, à nos publics, uh, nos auditeurs francophones. Um, en fait, on, on va vous présenter toute une journée en anglais. Uh, et je suis privilégié de, de pouvoir uh, être dans ma langue. Mais uh, je me mets un petit peu uh, à l'autre uh, pied pour un moment pour dire uh, bonjour aussi uh, uh, oui, um, aux, uh, aux francophones. Um, So I would like to just um, try something that I haven't tried before to just open up um, and follow on from what Arno just said uh, to dig in a little more to um, the non-human in our, in our contemporary culture, in our contemporary moment. I'm just going to share my screen. Great. In fact, just before I continue to talk, you're just going to hear some music for a little just for a minute. How have we tried to listen to non-human voices? Dialogue and interdependence between species are nothing new. More there's something lost, perhaps. What we call the Anthropocene is not so much marked by an absence of non-human voices as a deafness to them. Many musicians, though, have remained attentive. There's a long history of animal sound in music, perhaps even an even longer history in which what we understand now as music was already being played before any human imagined themselves as separate from the non-human world. I'm not going to try to tell this or any particular history, but rather to point to a few curiosities that speak to what feels to me like a popular moment of hearing anew. A mediatization and a circulation of non-human voice that's growing with the technologies that allow for this circulation, technologies of electronic music, of media, uh, and the internet. Could this moment of circulation and of audibility of non-human voices capture the interest of the many? Metaphors of the so-called animal kingdom permeate toxic ideas of cities. Alpha males, the survival of the fittest, in a concrete jungle. But when ethologists look closer at animal behaviors, they find cooperation, care, empathy, tolerance, and social complexity. At their best, these are the behaviors that cities can also instill in us when we live closely together and we learn to share. So why can only humans be thought of as citizens of cities? Continue to enjoy the music. I'll continue soon. What new infrastructures of communication might be needed to cooperate with our non-human neighbors?
There's a temptation to translate non-human voices into our own systems for this infrastructure, our systems of writing, of knowledge, and of values. It's a start. It makes us feel like we're reaching out. An Instagram account that transcribes animal calls into Western classical notation can gain 25,000 followers. People like to feel that they can read from the same hymn sheet. But this still keeps humans at the center. We see this in the way city governments like Paris's talk of rewilding, of nature as a service, helping us combat heat and pollution, a way of mitigating the harm that we do ourselves. We see this uh, also in sensationalized representations of things like mycelium networks. If trees have an internet too, our addiction to networked, uh, to networked technologies must be natural. Is there an opportunity now in this sense of awe and urgency with which so many people encounter these perhaps sensationalized or humanized or mediatized representations of a world that's way beyond the human? What will it take to go beyond rewilding as an appropriation of nature and rather towards wildness uh, as a form of practice in which we relinquish control and allow ourselves ways of making, allow our ways of making habitat to be expanded by our enmeshments with more than human others? How could we go towards the rights of non-humans to urban life uh, even? There's an origin story in which magic mushrooms may have helped us become human. And there's certainly a lot of people at the moment who think that magic mushrooms might be the thing to help us learn how to be human in a way that will not bring about our own demise. Magic mushrooms have emerged from the countercultural and they've been adopted as part of a techno aesthetics of productivity and creativity along with a lot of other psychedelics. But this represents a kind of readiness, I think, for an expanded way of seeing the boundaries between human and non-human, animal, fungal, technological, seeing these boundaries as blurred. Take, uh, for example, a TikTok account. A TikTok account that gained over a third of a million followers by making mushrooms talk. So what does an urbanism of interspecies sonic cooperation sound and look like? Um, I don't know, which is why we organize this event. So I hope throughout today, we'll start to build a picture of the practices that uh, constitute it. But I would just like to start with a couple of thoughts of my own, a couple of starting points. The sonic urbanism uh, is not about making quieter cities. It's rather about looking beyond architecture and urban design to find the tools for a decol decol decolonization of acoustic space, the tools to open up room for a cacophony of presence uh, for all of those othered and drowned out by the dominant voices and dominant acoustics. And also that listening to non-human life doesn't mean we're just talking about sound, um, but rather about voice, as Arno was saying. Voice, uh, as well as uh, the sound that we make or the sound that any being makes, consists also of silent means of protest, uh, consent, expression of preference, 
Uh, voice also is a purposeful claiming of presence beyond the simple fact uh, of, of being visible. Um, and then listening with our ears, but also by other means uh, for these voices, uh, for these claiming, this claiming of presence, for these contestations uh, beyond the human, which to quote Vincent Desprez, who paraphrased also Donna Haraway, um, because multiplying uh, worlds could make our own more habitable. Um, so to talk through a little bit what's going to happen for the rest of the day, um, you're going to see uh, from here three panels uh, with uh, three presentations each, uh, chaired and framed uh, by Lou Marcelin, who will be coming to us from London in a moment, uh, and then by Arno Esqueret and by Justinien Tribion, uh, who are both here at Gaiti Lyrique. Um, and um, on the stream, hopefully, you can see a chat box. We can't see it at the moment. Um, but um, please, please use that through the day to ask questions, uh, to add thoughts, uh, to kind of also build up more of a collective um, conversation about, about this, what this sonic urbanism uh, can mean. Uh, so yeah, please, please use that. Um, stay on the same link throughout the day, the same uh, streaming link until 6 p.m. Um, and this afternoon, we will also have a roundtable conversation with uh, the artists whose films form an online exhibition on the Teatro Mundi website. Uh, and the link for that is on the Gaiti Lyrique website, on the Facebook event, and we can also put it on the chat, I think, in a bit. Um, and I really encourage you also to enjoy the films uh, on that page, on that exhibition, uh, in, the, in the breaks, through the day, as a way of also expanding on these conversations, and then we'll be uh, digging into the strategies that they propose uh, this afternoon. Uh, and then we will be swapping links, um, and this evening for two performances. Um, one coming to us from Belfast via Oxford, the other beaming live from multiple locations in Lagos in Nigeria via a studio in Spain. So that's incredibly exciting and slightly terrifying to think about. Um, and they will be introduced by Gassia Uzunian, another member of our scientific uh, committee and uh, professor of music at Oxford University. Um, and yeah, so at 6.15, we will be on a different link, which is also on the program page of uh, Goethe Lyrique. It's on the Facebook event, and we will keep posting all of these links, I hope, in the chat. Um, and I guess finally, just to say, um, yeah, we'll do our best through this day of multiple uh, locations, technologies, um, overlapping media, um, but bear with us through any disruption. Um, while our presenters join us from far and wide. Um, and as I said, yeah, please, please enjoy, the, look at the exhibition as part of the day. Please use the chat to communicate with us. Any other thoughts? Oh, no. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, um, the presentations will be, I think, between 10 and 20 minutes each. Uh, so hopefully leaving um, a chance to, uh, for, to bring your, com your um, comments and, and questions into the conversation um, at the end of the panel. So that like share those through the whole panel and then the, the chairs will be able to um, have a look at those and, and bring questions into the panel, but we won't be able to communicate directly with our cher public out there um, all over the world, hopefully. Um, so perhaps what we'll do is wrap up there and in four or five minutes time, we'll be starting the first panel, um, which will be called, what did I call it? Non-human voices, but I'll leave uh, Lou Atessa Marcelin, uh, studio manager at Teatro Mundi, amongst many other things that she will, I'm sure, tell you uh, to introduce that in a few minutes time. Okay, bon, uh, bonjour tout le monde. Um, I'm going to switch into English. 
Um, sorry, I was not aware I was actually on. Um, so, uh, as John said, I'm Louette et Saint-Marcelin. I work for Teatro Mundi as studio manager, um, which is an amazing environment to be in. Uh, but I also, in my um, independent work, direct uh, a platform, a research platform called Diaspore, uh, which focus on ideas of ecosophy in the ecological framework, which interconnects social and environmental spheres. And I'm also co-directing with Paquita Milville, um, School of Rance, an interdisciplinary school exploring questions of ecologies within uh, societal paradigms. The school is based in Picardy at the moment, although we are uh, also going to be uh, nomadic and act as a learning hub for research and professional development. And we welcome creatives to undertake experimental and critically aware projects offering new reading of the landscape. Um, I'm really pleased to be sharing this panel on non-human voice this morning um, with uh, Nuno Dalouz. Elahe Karimnya and Sepide Karami, and Ahmed and Rashid Bin Shabib. Um, I will just introduce um, very briefly ideas of non-human voice, and then I will leave um, the artists to, to present their work. Alors. Communication generating flows of images no one has the stomach to digest. Golden metals going back to the landfill where they will be harvested for the second time. Micronuclear waves reach out to my plate whilst I'm sunbathing in LED lights listening to love songs. I hear a tip and a tap and horrific yet mesmerizing sounds flickering around my cognitive senses. I'm munching on a rubber carrot, producing the sound of the enchanted flute as a bee gently buzzing is ready to land on the precious pistil. A half asleep flower wakes up in a rage and throws her smartphone at the face of her inquisitor, whilst it with incredible dexterity tweeting the incident to her community of followers, which in a flash goes viral. Resistance is the first move, listening is the strategy, conversation comes next. I would like now to just share um, an excerpt of um, um, where is the name of this woman? Um, sorry. Um, I'd like to share with you just an excerpt of um, The Swarm, which is a choral sound piece by composer Eloise Tunstall, Behrens, and Eau Claire, taking inspiration from the vibrations which with which bees communicate and the pattern created by their social organization. I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, so. What are we referring to when we talk about the voice? From my human perspective, I portrayed the organ first, loved at the back of my throat, with its glottis dangling to sounds generated through my larynx, fed by the oxygen I expel after each breath out of my lungs. To have a voice is also to have a singular view on the world. It is to be heard, to be seen, to be felt. But how does it translate for more than humans? What voices do they hold? How can we attune ourselves to hear beyond our humanity? Annette Singh talks about acquiring tools for unpacking the material, to find new relations and apparatus for interspecies attunements. 
How can we vibrate to the pulsation of bees, the cry of grass, the chorus of mycelium? As Tsing puts it, how can we be less static in our species and become more familiar with others without imposing our human voice? How can we reverse negative and unproductive processes of extractions into positive and forward thinking narratives? The following presentations attempt to retell stories of intimacies shared between species, of migratory voyage and displacements, silence voices and stories of resistance shared by multitudes in an attempt to reclaim their ability to coexist through space and time. Nuno Dalouz, in his work, Ecopolitics for Interspecies Resistance, follows the monk and ring-necked parakeets, who noisily reclaim the conflicting nature of our mutually constructed soundscapes, while Elahe Karimia and Sepide Karami, with when parts of Tehran, confess, embarks us on a journey recalling intimate stories of forbidden loves, displaced city dwellers, and forces that have silenced them. Finally, Hamed and Rashid bin Chabib, with magnetic reception, will unpack the mechanism of magnetic reception and explore our productive relationship with these material manifestations in nature and pose the question of the sonic as a non-acoustic instrument in need of further exploration. We we'll now leave the uh, Nuno to take over and present his work, Co-Politics for Interspecies Resistance. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, first, thank you. It's great to be here with you, uh, kind of in a non space, so to speak, uh, but to speak from very specific places. So I will start sharing my screen. So I guess you can now see the presentation at least. Is that correct? Even if, uh, even if you can't, I'll start. So good morning. Um, I'll start with a recording that actually was done in a late afternoon in Athens at the National Gardens in uh, September 2017. The National Gardens in Athens was originally designed as a botanical garden uh, belonging to the old royal palace, uh, the building that today houses the Greek parliament in front of the iconic Syntagma Square. This was recorded uh, at sunset and we can hear strong steps from joggers, voices of different visitors just strolling around, as well as the continuous low frequency hum of city traffic at a distance. Occasionally, cicadas will join in, but I'm not sure what you can actually hear from this or how well you can uh, hear me speaking through this recording. Uh, but the most constant and loud sound in these recordings are these loud high pitched shrieks and cries. And they're the callings of ring necked parakeets that nest in large groups in the canopy of the trees in the park. So at that specific moment of the day and of the year, their callings was filling the air and there were almost no other bird sounds to be heard. They were occupying kind of solely that upper registry of the human audible frequency range. 
but ring-neck parakeets are native to certain parts of Africa and the Indian subcontinent. And if they have found their way to Athens, it was not by traditional migratory routes. They're incapable of flying long distance, but they were brought to be sold and kept as pets. They have either escaped captivity or were voluntarily released by former owners. And they have managed to adapt, to find shelter, to find food and find partners. We can count already several generations in Athens, but actually recordings like this one could have been made in many other European cities over the last four decades. Their numbers are directly linked to their popularity as pets in the 1980s and 90s. And only recently was their sale restricted by the European Union as they were given the status of invasive alien species. According to ParrotNet, the European Network on Invasive Parakeets, an academic research body based in the University of Kent in the United Kingdom, these ring-necked parakeets, as well as monk parakeets, are among the top 100 worst alien species in Europe, since they have, quote, began to pose problems in urban and rural areas, such as disturbance to humans, competition with native wildlife, and increasingly as an agricultural pest. But I believe that their naturalization and acclimatization tells us much more about our current environmental predicament. Again, according to ParrotNet, Farming practices that adapt to global climate change and the warmer Europe facilitate the continued expansion of parakeet populations, amplifying the problems that parakeets pose for European agroeconomy. Farming practices will increasingly have to adapt to warmer climates. For example, maize, pecan nuts, and sunflower will become more popular crops as mean temperatures will rise. Parakeets are widely documented as being a pest of these crops. Therefore, climate-driven expansion of parakeet population across Europe will place increasingly more pressure on the economy." End quote. So the acclimatization of these parakeets is actually taking place in tandem with temperatures rising all around the world, which is, of course, the courtesy of the resorptive effect of industrial and extractive activities and the consequent increase in greenhouse gases emissions. So ParrotNet explicitly tells us that as Europe's climate starts to increasingly resemble the ones that are endemic to these birds, the agroeconomic plantation model that it's been our paradigm won't change. And so now we are seeing efforts to reduce our control parakeet populations while leaving systemic causes for such an environmental catastrophe unaddressed. So these parakeets are still described as exotic, but their calls and sounds are populating the sonic space of European cities for some time now. Their loud sounds produced by these once domesticated pets, but now turned feral, show us that the intended and unintended shifts resulting from globalization are continuations of colonial bonds that are continued to be fostered and continue to be invisible. The historical process of planting and transplanting humans and non-humans alike is central to the crisis facing us today. And as much as the history of European exceptionalism tries to contain and deface the agency of such displaced and marginalized beings, well, the raucous and noisy song of these exotic invasive aliens reclaims another mode of inhabiting and co-inhabiting this world. Case in point, Madrid. I made this recording one early morning in December 2017 
at the Paseo del Prado, one of the busiest avenues that cuts through the city center and hosts the famous Museum del Prado, the Botanical Gardens, but also City Hall, the Navy, and many other institutions. Lining up the museum, we find tall cedar and pine trees that are preferred by monk parakeets to nest. Each nest can host up to 40 or 50 different couples in what are actual parakeet buildings. They're intricate constructions that can weigh up to 40 or 50 kilos on average, and they have been deemed a public health hazard if they were to fall on someone's head. According to the head of Madrid City Hall's Biodiversity Division, Santiago Soria Carreras, quote, hacen ruidos considerados molestos, transmiten enfermedades a otras aves, se comen su alimento y expulsan a otras especies. Hasta el momento, los nidos no han provocado ningún daño a personas, aunque la administración ha recibido 197 quejas de vecinos desde enero hasta agosto de 2019. End quote. Displaced by human economic activity and having to carve their own ecological niches in European urban environments, the parakeet's physical presence is not inconspicuous at all, quite the contrary. It's accompanied by this constant sound output that is are hardly drowned out by the relentless car traffic of the Paseo del Prado. Turns out monk parakeets make use of their calls, not so much as clear one-way messages, but as a form of keeping communication channels open and flowing. They keep their communication channels hot by constantly feeding them with signals, indifferent to the signal-to-noise ratio of the medium. So here, noise is the message. A steady stream amounts to both information and effect. It attests to a healthy exchange and to the soundness of their community. But it also means that any transmission drop is heavy with meaning. Silence is an important telltale, as it may imply an impending danger or threat. Quote, Serán muy difíciles de capturar. Además, son unos animales tremendamente listos y sociales, y se avisan entre ellos. Por lo que si captura a uno de una bandada, ya no se logrará cazar a otro en semanas. End quote. This is a quote by Juan Carlos del Moral that uh, participates in the Spanish Ornithological Society, BirdLife, and they have been studying the parakeet populations in Madrid for some time now. But still here, we find misunderstandings that originate in a classic nature-culture divide of Western epistemologies. For example, the noise grievances filed by Madrid inhabitants uh, with the central administration are being used as one of the reasons for an extermination program that they expect to conduct that will reduce parakeet populations by around 90%. So we're talking about the killing of around 12,000 birds. This current cabinet, right wing, has come to power in May 2019 with the support of the far right. And this was one of their first environmental measures. But so far, nothing has happened. The current pandemic, the public health crisis, last spring lockdown measures, and then court injunctions on the contracts, and even more recently, the Philomena snowstorm that heavily affected Madrid in January, have all played into delaying the extermination program. Um, still, City Hall assures that the controlled killings will go ahead. And um, they have reminded uh, the public that the parakeets are classified as invasive alien, and so they can go ahead with such program. In October 2019, City Hall, um, their representative, also said, quote, Los que vienen de fuera y vienen en plan agresivo no deben estar y no tienen el mismo derecho ecológico a la vida porque están donde no deben estar y están causando daño a los que sí tienen que estar. End quote. Such clear streaks of human exceptionalism equate conservationist tenets with the necro biopolitical mandate that reduce ecological processes to zootechnical management. And here I feel we can definitely hear the historical echoes of what Ecuadorian researcher Mayra Esteves Trujillo has called the colonial regime of sonority. 
the colonial regime set the basis for the conceptual separation of peoples and nature, and it privileged the part of humanity that was deemed human and divine-like and could exploit other people and organisms in the planet. Estebas Trujillo argues that acoustic ecology did not investigate deeply enough the relations of power, domination, and control that are at play in what is today South American post-colonial soundscape. How those environments were sonically transformed by the still ongoing silencing of indigenous peoples, the noises of the extractivist industrial complex, and the silencing that comes with the loss of biodiversity and its replacement by monocultural plantations. Spanish researcher and curator José Luis Espejo frames it as such, quote, silencio es una construcción cultural y que no es la ausencia de sonidos, sino un sistema para administrarlos. So that, that same exact system is still trying to enforce itself in Europe in the form of once important pets that are now deemed nuisance, helps show that colonial wounds are far from healed. These birds have traveled the same routes of dispossession and extraction that many other peoples, animals, etc. And they now play an important part in showing that European cities are nature too, historically and biologically. These spaces that are usually devoid of other solidarities, of other types of communion than those developed through humans, and have long been thought of as exterior to nature, nature being outside, they tend to feature heavily disturbed and impoverished socio-biological networks. So it is not by chance that these still called exotic parakeets are now a common feature of European urban areas. They are occupying spaces that were already previously disturbed and were simplified enough in order to be invadable in the first place. Perhaps I would argue that that impoverishment can now be loudly heard and questioned by the parakeet's calls and cries. Their sounds are a protest song against an historical, economical, and political system that has consistently refused to acknowledge them. So now I will again try to make myself heard among their voices, arguing for the right to make noise and be heard. So I wish to engage again with these green aliens as homegrown resistance that are neither exotic nor foreign, and that remind us that outside is within. So I'm now playing a recording I made in Lisbon in 2019, which feels incredibly long ago, after a year that were just too many years packed in one. Up until the first lockdown measures were enacted, Lisbon was experiencing a massive influx of tourism that started right after the end of austerity measures that were enforced by lenders, the European Central Bank, the IMF and the European Union between 2011 and 15. So following that deep economic recession, Lisbon has been witnessing a boom in construction and gentrification that started with low cost air travel and the rise in short term rental through Airbnb. As the city was being swept by public and private investment that was exclusively funneled towards real estate speculation and holdings, there came the relentless rhythm of air traffic. Statistics pointed towards four minutes between landings and between takeoffs, roughly two minutes between planes alternating on the airport's sole runway. So this increase in air traffic noise was never addressed by public authorities and neither its incessant rhythm. So the same influx that first brought ring-necked parakeets and monk parakeets to Europe was now drowning their calls. Somehow most parakeet colonies in Lisbon are in public parts in the vicinity of the airport or sit directly beneath the approach corridor. With the deafening roar of airplane turbines drowning any other sounds out, parakeets continue to animate their lively ongoing conversation against such loud and clear example of turbo capitalism. They pose as the loud and noisy resistors to all attempts at silencing them. And they are standing against biological dispoliation and ecological dispossession, right at the center of the seats of power that have so many 
for so many centuries try to eradicate the difference and otherness that they sing. So our old pets now classified as illegal aliens, maybe some of our best teachers that trying to live together amidst the rubble of history. Thank you. Thank you, Nuno. Um, so next, care. next, okay. Next, we will we have Elahe um, and Sepide for when parts of Tehran confess. I leave it to you. Okay. Hi, Elahe. Hi, Sepide. Hello. Um. Just to share my screen. Um, sorry, just a moment. Um, um, good morning, everyone. Um, of course, good morning to those of you who are in the morning part of the earth. Um, my name is Sepide Karami, and I am a postdoctoral researcher at Edinburgh School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture. I'm an architect, writer, and researcher, and I should be, I should say that I'm extremely pleased um, to be here in this event. Thank you, Sepide. Good morning, everyone. My name is Elahe Karimia. I'm an associate at Teatro Mundi. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this very well organized colloquium. It's nice to sit on the other side now. <laughs> um, I'm an architect and researcher and uh, today we are um, both pleased to present as Parrots of Tehran. Um, when Parrots of Tehran confess um, um, has been a working process and an experiment that um, I should also say that I'm very thankful to, to Elahe to actually um, give me such a pleasure to work with her. Um, so um, it will be less than a 20 minutes presentation. So hope you bear with us. Tehran, lolling on the foot of the mountains and looking at her belly, crisscrossed by the highways and narrow alleys. In a carefree manner, she's listening to the sounds of crimes, swears, forbidden loves. Cars rush along the highways, taxis hoot around the crossroads, passers-by slow down in the vicinity of the street acrobats. Beggars do their best to lay a guilt trip on the well-dressed citizens. Policemen ignore petty crimes. Cat tear open rubbish bags. Stray dogs cool off in narrow canals. Pickpockets scream about their bad luck. Developers shading their eyes with their hands check the cranes moving across the, the sky. Cranes swing in circle over the city. Their unoiled joints send squeaks into the surrounding mountains. Tehran scratches its belly and burps. Its sound shakes the high rises and tall trees. Snoozing parrots fly off the trees in old gardens and the sky becomes ornamented by their bright green drifting bodies. Oh, Tehran, your love killed me. Tehran and parrots have old sonic relationships. They always say a thousand parrots flying around Tehran are brought to Iran from India at some point. And then 
and as non-migratory birds, they had to establish a life far from home. This explains why in Persian literature, parrots are the symbol of loneliness, exile, separation from one's origin, and infinite longing for home. We all heard that parrots as local lear learners have the ability to imitate human speech. But what do they hear? Oh, Marjan, your love killed me. Dash Akol, the short story by the Iranian writer Sadr Hedayat, ends with the parrot imitating the rough voice of its master and saying, Marjan, your love killed me. In the story, the secret love confession is ultimately made by Herod, the only companion to Dash Akol, the protagonist, the lover, who never dared to confess his love to Marjan. Drunken with grief and alcohol, Dash Akol dies after being stabbed in a fight on Marjan's wedding. His confession of love to Marjan, being only spelled in the mirror, was well memorized by the parrot that witnessed him suffering and longing for over seven years in his solitude. When the parrot in the cage was given to Marjan after Dash Akol's death, it knew how to send a message of the deceased lover. Parrots have witnessed serious love stories while survived serious air and noise pollution. Those who, found, those who found their way out of cage established home on top of tall trees in the scattered gardens among highways, high rises, and densely built city of Tehran. They have been listening to this widely growing megalopolis, having known how little is the possibility to find a better home. We made it home invaded or confiscated, who cares? But parrots care. They have listened to conversations around the transformation of these gardens. They have heard trees falling, dwellers leaving, flags changing, names and labels adjusting. They have heard love confessions, but they listened with care. Parrot's act of listening is performative. In the famous fable, the, pa the Parrot and the Merchant, written by the 13th century Persian poet and philosopher, Molana Rumi, this performative act of listening is the core of the story. A merchant who keeps a parrot in a cage is about to travel to India on business and asks the parrot if he has any message to send to his kinsmen in that country. The parrot asks him to tell them that she was kept confined in a cage. The merchant promised to deliver this message and on reaching India, duly delivered it to the first flock of parrots he saw. On hearing it, one of them at once fell down dead. The merchant was upset with his own parrot for having sent such a fatal message and on his return home sharply, rebuked his parrot for doing so. But the parrot no sooner heard the merchant's tale than he too fell down dead in his cage. The merchant, after lamenting his death, took his corpse out of the cage and threw it away. But to his surprise, the corpse immediately recovered life and flew away explaining that the Indian parrot had only feigned death 
to suggest this way of escaping from confinement in a cage. Tehran, the last lover in the cacophony of political, social, and environmental crisis, has feigned death thousands of times. Parrots of Tehran have imitated the feigned death in order to escape the cage and to take refuge in the gardens. They have turned those gardens into their own territory over the complex structure of the city. Parrots would like to invite you to explore these territories by following their short stories taking place in their homes in these three urban stages of an abandoned garden, an embassy, and an abandoned barrack. In these three places, parrots have developed their sonic relationship with Tehran through mirroring, eavesdropping, and fooling. Through these acts, they narrate the story of many who, have, who had to flee from their homes and who ended up in never-ending longing for their lovers from whom they were separated. Parrots of Tehran have confessed the love of those in exile to Marjan, to Tehran. Do you have any messages to your kins in Tehran? Tell them I'm confined in a cage. Marjan, your love killed me. Marjan left the garden at dawn. I heard her from the tallest tree in this garden. I heard the heavy sound of her luggage dragged on the cement pathway in the garden. I heard, Marjan, your love will kill me. I heard a voice said, airport. I heard she said, yes. I heard the city rising to the dawn the ebb and flow of the viscous matter of noises, humming sounds of the city rising to the speed of the megalopolis life. From here, I have heard stories, secrets, whispers, shouts, cries, lies and laughter. I've heard swearings, affectionate words, nonsense, songs, motorcycles and car engines. I've heard crows and cats fighting over pieces of food around the bins. I've heard all your lies and secrets, you remember, but you don't want to. Oh, I heard a thief jumped off the wall on the dried leaves. He is not a thief, he's the lover. Marjan's love killed him. I hear him every night. Marjan, your love killed me. 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 Shh, I heard her giving him a box. I heard she said it's a dangerous thing. I heard he said I would hide it in a safe box. I heard she said, then how would you read it? 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 I heard she said it was a book. I heard she said with dangerous poems, with magic words. I hear him flipping through the book in the abandoned garden. I hear him say, Marjan, your love killed me.
embassy. The tall walls and barbed wires are still lower than the trees we live on. From these tall trees, we see how CCTV cameras change their directions even when we fly around them. This is one of our games when we are bored, to fool, to fool CCTV cameras. From these tall trees, we have heard people in the queues to get their visas. We've heard the sound of stamps. Approved. Rejected. Approved. Rejected. 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 Approved. Approved. Rejected. Rejected. Approved. Approved. Rejected. Approved. 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 Do you know someone in the embassy to issue me a fake visa? I know of one. Rejected. Rejected. Approved. 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 Do say chop, yet 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 do say chop. But all thrust, the chop chop, as jolo nezam, habar dor. Ozot, free, freedom. Far. Far from. Far from home in free skies of this far land. We came here from far lands and we lived in fairy tales. We escaped from the confinement of the books to the high trees of this abandoned barrack. The fairy tales come back to us in the buried sound of the barracks. Soldiers marching, the general shouting, pauses and countings. And at night? Nights of missing, of longing. Longing for their lovers. The click of a lighter. The sound of inhale. The sound of exhale. Marjan, your love killed me. You heard it? I did. Yek do se char, yek do se char, yek do se char, yek do se char. The soldier is waiting. Waiting for what? He doesn't know. Marjan, your love killed me. He said it again. Marjan, your love killed me. Tehran scratches its belly and burps. Its sound shakes the high rises and tall trees. Snoozing parrots fly off the trees in old gardens and the sky becomes ornamented by their bright green drifting bodies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now it's the last presentation um, by Rashid and Hamed. Um, Hamed, hello. Hi. <laughs> hello, everybody. That was really wonderful. Sabida and Elahi.
Wait, it says to share your computer audio. Sorry, I'm just going through something. Sorry, I, I tried um, to optimize it, but could not. Can, can you hear me? Am I? Yeah, yeah, we can hear everyone? you. Um, maybe you want to okay. share and reshare your screen. And when you reshare your screen, you just need to click optimize the optimize box. So if well, you... I've tried to do that, but it says I need to install something. So, um, oh, okay. So I think. I mean, I don't have any video uh, or audio. Okay, so that's fine. Um, that's fine. Yeah, I think, I think it should be fine. Well, um, I mean, I, I'm very happy to be here. Um, uh, thank you everybody for the wonderful presentation. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start by giving a small uh, brief about the idea of magnetic reception. And, and how we found ourselves uh, interested in the artifactual element of it. Uh, and maybe it will be more of a histographical account uh, with the narrative that we have built um, over the last year around this. So magnetic, uh, magnetoreception, the mechanism through which animals, insects, and humans can detect distance, geolocation and direction is a mechanism received through our audio agencies. It is a bioanalog device navigating us through time and space. Studied have, studies have recently demonstrated that this happens through magnetrites embedded within the acoustic anatomy of animals, giving them the ability to migrate and navigate thousands of miles since time immemorial. Although the material manifestation exists in the artifacts of beehives, pigeon towers, Polynesian sea maps, little is known about their interaction and interplay within our cities. Our infatuation with pigeon towers or dovecotes began on a recent visit to Marrakesh and Alexandria, just before the world came to a complete halt. Riddled across these North African terrains, our drives between cities, towns, and farms showed that pigeon towers defined its landscapes. Built from uh, mud, lime, clay, earth, terracotta, salt, and more recently on top of building towers assembled from scrap wood and corrugated sheets. An unmistakable urban identity within the city's fabric. Why were there so many? Why did we stop building more for nature? My mother being a master negotiator far more capable than Rashid and I in Bakhshish etiquette, managed to get us into a few houses and farms to study these towers. It was clear why these towers remained relevant within North African cities. They're part, of their they're part of their livelihood. They generate an important part of their welfare. They eat pigeons, they eat and sell their eggs, they gather their droppings for fertilizer, agriculture, and soften their leather. If you are in a remote part of North Africa, a pigeon tower can feed you, your family, and create fertilizer for your crops, which in turn can allow you to trade and generate income. In a region which faces tremendous turmoil, having a pigeon tower can mean life or death. Pigeons were part of the Middle East since the dawn of agriculture. Studies have shown that they migrated to fields that uh, farmers sowed. At first, Farmers began to breed them for food and eggs. Later, they realized their droppings made for superior fertilizer. Rich in phosphorus, potassium, and nitrogen, uh, the region's agricultural production performed far better. Farmers began to build pigeon towers, breeding as many as 1,500, producing 15 tons of annual fertilizer. Across the region, farmers diversified their crops, growing olives, grapevines, figs, and other verdures by contrasting these new fertilizer factories produced by pigeon towers. 
Pigeon and to pigeons and doves were also part of the Middle Eastern rituals, symbolism and religion. At the second temple, which stood in Jerusalem, a typical form of sacrifice by Jewish pilgrims were a pair of doves. Doves too are notably mentioned in Christian scripture. And the dove came into him at eventide and lo, in her mouth an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. They came to represent a higher purpose than production, ultimately spiritual. A painted fresco from Mari, Syria, shows a giant dove emerging from a palm tree in the pagan temple of Ishtar, dated 1700 BC. The towers began to reflect an edifying symbol with, uh, with etching and pigments that reflected societal stories as well as rituals within societies. These have then made their ways in, uh, in more uh, in, during the Renaissance times in, in uh, Florentinian paintings. And more recently with the Cezanne painting. Uh, Farmers across the Middle East from Jerusalem, Rosetta, Damascus, Baghdad, and as far as Esfahan and Tangier began to experiment in ag architectural iterations of pigeon towers. Depending on their material resources or region, different kinds of bricks, stringed courses, molded mud, and brick corniches, muqarnas, frieze bedecked these, uh, bedecked these structures. In the Levantine region, pigeon towers were mostly circular or turreted in structure. Within North Africa, its structures are either domed or mimic fort-like buildings. Across East Africa and Madagascar, pigeon towers are assembled of wood and are elevated from the ground with pitched hay roofs. However, the most symbolic of all of these are the Isfahan pigeon towers. Uh, they're majestic. Uh, turrets vaulted uh, with intricate details. Uh, each tower can provide shelter for over 15,000 pigeons. What these pigeon towers share across this vast region are their functions. They're all built with an internal honeycomb structure, which gives birds access through these uh, coupled turrets, which are then accessed by caretakers through small doors once a year to extract uh, its manure. In the western desert of Egypt, Siwa has long been a pilgrimage site for architects, known for its pigeon towers, but also its buildings. An ancient form of vernacular architecture, mostly built from kharshif, a material made of salt crystals mixed with clay and sand. The Siwani kharshif brick has become somewhat of a signature in the town's architectural identity. Small irregular shaped blocks are taken from the crust of salt lakes, cut into smaller bricks and distributed to the ma'allams and masons. It is then formed into a mud mortar, which one or two forms, which one uh, of two forms the clay, a tafla or a team. The, the dehydration process is crucial to its enduring rigidity. The salt within the mortar continues to crystallize during the drying process, forming a strong bond between the materials. The uniqueness of Siwa architecture demonstrates the urban infrastructure, which can use ecological means, mostly salt and earth, to sustain a population of 20,000. The pigeon towers of Siwa are assembled uh, using this vernacular architectural style, which is an exclusive technique native to this rural village. Most recently, contemporary architects began to experiment with these structures. Hassan Fethi and Wissa Wasaf in Egypt began uh, working closely with the uh, Harafiyin or craftsmen, creating designs beyond pigeon breeding. They experimented with potters, carpenters, masons, iterating its architectural contours. In Spain's uh, Parc Guyel, uh, Anthony Gaudi had also intentionally designed an architectural element, 
that would allow for birds and pigeons uh, to nest. Uh, during the naturalist phase, Gaudi built long terrace, uh, terrace walls and turrets that would incorporate nests allowing pigeons and a variety of avians uh, to reside in. Brazil's O Pombal pigeon tower, designed by Oscar Niemeyer in 1960, must be one of the most iconic uh, towers uh, in contemporary times. With oblong, ovate openings on two sides, this giant concrete plinth stands in the center of Fraca dos Tres Poderes, the square of the three powers. Its interior is constructed with thin rows of horizontal concrete shelves for hundreds of pigeons to perch and roost in. But the history of pigeon towers is far more complicated than its architectural and agricultural resource. These were also weaponized forms of architecture. As early as 3000 BC, Egyptians discovered that pigeons were capable of returning to a place and town uh, and the town that they were born in. They can find their way as far as 2,300 miles, it's 3,700 kilometers with a speed of up to 160 kilometers per hour. That's New York to Los Angeles in under two days, unless eaten by its nemesis, the peregrine falcon. Magneto reception is the reason why these exceptional creatures are able to navigate complex, vast uh, terrains. This is a biological sense which allows an organism to detect a magnetic field to perceive direction, altitude, or location. Unimaginable, the ability of a tiny bird to be capable of such a task. I wonder if the latest AI uh, drone technology is capable of such a task. Maybe so, maybe run out of batteries. Across history, humans were exploiting these, the use of pigeon migration. First, they were used to dispatch letters. Pigeons were then used to send uh, letters back and forth between people since the 11th century in Baghdad. Then it was used uh, by the military to send commands, encrypted messages, and other forms uh, during conflict. Uh, this was done from Waterloo to World War II. The founders of Reuters started their uh, famous news service with 45 pigeons used to deliver stock prices from Europe. Pigeon photography also became an active technique uh, in the early 20th century, invented by Julius Neubrunner, a German apothecary who also used pigeons to deliver medicine. Pigeon photography was then used for aerial reconnaissance during World War I. This technology of mobile, uh, of mobile dovecote photography, custom made with dual cameras mounted on messenger pigeons, had the greatest impact during reconnaissance missions. Still today, homing pigeons are used for smuggling. Between 2009 and 2015, pigeons have been discovered to carry cell phones, SIM cards, phone batteries, USB cords into and out of prisons in Brazil. If dynasties were able to expand and protect their empires through carrier pigeons, we have clearly underestimated our ability to communicate with nature. Yet the understanding of our biological system within our ecological network was, was disbanded with the introduction of modern technology. The instrumentalization of electromagnetism, the uh, same navigation which uh, uh, is used by pigeons, did not receive the world's attention before the electrification uh, of communication. Although rudimentary tools were using similar technologies such as compasses, dowsing, or celestial, uh, celestial navigation, the industrialization of navigation networks in many ways disrupted a balance with nature in the late 20th century as a result of newer forms of teleoconnectivity. What can pigeon towers inform us about our current anthropogenic practices? The topic of people, nature, and architecture was widely explored 
Barudovsky's Architecture Without Architects, exhibited in, MOFA, uh, in, in MoMA in 1964, and written about extensively in Rif'at Chadirji's Sifat al-Jamal fi Wa'i al-Insan, um, and Christopher Alexander's The Nature of Order. But what does this mean to us now? How can a pigeon tower relate to an architect in New York, a designer in Singapore, or in our case, urban planners in Dubai? To explore forces of coexistence beyond technology through means of symbiotic equilibrium, to unpack our evolutionary ecology and broaden questions of our performative relationship with nature. Humans and animals evolved in synchrony with our ecology. We are an iteration of a species within the same biosphere. What can pigeon towers teach us about who we are? We believe uh, in the role architecture can play. The decay of our ecological system requires renewed contracts and repivot the world to closer points of equilibrium. The dialectics of this argument does not disregard the growth in population or in many aspects, some positive implications of urbanization, but proposes an open-ended question of the interdependent nature of our socio-ecological relationship by reimagining new realities. The manifestation of our relationship with nature is symbolically represented through artifacts such as pigeon towers, not to nostalgically romanticize them, but to re-examine them with renewed eyes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amen. And thank you to all the, to everyone who just presented their work. It was really wonderful. Um, now we have a bit of time for some questions. Um, if anyone from the public has a question, please um, put it in the um, live chat and I will try to pick them up. But I'd like to start with one question um, that can be uh, for everyone really. Um, I'd like to know a bit in your respective research and practice, um, what type of uh, relations and apparatus um, are you thinking about or perhaps have you used for interspecies attunements? Easy question. <laughs> well, maybe I'll start just to, also because I still have fresh in my mind mm -hmm. uh, what you just said before in terms of uh, listening first and conversation comes next. Yeah. Um, so I guess th that would be kind of it, right? In terms of, uh, well, first of all, we're using the word tuning. Um, in order to tune, you usually have to do some type of, kind of bending work with yourself or with, um, usually with other tools. But if it's with yourself, then I guess, um, that has to come with a work on the senses. Of course, for me personally, to listen became, became that. And it's still that. And again, I'm still not sure how to move, I guess, on to this next step of actually entailing the conversation that it's not like enforcing a conversation. But um, yeah, the, the tuning work is also you said, to be done, like you have to do it constantly. So I guess like most instruments, or at least analog instruments, do need that care. I think we also need that care with our own senses. And how do you think, because I mean, how do you think you can attune, like through what processes do you think you can manage to tune yourself? I mean, you have like a technique or like some... <laughs> <laughs> of course, but I mean, uh, is that a personal question? Like, uh, because I guess that, yeah, the other artists could also definitely 
go there because there's different processes of, of, of the tuning that maybe go beyond this more, I guess, classical, just um, listening uh, activity or practice uh, that, uh, I mean, it's, it's based on many other people that have been listening before and have been talking about listening for years and years. And for me, I do take those, especially any type of advice and exercise that I can try, especially, yeah, especially, I guess, uh, outside, although it's not uh, exclusively outside. I guess it's also very important to know how to listen when you're in more private spaces. Um, yeah, so it definitely goes through, I guess, bodily exercises, how actually that listening is embodied, just like, uh, uh, yeah, physically reverberating. So it's not only based also on the ears that, of course, I do rely a lot on, but I guess other people can rely on other uh, faculties uh, to kind of like go through that same thing where, of course, yeah, those vibrations are reaching us through different means and not only through our ears. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. If you attune to yourself, you probably be more attuned to others as well. And for the architects here, um, <laughs> I was wondering, like, how would you same like apply the same ideas to like your practice as an architect, or about thinking about CG making? How would you tune maybe buildings to others, which is something I suppose you should already be doing, but maybe thinking beyond humans, like to non-humans, is it, you know, how, how are you going about thinking about these things? Ella, hey. <laughs> yeah, um, I think uh, if I relate it to the presentation or to the idea of what we presented here and um, to our practice, I think something that was quite interesting for us was more than what we hear was where to he where we hear it. So the territory was quite uh, uh, interesting and inspiring for us, because um, you know we as let's say architect for example very much relate our site based and place based and uh, parrots uh, definitely confused us with the territory. Not because of course initially they they have. Uh, flew from different land and they kind of like uh, blurred these boundaries but also in the places that they are uh, it, uh, it first of all the, the some of these places are quite private and they sound some of them are public but quite privatized and some of them are like politically uh, uh, privatized so uh, they kind of like blurred this boundary of where we listen in in a city that even though the spaces are public, even, the, even though the spaces are like gardens uh, that you expect, oh, you hear the birds, but you cannot reach there. Uh, mapping them where they are in the city was a great little, I would say, uh, lesson for us that how we, how we map out things, uh, human and non-human in, in, in a city, I would say that's, that's the, that was the first lesson I, I can say we learned. Sorry, um, I've got like a thousand screens to look at. Um, so, and um, maybe you know this is more a question for you, but um, obviously anyone who has something to say, feel free to also add. But I was wondering um, how uh, you think that the act of listening and making noise can be act of resistance for interspecies cohabitation. And what forces do they stand against? Although you did um, mention it in your presentation, but if you could expand a bit on this. Uh, well, I think it is I mean, kind of like a, a huge term for something that actually it's very, um, let's say it's very particular, right? So each place just uh, also what Eli just said in terms of well, it is kind of site-based, even though we're talking about maybe sites that have different, uh, or different scales kind of and uh, they work both let's say ground level but definitely also at the level where things are a bit more mm. um yeah, fluctuating um because of yeah birds ability to have a different connection with their own territory um 
but uh, well, the, the, this specific let's say, territory, which is, I mean, I was never even considering that uh, I would be going back to most urban places that I was kind of like trying to escape from to be able to then listen to other species and going back to it uh, because of this specific uh, bird that is not uh, kind of like pervasive in, in a lot of European cities, but it's always being told as if it's not from there, that it does not belong. Mm. Mm. It's quite incredible mm. because, well, there is definitely a rift there between the fact that they remind at all times that they're not from there, but they're kind of, they're okay with it. I mean, that's what they do. So they're, they're again, um, if, if definitely like for uh, many bird species, territory is singing or the singing comes with a certain type of territory. Um, there, uh, in these uh, cases where I did these recordings, these are definitely very uh, noisy territories, uh, but these are also very noisy birds, so to speak. I mean, they are constantly uh, yeah, making sound. Um, which definitely made me more and more aware of what then, uh, by reading, for example, the, the, the writings of uh, Jose Luis Espejo, who lives in Madrid, uh, realized how, how important it started to be, this uh, conflict within the city and within the people that live in that city. Um, and how, of course, some people really take a grudge against birds just because of the fact that they make noise. And of course, that grudge can be then, of course, manipulated and utilized uh, for other, uh, yeah, for other means, for other purposes. And I believe, yeah, we have to be very aware of how we definitely hear the others. And then this, of course, becomes such a huge metaphor for uh, ways of dealing, well, uh, even with, with uh, yeah, human communities, um, the idea of uh, the foreign and so on. So somehow the fact that we don't even accept the idea of foreign, I mean, when I say we, I say at least like the, the political powers that are, that, that, that be, don't accept uh, the idea of the foreign still. It's, uh, yeah, it's a great moment to try and uh, go against that. And I believe that now we do have the help of other animals as well. It, so not so much alone. But I'm not sure if I actually answered all of your questions. Yeah, I think so. I mean, to some extent, yeah. I think it is a really strong metaphor to this idea of wanting to, um, like being unwilling to give voice to other species that are defined as alien and foreign is, you know, quite. Um, I was also asking of, of our current. Totally. Um, I was also asked recently, but I can't really find still an answer to that um, because this is a research that I've been uh, going, it's been going on for a while, um, that I was asked by someone if I knew of uh, scientific departments, uh, university departments, research departments, um, research institutions that would be uh, willing to start thinking of these invasive aliens in other ways. So what are biologists um, specifically doing or conservationists doing uh, to try and maybe come up with new, uh, I would say, well, techniques to still use the classical terms that they've been, they've been using uh, so as invasive aliens, because this has to do also with definitely problems of um, it's, yeah, ecological um, disparities and uh, asperities. And so it's still a term that many people feel that it's important to, to keep, but also what are they doing to then make that term less um, pejorative, basically, uh, so that it, it means something more about the, the dynamics of what's happening so that species became uninvasive, but it's not an invasive per se. Uh, but it's been hard to find, at least for me, maybe I, I still need to speak with a lot more people, in uh, what are we doing to then make that adjective be less pejorative, but be 
still active. So we understand that it's something has changed. But what do we do with that change? Yeah, it's really important. And language is in that yeah. sense is really. Yeah, important. Important. Especially that really ecosystems as we know them are all foreign at this stage because they've been modified so much that mm -hmm. there's very little left of, of what was there before. So I think it's really important that, yeah, the vocabulary changes. Um, just to, because we don't have that much time, um, I want to move on to the next question, um, maybe more directed at Enahe and Sepide. Um, you used um, quite brilliantly storytelling in your presentation, and I was wondering how you think um, storytelling can expand and interconnect histories and futures um, of different, different species. Um. <clears throat> I think um, when we were, when Elohe and I, we were um, um, working on the idea of, of parrots and how, how parrots listen to us as human beings, as, as citizens, um, I think the only thing came to our mind was that they are, I mean, we have known about parrots um, from the stories, from the older stories, fables, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then, how to talk about them? It's not giving facts, or it's not. <clears throat> it's not really an, um, a kind of academic research, uh, so to speak. But it's it's a new way of storytelling. It's it's about stories, and I think, I mean, in general. Um, um, at least the way I work is is always through stories, and I think for any changes we are making, we need new stories. I mean, this is the also the oft quoted Donna Haraway that now that we are in this ecological crisis, we we need to tell new stories. So, so I I always believe in the in, in the power of stories and in the um, transformative power of stories, and uh, and when we were um, working on the parrots of Tehran, uh, as Ella said, we first we chose um, some specific places that we knew parrots were residing there, uh, and they are most of them. They are um, political sites or politically loaded sites. Even the private garden is politically loaded sites because uh, because because of the of, of the political and social instability, the residents have left and have fled. So private becomes also political and uh, personal becomes political as well. Um, but the way we wanted to talk through those places, through um, parrots ears in a way and, and, and parrots to speech, the only way we could think of was, was a storytelling. I mean, mm. um, I don't see any other way of going about it in a way. Yeah, I can add that uh, this storytelling helped us kind of to be, you know, the dialectics of empathy and defamiliarization about this non-human because we found actually we know very little about them, but at the same time we care about them and perhaps they have the same feeling that they care about us because they listen to us, but at the same time they don't know about also the reasons that why we are transforming these sites, why these things are happening. So I think this dialectics is very important and you know, storytelling can help, I think, for, for the future. The more we tell these stories through these dialectics, maybe we understand, we have a better empathy and um, defamiliarization <laughs> together, yeah. And I think it's also um, 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 st stories, storytelling is also a site of experiment and it's not only about um, um, writing, it's also about making, making the stories. And, uh, and, and the, the important question is that where are we uh, telling those, those stories? Again, the question of context, as well as um, what languages we use to tell those stories. This is also a, a, a very political and, and powerful um, tool to use. And, and by language, I'm not abusing, I, I don't mean language in terms of 
English, Persian, or whatever, but more, more of 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 uh, um, uh, what elements we use to to tell those stories, and what are, what other kinds of mediums um, we can use to tell a story. So it's not only words, but it's also things and uh, and acts and. Um, so that's why we were also thinking of acting those stories are also an important part of the, of the storytelling. So it's not only the story that is written on a, on a page, but also how they are being told. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question for Hamed um, from John. Uh, who asks what role pigeon towers might play in some of the interspecies politics Nuno is discussing as infrastructures of dwelling and cooperation, for instance? I mean, it's, it's quite interesting um, about the role of you know, the interspecies uh, cooperation and examining the political aspect or the political dimension. Uh, but I, if I could just take a, a step back, um, um, actually, uh, Sepide and Elahi's presentation was, was very, uh, nostalgically, uh, actually, and emotionally quite powerful for me. Um, you know, living in Dubai, you know, Iran is just like, it's is just around the corner and, and so close. And you know, growing up uh, in the 80s, it was, it was quite a, a modernist uh, city in some aspects. And there was a lot of displacement of memory. So, so memory was not produced uh, through uh, internal mechanisms, but it was produced uh, through this kind of uh, projected uh, memories that were imported into the city. Um, for, from them include courtyards, etc. So and 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 of course uh, we had uh, you know parrots migrating from Iran, and that sound you know that was played was very powerful. Uh, it it brought a lot of memories out, but it's interesting that this uh, this idea of site contextuality uh, is is important because in my in my in my you know in the mental faculty in my in my memory. That, that visual place of where the parrot comes from, and although it probably did not come from that place, was quite non-existent. Uh, and so the idea of storytelling not only drives that, not, not only materializes that memory visually, but it, it, it brings in a deeper connection, I think, um, just with that, that acoustic, with that, you know, that sonic memory formation in my mind. So that's, that's quite interesting. Um, yeah, and, and to answer John's question, um, if, if we examine pigeon towers in its particularity uh, and, and um, as, as, a, as a structure, as a, as, a, as a technological artifactual structure, um, and you produce two and the eggs are switched, they're essentially communication towers. And, and that, uh, you know, in, uh, incorporating that into a uh, into a geography where we uh, imagine these borders and and parameters, they immediately begin disappearing, and um, a larger narrative, uh, a narrative of responding to this ecological crisis that we're in, uh, comes about. Um, particularly within, ge you know. It, especially within geographies where borders are, are reinforced. Um, uh, the materialization of these buildings, uh, and this is what, what we will be do, what we are, have been doing over the last uh, two years is we've been building these pigeon towers in different places with the hope that someday they begin communicating with each other uh, through the sharing of eggs. Uh, and, and what that does is it dis disbands it it uh, you know dilutes uh, our preconceived ideas um, of differences thank you ahmed i have another question for you from matt um who's asking 
have you encountered any examples of whether pigeons become disorientated by anthropogenic electromagnetic frequencies or is their magnetoreception stronger? Is their magnetoreception stronger? Um, it's, it's, um, it's very, it's, it's interesting. I think we are at a, uh, probably at an early stage in this research. I don't, I, I have not come into account um, of any form of disorientation uh, documented, but it's interesting because the disorientation is not within the animals, it's within humans, uh, actually. The magnetrites that exist within, you know, the, 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 the lobes of the pigeons also in the Faraday experiment and the KJ, they exist within humans. So, so human beings have the capacity to detect magnetic fields uh, within themselves. The only fact, the only element is we've become disoriented. We have not been able to connect with our ecological biosphere. Why, why do pigeons continue to, to be able to? And that, that brings in another question of the role of, of, of not necessarily attempting to enhance it, but to question it, I think. You know, Polynesian seafarers apparently had these wonderful intricate wooden uh, maps that were represented of, of uh, electromagnetic fields that were conceptualized materially in a, in a map formation we can't read. But yet they could go from places in Polynesia to Hawaii. How uh, and in what manner? And how do you think we can reconnect? <laughs> 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 uh, I, I, I don't know. I just think that, uh, I think the beginning is the question. Um, beginning is the question. And then to see, to see how we can understand it better. Yeah. Um, we have, we're running out of time. I have one last question, um, or rather a, re a request. Um, it's uh, to ask you all if you have a sound that helps you attune to other species and if you could maybe play it or sing it, <laughs> just to be a bit embarrassing. <laughs> we actually, um, we had quite a bit of laughter, Eloha and I talking about it, all the um, pop songs, Iranian pop songs that have birds in them somehow, but. I was thinking further about it, and, and I, I say that I'm not going to sing anything. I'm, I, I'll be very embarrassing. <laughs> uh, but the, the interesting thing in all of them was that uh, most of these songs were about um, birds in the cage and how they are disconnected from, from the world around them. It's funny because they are actually um, pop songs for dancing, so it's actually quite happy rhythm, but with very sad lyrics, so so we just I just wanted to um, note this, but um, yeah, I'm too shy to sing anything. That also works. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's funny. So I well in the presentation I was doing, let's say, saying how silence can be such a complicated weapon in, in control of. of who, whose voice we can hear, but I actually, that's my main practice is to actually kind of like keep my mouth shut for a bit until I can definitely listen to something else that will speak this other voice, like we will speak through this other voice and uh, that will definitely then resonate. Uh, I'm now actually in, uh, I'm, I'm staying in Switzerland. I'm doing a residency at the moment. And it's funny because I guess, well, every morning I wake up with the, with the blackbird um, that well, sings a lot. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I could uh, try to translate that. Uh, but it is the same bird species that wakes me up in Lisbon where I'm living, but they don't sing a lot. <laughs> I guess no blackbird sings a lot. I'm not sure how much I'm, I'm like mistaken there or not but it's, they're quite unique, each one. And that's quite amazing. Thank you. 
And Hamed, <laughs> have you anything? <laughs> I don't I don't think I, 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 if I was to choose a sound, it would have been the, the, um, the parrot sound because that was really powerful uh, and a very nice way of escaping the question. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I think also um, it's, it's, um, it's, I think, a negative sound uh, for me. It's, it's, it's the absence of sound. And I found very powerful in Nuno's presentation about how sound is controlled through silence. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that also is, is from a social interaction perspective, uh, you know, as it, you know, growing up, you sit in these places called El Majalis, where you sit and it's a social platform and, and you, your, your level of engagement is in the, your power of, of, of controlling your silence. Uh, particularly because it's a very patri -hier hierarchical society. So even if you have something to say, your ability to control and produce that silence by you and through you is very interesting. Um, I think it's a strong nut to, to leave you um, with. And we have run out of time, so I need to wrap up. But I want to thank you all for such stimulating presentation and work and I think we could get on and on and on chatting about all this um, but um, we need to leave place to the next panel which uh, will discuss ideas of lively materiality and chaired by Arnaud Esqueret and um, also for the public um, on theatremundi.org there is uh, the only online ex exhibition listening to non-human life um, that you can check out with work by artists that will be um, discussing uh, with John um, later on in the day. So I leave it there and I want to thank you all again. And um, thank you. Bye. <laughs> thank you also to the other. Yeah. Thank you very much. Great everybody. to kind of meet you in this way. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Thanks. Bye. Je ne sais pas ce que je pense, mais il faut Tu me mets là-bas Oui, en fait. Viens dans le C'est sympa. Ça t'embête pas si on se met à côté Ok. Check, check, un, deux, trois, c'est parfait. Hello. Well. Uh, we are a little bit late because we, we have some uh, technical uh, reasons of that. Um, the, this uh, new session, Lively Materiality, focuses on the sounds produced by technologies and the soundscape induced by urban artifacts. 
One question common to the three presentation of the session is that of making visible, audible, perceptible waves that maybe we don't pay attention to or that we consider to be background noises, such as the hum of on an electrical transformer substation. There are at least three possible approaches. One, first, the approach of making visible what is sound or waves. In the presentation of Irene Tsukinada, Tassus Varoudis, and Roberto Botazzi, Curvilinear Soundscapes, and it will be the first uh, presentation. Then the process of making audible what is sound by offering to listen to a sound to which we don't pay attention, maybe. In this case, the noise of electrical transformer substation. The presentation will be between English and French, which is also a way of making different languages heard in the city. It's a presentation by uh, Juan Guillermo Dumé and Ruth Oldham listening to Transformer Substation, Background Noise, Fiction and Music. And finally, the approach of considering waves that aren't sound but perceptible by relying on materiality stones to which we give the possibility of opposing them a resistance. And it will be uh, the presentation by Matt Parker, Radiant Infrastructure. And in any case, this session invites you to reorganize your life in the city in, in relationship to this sound, noises, or waves, I think. So we are very happy to listen to this three presentation. And then the first with Irene Tsukinada. Hello. Tazus. Hi, hi, Irene. So that's. Uh, we are ready to start? Yes. OK. Hello. Uh, just a moment to share my screen. Hello, thank you for inviting us today. Uh, I saw the program with all the presentations, films and exhibitions, seems really, really interesting as well as the previous panel. My name is Irini Tsuknida and together with Roberto Botazzi and Tassos Varoudis, we are here to present a part of the work that runs uh, in the postgraduate research cluster 14 at the Bartlett School of Architecture in London. Uh, where we attempt to explore and reimagine the cities in an age of thinking algorithms and uh, data, dense, data dense environments to analyze the global conditions and support creative processes in urban design. Today, the physical space is an immense repository of data quantified at the granular scale and yet potentially planetary in their extension. Ubiquitous computing and advances in sensing technologies not only provide an entry point in the non-human domain of data, but also give voice to multiple agents shaping the city. Space is transformed into an intelligent notion that autonom autonomously interact with and support the env environment and other physical or perceptual parameters of the post-human ecology. Consequently, the invisible non-human physical spectrum with, where all data exists becomes the ultimate architectural element on the post-human era. Post-human notion as a technical concept and material reality initiates the deconstruction and the unification of all the compiled dipoles, human, nature, organic, inorganic, digital, and physical. This process calls us to reconceptualize and explore how space expresses this merging while it's constantly shaped by them within a live mechanism of continuous development and constant feedback. Kervilinear soundscapes, like a project that interprets the dynamics among human, nature, and technology as material and discursive, 
explores how space reconstitute as part of this complex aggregated system. Sonic and spatial elements create nonlinear topologies where they are highly, but they are not highly correlated. Not only auditory uh, perception influences people orientation, for example, but also at a very fundamental level, the acoustic environment can be broken down into three elements, the source, the path and the receiver. Curvilinear soundscapes include several projects. These proposals uh, for urban spaces in London that engage sound through computation and understand the city as a medium for acoustic communication between human and non-human agents. On this aggregated ecology, sound is perceived as a significant element in urban design. In an infinite loop, these entities act as a source and the sonic data of our everyday interactions and the, that depict their inner mechanisms. A better understanding of data requires reflecting them in a way that helps us understand our, surround, our surrounding socio-spatial relationships and attain a higher hypostasis than the formal geometries and material articulations. The conceptual relationship between design and data would be better explained through this connection to semiotics. On the first step, data are conceptualized as digital traces to enhance the material and the embodied hypostasis of the interactions with the human or the non-human entities, which actually creates them. All minor or big connections that are created fire the rise of a sign as an inscription of an, of an event that had happened. In fact, what is groundbreaking about data is the quantity and the range that can be analyzed and collecting and the collection of all these traces within one medium, the machine. On the second step, the idea of the data traces is linked to a signifying, post-signifying semiotics, Langlois, describes better the significant concept linkage. Asignifying semiotics involve the harnessing of material intensities and the deployment of a system of signs that intervene to the production of reality. Traces serve as post-signifying products of this interaction. This discursive and material hypothesis of traces are naturally joined. Traces are recorded materially, but then they are processed computationally via algorithms as post-signifying products. Approaching data as traces of our digital interaction instead of the traditional dimension, new ways of thinking are emerging. Sound is a vibration that propagates a audible wave of pressure through a transmission medium. These new post-industrial sounds with different quality and intensity have been split from their original source and are given independent and amplified existence. Contemporary humans inhabit cities with acoustic environments significantly different from the previous one. We aim to take the advantage of this plurality of sounds and create an urban intervention that redistributes these sonic qualities in the city. When thinking about a soundscape, the first question that comes in mind is which sounds we would encourage or amplify and which ones we would like to eliminate or dampen. Only a total appreciation of the sound environment can give us the resources for improving the urban soundscape. A classification of sounds that can reveal similarities, contradictions, and motives. Sounds can be classified, for example, according to their physical characteristics or according to their source. The aim of the project is to investigate the post-human, uh, the integration of a post-human notion, notion in the, into a design ontology that enables a compute, the computation of more than a human design, an approach that further extends than the, to the optimization of space and creates qualities from within. The site analysis creates an extensive recent collection of data related to sound distribution and the built environment in London. Through collecting demographic, environmental and sound data, the patterns and the connections within the area give us a second contextual layer of reading the space, a new perspective. Data are transformed to the traces of this interaction, enabling us to hear the voices of, of all the factors that constitute our surroundings. Based on the urban context of London, different form prototypes are chosen to be tested. 
the same sound source can have a completely different behavior on each of these areas. In order to delve deeper into the city's multiple organization and comprehend how space is constituted, we introduce machine learning methods in multiple scales, scales by approaching data as traces of our digital interaction instead of their traditional dimension. To engage the city-nature technology relationship to our design strategy, the result of the urban analytics are projected back to the site, producing a new topography over the existing one based on the algorithms that were used, representing targets of potential intervention. The purpose of the design inter intervention is to influence and manipulate the surrounding sonic environment. Sound reflection is used as a primary tool to design with the aim to form structures that can recreate the urban environment. The methods to simulate the reflection of sound provide countless possibilities for shaping forms due to their complexity and diversity. The different colored shapes represent the dampening and the amplifying zones. The algorithms control the reflective surfaces so as to gradually reduce the number of sound lines reflected to the dampening zone and at the same time provide the amplifying zone with the biggest number of reflective reflected sound range possible. The generated urban structure requires further optimization in order to upgrade the design results. Series of diffusing panels with regular and irregular geometries are tested. Several sound properties such as sound pressure levels, reverberation time, and early became time were calculated in every panel. The main goal of this process is to optimize the main sound structure by creating more detailed components, which will enhance the sound effect of the reflective surfaces. Moreover, the initial design is optimized under a significant number of parameters, like solar radiation, wind, levels of pollution, visibility, including digital as well as physical models and experimentation. The final results are the most concrete base to evaluate the initial hypothesis and assumptions in order to articulate how space constitutes its relationship with this network made up of human, non-human, nature and technology. Only if this new territory is conceptualized and materialized through design, we will realize its existence and stop, and stop overlooking it as a science fiction scenario. The finite, the finite and fixed concepts are stepping back for novel, responsive, adaptive environments to emerge. Under this framework, space interacts with multiple substrates, resulting in new participatory organic or inorganic emerging entities. The active hypothesis of the city, the active hypothesis of the city allows computational, generative, and time-based methodologies to emerge, engaging multiple agents. The interaction could be human, non-human, as beyond conventions, the aim is to include an approach machine automated and ecologically communicated. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Irene. Um, thank you very much. Then uh, we, we will listen to Juan. Thank you, Arnaud. Uh, hello, John. Um, <clears throat> uh, thanks, Irene, for your presentation. Um, I'm going to do my, my presentation. It's going to be in, in French and, and English. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a, reading a text about my, my, our sound piece. I'm gonna read it in French, and then uh, Ruth is gonna join us and read a little text about the same, the, the, the piece, the sound piece, which is the the the, the subject. So I'm gonna start. So we're gonna switch in, in French. De l'autre côté de la rue, 
entre une porte métallique avec quelques grilles. Il y a un son, un continuum du son bruit, possiblement des sources électriques qui sortent de là. Il est audible 24 heures sur 24. Ces bourdonnements, connus comme un hum en anglais, ou même drone de par son intensité, fait partie, sans le vouloir, de notre environnement sonore. Notre inconscient l'ignore souvent à cause de certains mécanismes cognitifs, plus ou moins volontaires, qui hiérarchisent les signaux sonores. Cela arrive souvent avec les bruits ou des sons considérés comme non importants ou gênants. John Cage nous a appris que les silences n'existent pas. Notre corps travaille jour et nuit, vibre, oscille. Il est le théâtre d'échange d'énergie que nous pourrions entendre si on se donne les moyens. Nous sommes aussi à divers niveaux, rayonnés par des signaux plus ou moins audibles dans notre atmosphère résonante. Nous entendons pas avec nos oreilles, sinon pas qu'avec nos oreilles, bien sûr, sinon, avec, sinon aussi avec nos corps. Nous percevons notre environnement, notre, nous, on, nous entendons l'espace sans relâche. Le soleil nous envoie des rayons solaires, puissantes forces électromagnétiques qui affectent significativement notre planète. Les météorites laissent un voile électromagnétique que certains scientifiques appellent fréquence radio à très basse fréquence, very low frequency radio waves, un terme qui a donné le professeur Colin Key. Ces fréquences radio peuvent être audibles, cependant, sous certains matériaux, des objets légers qui peuvent résonner à une faible intensité, comme du papier aluminium, des feuilles sèches ou d'autres matières semblables aux diaphragmes sensibles dans notre, à nos parleurs. D'autres recherches menées cette fois par, par des Japonais ont trouvé ce qu'on appelle des oscillations libres, oscillations libres de l'arrière-fond terrestre, ou Earth Background Free Oscillation. Ça, ça date de la fin euh, 90. Ce terme décrit les bourdonnements, bourdonnements planétaires qui comprend une cinquantaine de signaux existant entre 2 et 7 mHz, fréquence beaucoup très basse pour l'oreille humaine et de très faible intensité aussi. Une explication du phénomène a été proposée par Toshiro Tanimoto. Il suggère que la fluctuation de la pression atmosphérique percuterait cycliquement la surface de la Terre. Lorsque la pression d'air augmente, l'atmosphère exerce une pression un peu plus forte sur les sols ou la mer qui se trouve en dessous. Lorsque la pression chute, la surface rebondit doucement. Cela veut dire que notre planète serait comme un tambour frappé doucement par son atmosphère et que quand la fréquence des pulsations est adéquate, c'est la paix exciter les modes propres qui, par résonance, génèrent les bruits des fonds dont il est question. La vitalité que les bruits génèrent et véhiculent, nous la trouvons justement là. Depuis longtemps, les écologistes et les biologistes ont observé que les organismes vivants ont réellement besoin de facteurs aléatoires dans l'environnement, sans lesquels ils ne peuvent pas vivre. Ils ont trouvé que la turbulence dans l'environnement fournit aux organes aux organes, des perceptions à un niveau minimum d'activité qui suffit à les maintenir en fonction. C'est pourquoi il faudra, il faudra considérer les bruits des fonds et son rôle dans l'environnement comme pertinent à toute pratique de vivant, comme un élément essentiel à la vie, comme on suggère Agostino Di Cipio dans son essai « Bruit et liberté » daté de 2016. Bruno Latour redéfinit la notion d'actant comme une source d'action vitale que peut être humain ou non humain et qui, grâce à son efficacité et cohérence inhérente, peut engendrer des choses, faire une différence, altérer la course des événements. On ne peut pas citer l'expérience du bruit comme reproductif ou reproductible, sinon comme une expérience unique et vitale. Tout bruit est unique, pour une, pour une fois seul, comme un actant de notre écosystème. John Bennett, dans son livre « Be Brand Matter » de 2010, cite de son côté l'électricité comme un actant. Au-delà de la simple vision de la considérer comme une, une ressource, une commodité ou un instrument. Les transformateurs. Voilà notre sujet. Les courants alternatifs tournent à une fréquence de 50 Hz en Europe, Afrique et Asie, contre 60 Hz en Amérique du Nord ou au Japon. Donc, on peut affirmer que chaque territoire, chaque ville a dans son bruit des fonds un son plus ou moins commun. C'est lui propre à la fréquence du courant électrique, mais aussi à la nature des longues infrastructures, sa topographie, entre autres facteurs. Cette fréquence-là a défini pas mal de choses dans notre société depuis le XXe siècle, car afin d'éviter des distorsions, les équipements et toute la machinerie et l'appareillage la, a dû se synchroniser sur la fréquence des bases. 
Par exemple, la télévision utilisait 30 images par seconde aux États-Unis et 25 en Europe. Ceci à cause de cette divergence technique de base. À cet égard, l'artiste et compositeur Lamont Young avait conçu à la, à la ville de New York la Dream House, installation son et lumière basée sur le son sinusoïdal à 60 Hz et des microvaillations émises par plusieurs générateurs d'ondes. Soit, et dit autrement, la fréquence du courant qu'il a trouvée sous la prise électrique, qu'il a ensuite amplifiée afin de produire un, un environnement clos rayonné par des néons et des sons à basse fréquence. Installation qui a tourné sans arrêt entre 66 et 70. Pour ce qui nous concerne, la fréquence du courant électrique du poste réformateur électrique français est d'environ 50 Hz. Leur émission sonore axée autour de cette fréquence fondamentale est possiblement la keynote en termes de chauffeur de certains de nos territoires, de certains de nos territoires, c'est-à-dire la hauteur fréquentielle prédominante du paysage sonore. Ces sons-là ont comme caractéristique d'être des sons complexes dotés d'une énergie soutenue et pédale, modulée par des micro-variations, des sons graves, rock, étranges et familiers à la fois. Ces sons que j'ai pu enregistrer tant bien que mal, à minuit ou à midi, est devenu le sujet de notre pièce. Les signaux sonores, les signaux sonores des postes électriques sont aujourd'hui un marqueur distinctif de notre territoire et, comme l'avait signalé Raymond Murray Schaffer, les marqueurs sonores ou sound mark, il faut les protéger car ils forment l'identité acoustique d'une communauté. D'une communauté. Hélas, et pour conclure, je dirais que nos, trans, que nos transfos sont très bien protégés par leurs portes en acier où on peut lire danger des morts. Vous allez voir. Merci. Je passe la parole à Ruth. Hello. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, great. Hi. Um, very pleased to be here. Um, I'm just going to read a short text about the doors that Juan was talking about at the end of his text. So I'm just going to start. The unopenable doors, or to borrow a term that Bruno Latour proposed in his 1988 text, Mixing Humans and Non-Humans Together, the sociology of the door closer, in which he considers just quite what a remarkable invention the door is, we could say the unopenable whole wall. In fact, most whole walls that we see as we walk around the city are unopenable to us, but these ones are particularly so. I have never seen one open. They warn you that you might die if you were to attempt opening one. On all of them, a blue eye-level sign reads, Enedis, l'électricité en réseau, poste de transformation, haute tension, danger de mort. Yellow letters indicate the identity of each post. Bordeaux, Fidelité, Stockfis. Across their lower half, horizontal slits and folds transform the metal sheet into ventilation grill, a necessary feature of any electrical device. Intentionally bringing cool air in, unavoidably letting sound out. The whole walls are raised 10 or 15 centimeters off the pavement, the step clearly separating the realm of the street from the machinery behind, keeping water and dirt at bay. At each corner, the metal street is molded into a rounded form, giving the whole walls an almost nautical, certainly technical aspect. The thing that electricity substations deal with, electricity, has no need of the whole wall. High voltage electricity flows into the substation and low voltage electricity flows out via cables, which are more often than not under the ground. Electricity has no need of space in the way that we do. It requires just a continuous line of metal. What this continuous line passes through, solid earth, concrete, a narrow gap between wall layers, an expanse of space, is of no importance. The whole wall is purely for the humans that occasionally need to check on the wires and the transformers and the switches. These things are made of materials that are subject to wear and tear. The whole walls are discrete landmarks of the parallel world of dense machinery 
and technical infrastructure that underpins every aspect of contemporary society. This stuff occupies space, but quite how much, and the way in which it is occupied, remains rather vague. What size space lies behind each whole wall? A cupboard? A room? Can you walk inside? Is it full? What of exactly? Just how dangerous is it? How easily could you electrocute yourself? Might you really die if you could get inside? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ross. We will share the, the screen now for the presentation. Around here there are several of those heavy, metallic doors. You can hear the vibration coming from within. They vibrate non-stop, all the time. I like to walk close to them and then leave them behind me knowing that they are not following me. Inside my head, I can hear something. Noises. My ears are fine. Well, I haven't been to the doctor, 
pas des cheveux au fond. Ça a fait un sévère, je crois. Could it be my teeth, my, my neck, my la blood pulsation. circulating? I don't think so. Non, c'est pas ça. When I walk in the city and pass by a shop window full of neons, I hear a noise. It interferes with my thoughts. Une When I wait at a traffic light, the sound of the car engines relaxes me. I feel serene. Je ressens comme une sérénité. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. It was uh, it was very great. Thank you, Juan and and Ruth. And maybe I, I have a, a, a first question for uh, all of for all of you. It's uh, I think in your presentation there is the idea that the the, the sound 
So the waves could be different in space. And I, I, would, I, I would ask uh, what would be a new organization for you uh, with, the, with the sound or with these waves? Um, because I think maybe in, in the, the previous edition of, of this um, um, uh, clock, colloquium, uh, the question was, uh, one of the questions was the question of the silence. And I think it's, it's not the question with this kind of sounds or waves, because the question is more uh, something like high intensity or low intensity. And maybe uh, what will be your, uh, I think your utopia for, uh, uh, for a new soundscapes? Yeah. May uh, uh yes. Juan, may, yeah. may I begin? Um, I, uh, well, from 30 years ago, we were thinking about the the the, the noise and the the the, the, no, the sound of civilizations be, were becoming too uh, dangerous and and uh, all the things. So we were thinking about the the sound of the the countryside will be the, the ideal, but I think uh, now the, the thing were changing a lot. And um, um, yeah, the idea of the level is, is important because uh, the, the, the main question is the listening. So if you, if you're to, the silence is, re, is, is related to the, to the level that came, came uh, before and after. So uh, that's what we call uh, silence is mostly the, the low level uh, noises. And um, that's my, uh, maybe the utopia for the, for the next year is, will be, uh, is will be like a, a, a most control uh, motor uh, noises in the, in, the, in the city, because it's, it's crucial now, uh, because that makes uh, the, the other noises uh, exist. And, um, and the and the, and the, I mean the the education of the of the people to to listening and the, even uh, I mean it's not talking about music I'm talking just uh, the soundscapes of the of the of the place where we live. So uh, I think uh, that's uh, that will be it's, it's quite political and I think it's important and and then uh, I don't know uh, that's, uh, that's part of the healthy question too. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Maybe. What do you think? Yeah, sure. Um, I always find myself feeling a bit uncomfortable with the concepts of utopia, utopianism. Um, and uh, I suppose I feel like I am think it's kind of like a work of fantasy or fiction, the utopia. Um, so perhaps I will think about my utopia of intensity to be from, from science fiction. So, um, for example, I've been really enjoying reading um, a series of books by N.K. Jeminson, um, the Broken Earth trilogy, um, uh, where it's set in, in a long, uh, sort of a long future from now. Um, and it's a kind of way of, I guess, kind of similar to um, presenters from the previous panel. I'm very interested in storytelling um, as a way to think about um, these kinds of conditions. Um, so thinking about the potentials of human, non-human uh, or post-human futures. Um, I think about this book and the way in which um, there are so certain um, people uh, that are able to um, maybe appreciate um, in, this, in this kind of utopia, fate, like make-believe future, um, to like cess, they, she calls it, um, the uh, vibrations other types of vibrations and connects with minerals and connects with the earth and it's a uh, magnetic and geological movements in in like kind of new profound ways um so that would be my my utopia would be being able to make those kinds of um more expanded connections thank you er Ereni or, or roberto or who wants to answer of three of us uh, i think we can all step in. Yeah, different different opinions probably. <laughs> no, I agree with I agree with Matt. I'll I'll go with the dystopia that Matt started uh, 
in the beginning, I must confess, uh, I wasn't sure where Matt was going with this in the beginning, but then I, I really liked the presentation. So I'll, I'll go with the dystopia because the only direction we, we're, we're going, at least in the real, real sense of the world, is a more dystopic, RF-centric kind of uh, future, definitely. Uh, the only utopia I see might be in the virtual domain when they, you know, when we all put a pair of uh, VR uh, Facebook glasses of the future and we no longer have, like, we have no noise cancelling and then everything is cool. Which is still, noise, noise cancelling is still a part of RF, but, uh, you're, you're sorry, RF, uh, an audio signal, but it's canceling out at least the real world. So that's your utopic. Utopic now, it's a pair of, I don't know, iPod, iPod Max or whatever they called. You know, Apple products with very cool noise canceling features, which tech, in technical <laughs> terms is an audio, there is audio there. No, you don't like it, Matt? No, no, I, I like it. No, I, no, I, Matt, I uh, for me. Matt, Matt, Matt okay. seems to be like, nah, not really. I, I mean, I love the, um, I love your enthusiasm for just like shutting it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. I, don't, I guess like I don't, I, I, I don't want to imagine technology as being a solution to our kind of utopian needs. I, I hope that there's something that's uh, where technology is kind of a mere sort of like component rather than the deterministic aspect of utopia. Mm. Yeah, well, it's not. It's not going back though. <laughs> yeah, maybe just a just a, um, a point about the um, how you know. It, I think that before the word utopia was mentioned, there was also the word organization that uh, cropped yes. up, and and that was I think an interesting uh, idea because in in a way. Um, what what uh, we we were developing are, if you like, an attempt to do new form of, of organization of the public space of the city around an expanded spect spectrum of sounds and how these sounds um, are can be human or not human non human in their in their origin so to speak. So I think that the question of organization is very interesting because in a way, uh, yes, it's true technology. Uh, is not is not the, the cannot be the sole driver of answers, uh, uh, but at the same time, the, the certain kind of technologies that we make use of seem to be uh, seem to facilitate a more horizontal, if you like, organization of the city. So in a way, I don't know if this is utopian, dystopian, or or in fact uh, quite realistic. Uh, approach, but the idea of a city which is a lot more horizontal, and I don't, of course, I don't mean it in a literal sense, I mean it in a more expanded sense, uh, seem to be possible, and perhaps only possible through engaging, uh, uh, let's say, the technology of um, the digital. Thank you. Er Thank er you. Erini, do you want to, to, re to react? No. Yes, thank you. But um, I think may maybe um, the, the, the question is because what, uh, what is very um, important that uh, in, in your tr three presentation, I think maybe that is the, uh, the sounds or the noises or the waves are a little bit like a danger or a dangerous for for human, and the the, the point is, uh, what do you think? To do you have an idea to to arm to resist to the, to to this kind of danger or like? Because we 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 talk a lot about the, the space, but not the human in the space, and the question will be, for example, uh, something like prosthesis or, <laughs> or or something else to 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 resist to this kind of uh, sonic danger. 
I don't know. Well, yes, Juan. I, I, I see that what do you what do you mean? But um I'm mostly in the way that uh, uh, in a, to see the, the 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 issue as a post-human and a, a post-human situation where where the the, the human being when adapted to the to the nature. I mean, in a, and I mean, do do like a step back and uh, and try to know be less offensive to the to the to the other. Um, uh, natural, the other um, beings, non-human beings, in a way that uh, that's becoming uh, problematic to to us in a second term, uh, because uh, the, the extinction of the of the of the of the animals, the insects and the and the microorganism, because because the pollution in any in any, any level is important. And uh, also uh, uh, create protests. Uh, it's going to happen for sure because in, the technology is going very fast. And 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 uh, between gadgets and, um, and medical and uh, and uh, and then just uh, uh, expanded uh, reality uh, are creating uh, many many uh, objects that sometimes works and sometimes no. But uh, we uh, protect for protection. Yeah. Uh, the, the the other panelists uh, uh, talk about uh, the noise cancellation. This is kind of protests of uh, to protect protection in the in the in the in the flights in the planes, protection of uh, of the noise to do uh, like a more performance performative for uh, human beings. Uh, yeah, this is it's a way that's not gonna stop now. Maybe Matt, what what do you think? Because uh, Minerals are like some um, weapons. I don't know arms, maybe. I mean, it depends. I suppose it depends on whose hands the minerals are in. Um, and I mean, just literally the extraction of minerals is weaponized you know, against the bodies of people that uh, are working in um, poor conditions in places like the Congo, which is like well documented, or in like. Uh, dealing with coltan mines there um, or the people working with lithium mines in Mongolia or in Bolivia and the conditions that people have to like you know that's already weaponized just at the pure kind of extract point of extraction let alone its kind of technological application. Um, I suppose I was thinking a little bit about the um, uh, sort of provocation earlier actually about um, this sort of horizontal the horizontality like if, if I, um, I don't know if I'm just kind of making a word up there um, uh, but yeah this sort of does do these kind of technologies can we see, understand it as something that's kind of creating a, a sort of like a flattening of, um, of hierarchies in some way uh, between interspecies kind of relationships or f between humans and non-humans in the urban environment anyway. And I, I suppose I've been thinking a lot given this sort of kind of ideas around RF and propagation of signals and the kind of diffuse and on the directional nature often of signal propagation um, is something that uh, I'm kind of interested in thinking more kind of spherically um so trying to keep things three-dimensional rather than kind of on a 2d plane like perhaps the horizon kind of invites you to consider to try and think of something more spherically as something that's kind of uh like an entangled mess an assemblage as opposed to being something that can be kind of laid out flat and mapped or you know as a vertical or as a horizontal axis trying to think of 3d planes in a way you might kind of try and approach and understand the complexity of these kinds of encounters that we're talking about Thank you. Tazos or Roberto or Reni? Yeah, maybe just a, a, a quick one, just to say that the um, uh, I like the idea of the 3D entangled mess. It seems to be uh, perhaps a more, uh, more well, well thought a metaphor. Uh, for also what I was trying to say. But yeah, horizontal, it wasn't to be taken too literally. It was just a, an idea of being uh, 
yeah, to to to, it seems to be a, a quick an image that evokes connections. Yeah, evokes connections. But I accept that the the three dimensional mess evokes even better, or, or let's say renders a better sense of, of of the intricacy of these connections and their and their nature. Tazos, do you do you want to to say something now? John, do do you have a question? I will add something in a moment. Yeah, but when when the panelists are ready. I, I have one thing just like following that, Stefania. Uh, I wasn't meant, meaning to kind of like shut shut down the horizontal idea. So it's just like a thought that I've been having a lot recently about um, particularly the way in which audio, like people that work in audio um, or as audio recordists, you work with like working with microphones, particularly there's like a whole range of different microphones, like, like um, with different polar patterns. You know, and they have these like two dimensional kind of drawings that you can find of like what is the polar pattern of a microphone and you see like a cardioid kind of heart shape thing or a kind of low bar shotgun kind of long stem type shape. And these are but these are like actually three dimensional kind of objects. Um, and I was trying to think of like a way that there could be a language to kind of sort of try and stop referring to things in their very sort of visual language like of, of like scapes like landscapes. Um, uh, this kind of thing and like seeing and, and the, the language of the ocular uh, and whether or not like people interested in like kind of audio would be able to find a language in um, in these kinds of like polar patterns almost and trying to understand ways of thinking through these kind of three-dimensional polar um, yeah microphone polar pattern kind of shapes as a way to think about like different kind of interactions or intra interactions um, I'd love to know if that's a really bad idea or not, um, because I haven't, I haven't really told anyone about it, but I've been working it through my head for a while. If I could just add, um, I mean, the fact that we have this panel in a sense as part of the um, of the colloquium is because when when I was writing the, uh, when, you know, when we were drafting the call, um, Ossian Ragoussi, who's one of the scientific committee and independent researcher and curator here in Paris. And she looked at it and she was, she said to me, like, what about waves? And I hadn't considered it because, you know, obviously we kind of, um, yeah, when we talk about, when we start conversations, I'm sure, you know, many people are very far on within these conversations, but we start having conversations about the non-human and these kinds of like, um, enmeshments with kind of others other forms of life beyond the human we think of course instantly to animals and plants and things but yeah I think what you're just saying Matt like attributing as soon as we start attributing a kind of life or a liveliness to all of these forms of energy and energy transmission um, then you know I think it does completely shift um, our idea of kind of you know the the limits and the ge geometries of space that we inhabit it's actually like interesting as we sit here we feel the metro rumble underneath the the room every now and then and it kind of like you know especially in these kind of flattened media settings even though we're in a room together you kind of very easily forget this yeah spherical nature or this kind of you could think of it as horizontal in the sense that actually like what's on the sur the surface that we're on is just kind of one of multiple layers and they all have in in a sense their own complete you know existence to themselves and their own importance to themselves and that goes beyond the metro that goes beyond whatever comes underneath the metro right down to the core of the earth there's all of these kinds of energy transmission and concentration and transformation happening all at, all at once so i think um yeah obviously it was interesting for me i hadn't even thought of it of the importance of that and then obviously all of your presentations uh, are evidence of the fact that you and I'm sure many other people are already kind of considering this expansion of what we think of as life into these kind of like I suppose it, it comes to um, ideas of the cyborg and the kind of already um, indistinguishable nature of kind of electromagnetic and other forms of kind of energy and life with with kind of carbon-based human or, or other animal life forms. So yeah, I just kind of, in a way, wanted to frame this panel within the, the rest of the colloquium as well in, in that sense and, and say, I think what you're raising about like what kind of spatiality we have to start thinking in once we are imagining this whole range of kind of life even beyond the animal 
is completely unresolved and I think is one of the seems to me one of the critical questions for this particular idea of, of sonic urbanism what that new kind of what ways we act upon these different dimensions of that kind of new interconnected spherical horizontal whatever uh, spatiality which is partly what um, curvilinear soundscapes is pointing us towards a real kind of design methodology as well I suppose so yeah I just wanted to add that and also credit Ocean for <laughs> Uh, drawing our attention to the kind of uh, gap in in our thing, in my thinking uh, at the beginning as well. Thank you. We we have um, a question uh, by uh, Sarah Rodriguez. Uh, she asked, uh, "I would like to ask Matt from uh, what he has studied um, if he if he if he thinks there is a possible significant increase in the effects it might have on bodies considering the electric magnetic fields that already exist and their impacts, at least the studio and one. Uh, 5G, yes, from the 5G. Um, I'm, I'm not really qualified to make those kinds of um, claims, I don't know. But um, I, I did speak um, not so long ago with uh, another artist called Mario de Vega, who's um, produced a number of works in this kind of terrain as well. He's quite sort of like well known for electromagnetic kind of uh, electromagnetic kind of explorations in his in his sound based artworks, um, and we both agreed that um, there there's obviously been a profound change like shift in what is kind of activated or being kind of um, channeled or uh, intensified as I said in my presentation in terms of electromagnetic radiation in the world um, in fact like if you just imagine things like um, if you know like Christina Kubish's um, artworks these um, kind of electrical walks where she, she provides uh, listeners with sound uh, with like headphones uh, and you can walk around an environment and these are um, the headphones are picking up the electromagnetic radiation around your space um, and like she has said that like the, the the difference from when she first started doing these in the early 90s to, to, to the current day is um, you know it's, it's profoundly different world so I don't know what's going on and I cannot make any kind of claim and I will not make any claims towards towards it because I just don't know the science I'm not a scientist um, in that way but but there, there's something's happening but I, but I don't I'm I, I don't know um, but I think there's a lot of artists like those two people I've talked about just now and myself who are who are interested in in it um, but maybe it's not our place to kind of make these sort of scientific claims but more just to kind of provoke questions uh, and create stories. Thank you very much. Um, do you, do you, Juan, do you have any yeah, questions? Yeah, ab about that, Matt is, was telling, um, there's, there's very many paths to follow for, in a creative way, to, to be sensible to the sound, um, uh, to the things that are audi audible and other fields that are not easily audible. So that's uh, so many, many very, creative uh, artist going through. So yeah, I think it's very, very interesting. And uh, as that's all, all the panelists were showing the reflections in the city and the, the density and the multi density of, of the sound in the, in the, in the space and, the, and also the, the, the vibration, how can you feel it and be a, like a, and create an, an, a, an, a, a whole, like a, the, the, the whole f acoustic phenomena in your in your uh, and in your perception are are fascinating yeah and I think uh, know so many people many people that are following the, this this panel are are maybe looking for uh, or those uh, those uh, pathway maybe thank you do, do you have any any questions or no so thank you thank you very much it was very great and um yeah roberto you want to say something yes no no just uh, ah, thank you <laughs> thank you very much yes thank you so um wrapping up this panel 
Um, and just to remind everybody that, um, yeah, the same streaming link uh, will be back after lunch. Uh, what time did we say? 2.30? 2.30, good. Um, with the third panel, uh, Bridging Worlds, chaired by Justinien Trébillon. Um, once again, we remind everybody, um, yeah, that there's kind of more around uh, the discussions. There's the exhibition on Teatro Mundi's website uh, with the films that we'll be discussing this afternoon um, in the final kind of round table. So please, please uh, watch the films. We can post the link again in the chat. Also um, on Teatro Mundi's Instagram, which is at City as Theatre, um, we invited um, a collective called uh, Listening in the Cthulhu Sen. I think that's roughly, <laughs> it's an all right pronunciation. Um, who've taken over our Instagram for the week and are sharing an incredible range of uh, practices and uh, theory that they, um, this collective are kind of experimenting with to essentially answer some of these questions, also finding really, really tangible uh, ways of listening, of attuning, uh, of kind of shifting ourselves out of the center uh, and all of these kinds of things we're discussing. So really encourage people to kind of explore and, and sit with some of, um, some of those ideas that are shared in other formats other than these, these panels. Um, and we will be back uh, on our couches at 2.30 uh, p.m. Paris time. So translate that to wherever you are, please. I would like just to thank uh, Guterric, uh, Arnaud for to drive the, the, the session. And goodbye to the, our Thank analyst. you too. <laughs>
connected to that panel made me realize a lot of elements in relation to breakdown in, in, in relation to disruption. The first one was visiting friends in the countryside in France a few days ago and being woken up in the morning by, by the loud noise outside. And obviously we were in the middle of nowhere. So I was expecting the very quiet sound of nature uh, or, or the rural or the countryside. But because of the wind in the trees, because of the animals, uh, because of the sound of, of water gargling uh, in, the, in, in the garden, um, the, actual, the actual atmosphere, the sonic atmosphere of a space that we often very quickly considered as wild or as natural actually came out to be way more noisy than my uh, bedroom uh, in the city where I live. Uh, I live in France that looks at a courtyard full of humans who are also asleep in the morning when I wake up. And the second event uh, is happened the day after that it was on Monday morning in the in the metro uh, in, in Paris. I was on the line six getting into uh, Nation, which is the terminus uh, of, a, of, a, of a line. Um, and between Picpus, the station before, and the terminus uh, uh, Nation, the train, as they often do, stop. They have to stop to let the train before uh, go through uh, the, the depot and actually uh, unload its passengers. And it takes a bit of time. And the train stopped. The engine was turned off by the driver. And in the carriage, total silence happened. And it made me realize uh, how rare total silence is in the city. And obviously very, very quickly, a child started to play. I don't know if it was an iPad or something like this, uh, putting the music very loud. Uh, and it disrupted, I think, all the passengers on, on this uh, um, sort of walk, it woke us all up on this opportunity of silence in the city, which is ever so uh, rare. Um, so anyway, two anecdotes which I've been playing with in my mind for the past few days in relation to that panel. And uh, maybe it's something as well we can, we can play with uh, together later on as uh, we discuss uh, the four of us and with you in the chat. A reminder, if you're watching us on YouTube, if you can do prefer use uh, the chat that's on the Gete Lyric website uh, simply because we have two or three or four different options to chat so we try to channel them all in one place so try to log in on the live uh, you don't have to log in actually but try to be on the gate lyric website and and check out the chats available uh, there which i'll be monitor uh, we shall be monitoring the being during the panel three papers uh today nicola will talk about uh, affective sonic atmospheres and also um, share with us a broad theoretical engagements with the topics that concern us today. And then we will hear from Melissa, who's been, uh, who looks at uh, bees uh, as a different sonic experience and calling, at, calling attention to the agency of, of, of bees through sound. And finally, Gassia uh, will reflect on the effect of lockdown on our sonic perception of the urban spaces we are used to uh, of the urban spaces we think we are so familiar with. Um, without further ado, Nicola, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really happy and grateful to be here um, together with you today. Um, I will share my presentation. OK, uh, so. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicola Di Croce. I'm a um, um, postdoctoral research fellow, actually uh, now doing a Marie Curie fellow at the University of Venice, uh, uh, and also collaborating with the um, McGill University in Montreal, where I am uh, right now. Uh, what I'm presenting today uh, is um, an ongoing reflection, is a theoretical reflection uh, on, the, um, on the role of um, uh, uh, of, uh, so, of sonic uh, ecology in uh, in our understanding of uh, a multi-species uh, future. Uh, so um, before uh, engaging with uh, the idea of uh, multi-species sonic ecology, I I want to uh, to make a, a first introduction uh, about the uh, about the the human perception, but especially the, the way how 
the relationship between human and uh, non-human entities actually structures uh, what we call the urban atmosphere. Uh, so, of course, what I'm uh, trying to say here is that uh, sounds uh, play a key role in the in shaping an effective atmosphere. Uh, and um, uh, since we are usually considering sounds as a passive uh, element, but uh, rather I, I want to stress uh, out um, more and more the concept of uh, the agency of sounds uh, as they are not just connecting things, but they are changing them, uh, as to, to quote uh, Ken um, uh paper here. So um, the, the centrality of sounds in shaping uh, people everyday uh, experience uh, actually is uh, 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 helping uh, this uh, discussion to, to move on uh, the, the idea of uh, an affective atmosphere uh, that we consider as a, a mutual um, interaction between humans, non-humans and matter. Uh, so uh, these, uh, these aspects, it's really, it's really relevant to, to, my, to my reflection because, uh, uh, because I want to, I want to uh, to underline how uh, urban atmosphere, the atmosphere we, we usually um, experience in our everyday life, uh, is not just happening, but is uh, always uh, designed, uh, is, uh, as some uh, authors say, is uh, staged uh, or is uh, engineered uh, in, um, in a way that um, it, it actually um, can help reaching uh, political, social, or economic targets. Uh, just, for example, consider the way how the sonic environment is uh, engineered in a in a shopping mall to, of course, to to make people <laughs> uh, buy more and uh, and more uh, goods. But um, so what I say here is that the 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 everyday uh, the everyday uh, sonic atmosphere is uh, is really well structured. And of course, the role of uh, urban design, the urban policies, uh, it's it's really it's really central in this discussion, uh, because um, what uh, many authors uh, uh, suggest is that uh, urban urban design is actually um, apparently fostering inclusion within public space, but they are actually uh, they are actually uh, creating um, uh, an atmosphere that is uh, that is not uh, that is comfortable, but because of of trying to be more and more comfortable. Actually, they are uh, they are creating a, a, an atmosphere that is uh, more and more um, normalized, uh, sanitized, uh, and um, and of course uh, th this uh, aspect uh, is um, is uh, uh, is uh, is central because um, because apparently uh, we 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 have uh, in front of us a, a, an inclusive. Uh, urban environments, but actually, this uh, in, this apparent inclusiveness hides um, uh, a way to exclude those who do not appear to belong in that environment. Uh, uh, we we can we can see it here in through many examples. Uh, I I just choose this one, uh, which represents uh, the way our people experiencing homelessness are uh, actually um, um, are actually not invited to to. Uh, to to occupy public space, uh, not through specific uh, policies, but through uh, soft soft policies of ex exclusion, uh, which are of course affecting very much the the way the sensory environment is uh, engineered. Um, so as said, uh, public space is being increasingly pacified, normal normalized, and sanitized, and uh, these uh, of course uh, uh, brings uh, public space to to. Uh, to, to become less and less um, differentiated, uh, less and less complex, uh, less and less um, also interesting, we can say. Uh, so all the differences tends to disappear, uh, and um, and also the sonic environment is part of this of this process. Uh, so this this is why I'm trying to introduce all these arguments to you just to arrive to the sonic environment because I think that the way how the the atmosphere is being normalized. Is also affecting very much the way how the sonic environment is becoming more and more flattened, uh, more and more um, uh, sim simplified, oversimplified, uh, and this, uh, of course, um, brings um, brings uh, also the everyday listeners, the citizens of any any city to experience uh, a, 
uh, and more and more uh, kind of comfortable environment, but this comfortable uh, uh, aspect is not actually uh, mirroring uh, an inclusive uh, idea of, um, of society. Uh, so I'm moving forward to, to introduce you uh, the, the main topic of my presentation, which is uh, dealing with uh, the possibility of uncomfortable sounds uh, to overcome this uh, anesthetization of the sonic environment. Of course, this is a provocation, but it's also a way how to, to think, more, uh, to think uh, further uh, about the possibility of, of sound and especially uncomfortable and disturbing sound to create a new uh, engaging dialogue between uh, uh, humans and non-humans and matter. Uh, so I, I'm introducing here the idea of sonic coexistence. Uh, as an active process of uh, attunement to unco uncomfortable sounds. So I'm referring uh, to uncomfortable as a way to, uh, to engage with otherness, to what is unfamiliar to us, uh, what is uncanny. Uh, and here, of course, the literature about disturbance is really wide and helps me a lot to, uh, not just to, um, to engage uh, in a, in a, uh, in an idea of uh, attunement that is uh, romanticized, uh, but to, to engage with an idea of disturbance that, uh, as said by Tsing, uh, uh, opens uh, the terrain for transformative encounters. Um, so um, uncomfor uncomfortable sounds are not just noisy. Uh, they, they refer to unpleasant events, uh, to affective situations that are uh, that are disturbing, but they are not actually, uh, we can refer to them as just simply noisy. Uh, and uh, here, Kanjizer is helping me uh, very much to, uh, to refer to this concept uh, um, um, because she, uh, she is considering sound uh, as a way to become aware of the registers that are uh, unfamiliar uh, and unaccessible. Um, so sound is actually helping us to access this, um, uh, this uh, idea of uh, uncomfortable sounds and uh, sounds that are unfamiliar to us. Uh, they are distant also culturally um, to our uh, understanding. Uh, of course, uh, by saying that uh, we are engaging with the uh, uncomfortable and uh, sounds and sounds that are uh, uh, distant to us, uh, we are uh, slowly approaching to, uh, to non-human non and more than human in general sounds, uh, which, uh, which uh, uh, of course uh, shape uh, the way uh, how we perceive the sonic, uh, the, the sonic environment and shape the relationship uh, we create uh, in, the, in, uh, in our uh, urban, uh, urban atmospheres. Uh, so listening is a, uh, uh, listening to uncomfortable sounds uh, following this reflection uh, leads to a decentralization of the human primacy uh, toward a, uh, a, um, an account uh, about the, the, the non-human and material uh, agencies. Uh, I'm, um, I'm talking about, uh, about this, uh, this idea of uh, disturbance uh, also as a, as a political uh, possibility uh, which um, which uh, help, helps me uh, to uh, to unfold uh, a new a new way of considering uh, uh, the concept of uh, sonic ecology, uh, and uh, of course uh, the idea of sonic ecology is uh, pretty much uh, linked to to a, a political ecology uh, where where um, uh, where any agency uh, plays is is. Uh, is part in, uh, in, in these, of course. Uh, and here uh, I'm using um, Masumi's uh, a quote just to, uh, to, to underline how um, the object of political ecology is uh, the coming together, the belonging together of processually uh, unique and divergent forms of life. Uh, so its object is symbiosis. Uh, I, I refer to this not, not because it's strictly related to sound, but because it helps us a lot in um, understanding more and more how all the all the all these concepts are uh, linked and related one uh, one to the other, and uh, I'm trying uh, this way to to uh, um, to create a, or to suggest a, a more um, a more open uh, idea of um, of sonic ecology one uh, one that is uh, uh, of course. Um, 
inviting a new political uh, new political reflection uh, where uh, uh, humans but or also more than human uh, sounds are considered and as uh, really important agents in uh, in this um, in this uh, uh, reflection so uh, how how can we attune to uh, to uncomfortable sounds of course this is a, a really challenging uh, uh, question uh, and um, and uh, what I propose here is just uh, uh, a new way of uh, understanding uh, uncomfortable and disturbing sounds, uh, of course, coming from uh, humans, but also non-human uh, and matter. Uh, and um, here I, I, I'm trying to uh, embrace otherness, not just uh, automatically accept otherness as a way to uh, pacify again the, the environment, as, as said before, but uh, I'm here uh, rather trying to, to suggest new way of attuning uh, to, to the modern human. Uh, and um, here the, the, the concept of attunement is uh, it's really crucial because uh, it, uh, it, it, helps, uh, it helps me to, uh, to discuss about uh, the idea of uh, uh, create a, a new a new dialogue, which is not uh, a dialogue uh, uh, that leads to a, uh, a said uh, to a romanticized the idea of union between uh, uh, people and matter, like a um, uh, like a, a dreamy uh, atmosphere of uh, peace and and union. This is more about the way of understanding new possibilities, new new ways of uh, approaching uh, diversity. Uh, so what I'm uh, trying to say is that. Uh, uh, of course, the concept of attunement uh, uh, is uh, pre uh, pretty much related to the affective modulation in the relations between different bodies. And, uh, and of course, uh, the idea of a sonic coexistence I introduced uh, in the beginning of the presentation uh, is, um, is, can, is actually addressing uh, this uh, encounter between, between bodies. Uh, of course, here I use uh, sound and listening, uh, and listening as the the, the pivotal uh, tools uh, for uh, creating uh, uh, or for suggesting what Labelle uh, called uh, a critical and creative togetherness. Uh, I really like this concept because uh, again, it's not just uh, a simple idea of uh, unity, but it's a critical, uh, uh, critical um, uh, discussion about how to, how to create a dialogue between uh, uh, different um, social formations, but also different uh, um, Non-human uh, and uh, non-human and more more than human agents. Uh, so sounds of listening are supporting this uh, critical process of uh, decentralization uh, from um, from the human center pers perspective, and uh, this is what uh, I'm uh, I, I hope to to suggest to and to bring to this discussion. To uh, of course uh, decentralizing the human center perspective is uh, is. Uh, fundamental for a new political vision uh, of the, the future, uh, and uh, and sound and listening can help uh, uh, can help uh, um, going further uh, on on these, uh, and um, and uh, here the the question that is uh, that is um, uh, that is uh, actually um, underlined by Bennett is is really it's really relevant. So how would political responses to public problems changes uh, where, uh, where we, uh, we, we take seriously the vitality of non-human bodies. So what's the role uh, and also the, the agencies, but also how, how can we uh, actually negotiate uh, a, a new political formation um, uh, through this, uh, this uh, new understanding? Um, so here, uh, in um, in this um, in the in this um, presentation, I'm uh, I'm uh, of course uh, uh, talking about uh, the, the 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 relation between humans uh, and uh, no humans and and, uh, and matter, uh, uh, and I am also um, referring to to different uh, literatures, different different uh, fields of study, um, and another contribution I'm trying uh, I, I'm um, I'm keen to to add to this. Uh, to this reflection is um, the one coming from uh, new new studies in biology. Uh, uh, this is just um, just an idea that I bring to this discussion, but I think it's really relevant uh, because um, 
uh, new um, new developments in biology confirm that uh, we are all ecosystems. So uh, so actually um, the the concept itself of uh, identity uh, is uh, it's really challenged now by many by many studies uh, who which are actually studying the way of all the elements together are combined in the really complex uh, assemblage. Uh, and um, uh, following this idea, the, the concept of identity kind of fall down. Uh, at, at the same time, uh, um, we realize that uh, all our political constructions are based on this concept. So actually, we have to reframe uh, kind of everything from uh, from uh, from zero. I'm I'm of course um, of course this is a provocation, but at the same time, it's a really a really interesting uh, uh, point of departure uh, also to to locate a sound and listening. Uh, as, um, as tools to lead this understanding uh, of uh, plurality. Uh, so, um, so here I'm, uh, uh, I'm um, referring also to the work of uh, Salome Fogelin, uh, who, is, um, who is really uh, keen to introduce the, uh, the concept of a political possibility of sound uh, as the foundation of a, uh, of a, of a multi-specific sonic, sonic ecology. So coming to the conclusion of my my presentation, uh, I'm um, offering you some uh, some more uh, some more uh, answers. Um, sorry, some more questions, uh, open questions, um, uh, which are dealing uh, um, mostly on the uh, on the how we can deal with these uh, uh, these uh, new politics and multi-specific uh, uh, sonic sonic ecology. Uh, so uh, we say that listening practice can introduce new alternatives uh, for the world we live in, uh, and uh, this idea of uh, alternative futures it's uh, it's uh, really um, really um, important because, uh, as said uh, again by by Fogelin, uh, sounds can offer a portal into different in and uh, different reals. So uh, we 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 can experience and we can. Uh, uh, imagine new futures uh, through sound, and uh, this is uh, something that uh, actually can help us to figure out how we can continue this uh, uh, political uh, and, uh, and sonic discussion. Uh, and uh, of course, the political possibility of sound, uh, uh, quoting uh, Fogelin, uh, is, uh, is the possibility of a politics uh, of the incomplete, the unfamiliar, uh, the unrecognizable and the unheard. So again, the idea of um, of uh, a politics that is not uh, just keen to pacification, but is uh, interested in uh, approaching the unfamiliar. So again, the the, the idea of uncomfortable and uh, and uh, disturbing comes comes back to to remind us that uh, sonic encounters are not just uh, uh, or necessarily uh, happy and sweet <laughs> encounters. Um, so, um, so the sonic ecology I'm kind of uh, outlining here uh, is uh, leading, uh, uh, bringing a, a new political uh, understanding, uh, and um, this political understanding is uh, uh, it's it's really can can produce really strong uh, uh, differences uh, to the actual. Uh, uh, way uh, of we we make we make we make sense of of the world we live in, uh, and also the idea of attune to this uh, new uh, to these uh, new new concepts uh, to attune to to to, to the disturbing uh, atmospheres we 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 face to, uh, we face every day uh, can 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 really be the first step uh, toward uh, a new a new multi specific sonic ecology. Uh, here I refer to the work of Kanjiser, uh, who uh, is using sound to explore a political relations, uh, also to create uh, new terrains for human and more than human uh, uh, negotiations. So we kind of we are ended up uh, we are ending up um, uh, talking about the um, uh, the new a uh, new political and sonic ecology that is uh, of course informed by. Um, this uh, new approach, this uh, approach on uh, on uh, uncomfortable sounds uh, that is leading to negotiation. So, so negotiation is uh, the um, 
is the key term uh, to determine how uh, a new politics can 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 take place and um, in doing this i'm um, also addressing uh, to um, to actual uh, possibilities we can uh, uh, we can uh, figure out so um, how what, what is the role of uh, urban sound design for example in uh, uh, what is the role of uh, your sound planning in the, in the future of a uh, 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 multi-specific uh, sonic sonic ecology. Uh, what is the role of negotiation between human and more than human? Um, and um, and uh, just to, to close this um, this uh, to finish this uh, this uh, presentation, I'm uh, I'm um, opening uh, up and uh, bringing to this uh, to, to this panel uh, some open questions, uh, which 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 can uh, of course. Uh, uh, help us uh, further uh, a bit more this, um, this, this conversation. So uh, what perspectives does sonic ecology bring? Uh, what are the possible political implications? Uh, and how uh, urban sound planning ca can learn from, from this lesson? Uh, of course, um, I'm, uh, I'm, for example, uh, referring to uh, the actual idea of a noise zooming plan and how this would change, for example, uh, how would it be transformed by this new understanding? Uh, of course, uh, so, some of these, uh, some, the way how many urban policies are structured uh, should be completely overturned. Uh, and, um, and here, uh, uh, as uh, to, 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 to use a, a thing um, reference, uh, we need to pay attention to the assessment through which uh, we know disturbance. Uh, where uh, non-human forms uh, of agency co-author heterogeneous words. So uh, my my contribution to to this uh, to this uh, uh, panel is uh, exactly this. So how we can negotiate uh, uh, and how we can bring agency to to um, uh, human, but also more than human uh, uh, sounds, and how this can. Uh, profoundly change the way we consider and we structure and we think about uh, urban uh, policy analysis and design. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your... Thank, um, thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you very much for this. And it's it's perfect. Your, your final question actually has, and we will see that in a sec, uh, direct and obvious links uh, to Melissa, so I'm inviting Melissa now to, to introduce her, her research. Thank you again, Nicola. Hello, can you hear me? Am I on? I'm on. Yes, Hi. you're on. Hey, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so I'm gonna put on my timer. And um, so my presentation is called How Singing, Singing Bees draw urban humans into an everyday world of interspecies communication. I think there may be some problems already in this title, which we can talk about <laughs> as I was listening to Nicola, but maybe that's even a topic for discussion. But in any case, I'm going to start with um, just uh, with all of us listening to a recording. Um, 
So we've just listened to the toots and the quacks of queen honey bees piping. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's all good. All right, piping is a form of sonic communication that queen bees use to locate one another in the hive. Um, when a queen bee hatches from her vertical cell and she starts roaming freely in the hive, um, she announces her presence by pressing her thorax and operating her wing beating mechanism um, without spreading her wings. So we heard different sounds of this piping in the recording, the toot, this long it's kind of almost like Morse code um, and the more staccato and pulsing quack. Um, and so honeybees don't have ears. So the vibrations that humans hear as these kind of polyphonies, um, honeybees feel through their tarsi, through their feet. Um, and so in this particular recording situation, um, this piping would happen when more one queen is kind of moving out in the hive and the call and response between the toots and the quacks um, work kind of as an echo location device permitting the queens to find each other in the hive then they face off fight to the death because only one queen can reign and repopulate the hive um, So um, I've been living, actually, I, I went into this too quickly. I'm coming out again, because I wanted to say something before I went into PowerPoint mode. Um, so I've been living in and kind of carrying these um, B sounds with me since um, May 2019, uh, when I made the recording. Um, and I now view this kind of peculiar event of piping um, as a call to attention, kind of on multiple levels. So we have this call to attention of imminent battle between the queens. We have one that speaks to the worker bees about the health of their hive. And maybe we have a call of attention for humans to start listening, uh, opening up, noticing, learning, attuning with um, the sensual and the experiential contingent of these creatures and more generally, I guess, the unfamiliar around us. Um, and um, I think in, in, in listening and in doing so in, in calling attention to listening, um, it means to can seriously consider the questions, the stories, the practices and um, the designs that we craft to hold the life dances of multiple species with a reference to Anna Singh, her idea about life dances. So now I can go back into my PowerPoint, ha. Huh. <laughs> so, uh, really quickly, I'm going to share three brief scenes from my time spent with these recordings, with these honeybees, um, which called me to attention to reconsider the modes and practices of listening to the non-human um, and to kind of explore the situated, not multisensorial, rhythmic ways of doing research. Um, I'm more in a tonality of, of really being in my body, and I'll talk about this throughout, um, uh, without, throughout this talk. This talk is very much about... Um, I guess it very much about a personal experience. Um, and and um, I wanted to kind of work through that in this, in this conference. Um, so the things I'm gonna talk about, um, the experiences I'm gonna talk about are about making and sharing sound recordings and of participating in honey harvests. Um, and I, I spent time with the bees um, because I've been doing a project called Sounds Delicious. Um, and it works on kind of thinking through sound, how sound can help craft sensibilities, connections, narratives on the topics of food production and environmental relations. Um, and it also confronts kind of, wants to, wishes to confront um, romantic ideals about food. food. So it's not only, uh, but it sounds delicious, of course, is, is problematic. It's, it's, it's made to, to provoke. Um, so uh, I worked with this place called Bubi. It's an urban honey project in Copenhagen. In Danish, Bubi means city bee. It was founded in 2010 by British anth anthropologist Oliver Maxwell. Uh, beehives were placed all over the city. It was the first kind of urban uh, honey producing project here. Um, they, are, they were in gardens, on rooftops, in, in different corners, um, next to amusement parks, etc. cetera. Um, I just want to point out that the labels on these honey jars um, actually designate the neighborhood from where the honey is taken. So we don't buy honey here 
about like those like linden tree honey or lavender honey or chestnut tree honey, one buys a honey that um, that is from the neighborhood and um, and there is a kind of discourse within Booby about considering the dynamics between plants, bees, flowers, and people, and other materials in the neighborhoods. Uh, and they're also very interested in, in giving flower seeds with each bottle of honey so that people can plant flowers. Um, so there's this really um, practical connection between planting flowers and making honey, and that's kind of a, a pedagogical a social idea. So let's rapidly go into boxing queens. So um, one day, in May 2019, I got a call from Oliver and he said, come quickly, the queens have arrived. Um, so I went over and I found this. This, this box was um, buzzing and humming and tooting. Um, and um, this was holding queens because queens are bred today in yellow plastic boxes and sold to beekeepers. Um, they're surrounded by several worker bees. They're given some sugar to eat. Um, and sometimes they get lost in the post and they can get very stressed. And each of these individual bees is then placed into a colony, a different colony. So this does upset the story of multiple queens wandering around in the hive in nature. This is, this is we're talking about a, a modern today process. So um, we decided that we should try to record the bees before they were put into the hives. So we took them to a, an abandoned studio, um, kind of the sound studio uh, at the university where I worked. It was five minutes away. I kind of found my field recorder and we, um, we recorded. So the practice of breeding queens actually permitted me to create an insulated studio recording of the sounds you just heard. And it was totally a laboratory studio experience and it accentuated the complicated nature culture of pollinators today. And um, I was really struck by the apparatus I was struck by, you know, I'm a historian of sound who works on a lot of apparatuses of early sound recording. Um, I was fumbling with my recorder. I moved it around and, and of course, took notes in, in different, yeah, different um, drawings and experiences. And I sat with these, these bees, but um, it was really kind of a, an awakening also of why am I using this directional microphone? What does it mean? Um, I was worried about the kind of, I was concerned about the bees' welfare. We didn't want them to be too stressed. Um, I started having tinnitus when I was uh, working with the bees at the same time it kind of uh, like hearing these um, sounds kind of unfamiliar sounds emerge. So the circumstances of the field recording uh, made me sense pollinators and pollination in a new way, maybe start questioning um, or asking different types of questions. Um, and so the recording of the bees in the studio was definitely a call to attention about addressing the politics of capture. Um, and I think that, um, I mean, I, I start just thinking about the 19th century with its Western technologies and its agricultural standardiza standardization. I think about uh, the histories of, of sending animals by the post and, and railway. Um, I think about the invention of the Mughal beehive in uh, 1852 with its modern frames, and that these upset the natural topographies of the hive and the wax making practices of the bees and, and the rhythms. Um, I begin to think about um, anti-parasite treatments that are put into place that kind of also um, act as quick solutions. Um, and um, ultimately hurt the health of bees. Um, I began thinking about the Victorian concept of the bee factory as a uh, factory with its worker bees. Um, um, and I also, be, of course, think about the emergence of sound recording studios and um, technologies and the cuts and frames that these make. Um, and um, I just wanted to, yeah, to point out again that this experience um, kind of called me to reconsider the roots of our sensory orientations. Uh, how do I listen and how do I sound? Why do I sound and to whom? Um, very basic questions that we have to ask all the time. And I just wanted to reference Hungry Listening by uh, Dylan Robinson, which is a book that starts to kind of address some of these um, orientations. And I also wanted to say that um, the people working at Booby are absolutely addressing some of these important conversation points about maybe letting the bees do their own things, um, what other kind of uh, beekeeping traditions can they bring into this, this, um, this context. Um, Oliver works with his head beekeeper, who is Araf, who is Syrian, who has a, a also different traditions and ways of thinking about, about this process. So they're thinking about how to um, make find new rhythms of making honey. And um, this, um, this is actually a little uh, frame in which bees actually built their own, their own hive. 
So now let's move on to uh, the next thing, the next scene. So we started, um, Oliver and I started carrying around these sounds. So we said we just put them in a, an empty B box and um, hooked, up micro, uh, hooked up headphones and we took them to fairs and we had people listen to this, this sound. And there was, we kind of noticed that people were drawn to these sounds. It was, it was a moment of discovery, of, unfam of unfamiliarity and lots of questions emerged. So there was this moment when we were able to, we were, uh, we had a proposition of um, uh, creating a, a small installation for a public outreach event in Copenhagen. Um, and this is really, um, this is, a, this was an event for everyone. Um, and often this was, this happened on culture night. So a lot of people were coming in from outside of Copenhagen. So we really had to try to, and we were in a very kind of like strict parameters of space and, 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 and all kinds of parameters. So we had to, we kind of wanted to think of, of um, what we could do um, uh, to kind of think like if honey is not defined as a product to be bought, um, how can we underline the mutual collaboration um, kind of happening between bees, flowers, and people in honey and, and get at this kind of urban, um, yeah, I don't know, urban living together idea. So we created an um, um, exhibition called The Magical Urban Honey Factory. Um, and we decided uh, to put the bee sounds at the entrance as a kind of way of maybe creating a, um, an oral entryway into this uh, different sensory space. Um, and maybe a slightly poetic tone with the story about the queens. Um, yeah, and so um, I guess, and this is kind of what, so people came in and we used the materials from the honey factory and, and had all kinds of different kind of, um, I would say sensory ways of thinking about honey, we hope differently. Um, so the second call to attention was noticing how the polyphonies of this recording draw different urban humans into a mode of curiosity and opening imaginative pathways. And I think that um, for people, I think, I think that this a mode of curiosity and opening imaginative pathways actually corresponds with disturbance and it should not be just beautiful and harmonious and sublime. That's not what I'm, I'm trying to say at all. Um, I think, but I think that understanding how sound still has a power of, of being a mode of curiosity is, is important and something that we, I think as sound uh, researchers should remember. Um, and sometimes it's difficult to do so because we wanna get away from the sound object. And, and it, we want to, of course, be tapping into all these different, um, gosh, ways of, 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 of feeling and um, allowing sound to be. Um, and so I just wanted to make that point. Um, so within this exhibition, I just want to point out that we um, actually kind of tried to focus on registers of pleasure and intimacy uh, shared between bees and flowers. And we had these little kind of, um, I don't know, act activity notices where we asked people to kind of maybe take a pose in a different way, um, where we asked them to listen to move, hear a movement in a stop and stop and listen and all of that. And we also kind of had this, these little kind of poetic interspecies talk where we tried to bring attention to maybe how a bee, a bee were like aspects of, of honeybees that maybe people don't know um, that were related to pleasure. So like this, sometimes a bee likes a flower so much that she sleeps on it all night, um, tasting the flower, being tickled, replying with a buzz. Um, and we um, also gave um, um, kind of, a, you know, we had this whole bulb planting kind of moment as well. Um, and I just wanted to, say that this proposition um, to create a certain kind of vocabulary for a non-academic setting, um, you know, there is an academic connection, um, which I just wanted to mention the inspiring um, collaborative work with Ecologies of Pleasure um, proposed by Carla Hustek and Natasha Myers. Um, there's their work called Involutionary Momentum, Effective Ecologies and um, Sciences of Plant Insect Encounters. This is from 2012, and it, of course, it's been published in French under the title Le Ravissement de Darwin, with a, an, an inspiring and dynamic um, introduction co authored by Mélisse de Carangel and, and Vincien de Pré. So um, I just want to, I sometimes, yeah, this is, well, I, th I think I made my point. I won't go any further. So. Um, 
So this is my third and last scene, and I'm returning to the hon honey harvest now. Um, so I think um, having this experience, making this recording, um, actually, like I said, really opened up and impacted my own kind of thinking about what am I searching for as a researcher? Um, am I trying to collect sounds? Am I looking for a dramatic sound that's audible? Um, you know, what if I stopped recording and just was with the beans? Um, and so during the second harvest in the summer of 2020, um, uh, I was becoming comfortable with bees and I used to feel it the feeling one has kind of with their presence is very much a sonic one. Um, when one takes the top of the hive off, there's this release of pressure and fragrance and heat. And it's also entangled with the buzz of the hive. Um, and of course, one begins to feel um, a certain rhythm and a state of the colony, um, whether they're energetic, hungry, angry, calm, um, if they're really annoyed, they'll be very persistent. And these are all um, yeah, very basic qualities of, of working with, with bees, but um, it really affected me. And I. Melissa, I sorry. Them. Melissa, yes. can you hear me? Sorry, yes. you're breaking up a bit. Can you try? Is there a sound? Are you playing a sound at the same time? Yeah, I was playing a sound at the same time, but it's okay. Over. So it's maybe just yeah. let's leave the sound for, um, for later. Uh, sorry. So, yeah, it's Go all good. On. Yeah, no, no, it's all good. Ah, I'm going through all my things. Um, Okay, I'll just let you live with Anna Singh for a minute while I finish my um, my little story. So I was saying, if you didn't hear me, um, that yeah, there was this moment of um, of harvesting with the bees and um, yeah, becoming like just aware of how the buzz was affecting me um, and feeling this sort of as if kind of the bee sound was moving through me and actually kind of getting done with the day and, and realizing my temporality was completely off, um, different and, and, and a very different rhythm in life. Um, and so I realized that that space of contact was full of, of course, imperceptible movements. Um, and I just wanted to bring up the question of what the Anna Singh asks, what if our indeterminate life form was not the shape of our bodies, but rather the shape of our motions over time? Um, such indeterminacy expands our concept of human life, uh, showing us how we are transformed by encounter. Um, and I think the third call to attention here is for the reorientation and elaboration of practices of listening that notice, attune with, and honor the dynamics of human, uh, human relations, uh, it is a fully bodily and performative practice that mutually, that opens the possibility for, mu for mutual effect. Um, I'm going to leave it there for a minute because I have one other thing to say, which is that um, I was recently listening to this Laurie Anderson's first Norton lecture, and um, she spoke about uh, Whitehead's withness concept, and she played with this 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 term, you know, withness of the body of, of 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 this, you know, this necessary being with the body <laughs> that that we all have, um, and she played she played on it, playing she played on the sonic resemblance of withness and witness as key um, aspects of listening in sonic work, um, and that's my lead into yes, and with um, Anya Kambizer who says, when I'm listening, I can't escape my body, my breath, my discomfort or disposition. I'm acutely aware that my presence is doing something to where I am. I know that my attention brings with it a history that formulates particular kinds of interpretation and representation. Developing attunement means reckoning with this and with being a guest, a trespasser and a colonizer. Historians are not taught how to encounter thresholds, how to move into unknown spaces without territorializing them through bodies, thoughts, arguments, presuppositions, suppositions, presuppositions. Uh, listening teaches me that there are many ways to ask permission, that permission needs to be sought again and again of places as well as of people. Uh, Tunmit makes me aware uh, of when to give thanks and leave, which is one of the most crucial lessons a researcher 
can learn. Um, and I think just that's an, an eloquent enough uh, conclusion. But I also always think of this comment when um, I went to um, Norway to, to do some research on food and, and just found myself like overwhelmed with sounds of water or silence um, and, and kind of didn't know what I was searching for or maybe there weren't immediately recognizable sounds. And um, that that was a, a moment when I started thinking a, a little bit more about, um, yeah, these other <laughs> other ways, of these what maybe the inaudible. Maybe I should just leave it there. Um, so thanks very much. Thank you so much, Melissa. It was really really interesting to hear you. And sorry for the interruption interruption earlier. It was much sorry better. for the technical. Yeah, it was much better when you when you turned off the other audio. Um, no, thank you so much. Uh, Gassia, over, over to you. Um, and just to say thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here and to be part of this panel. I'm inspired by my fellow panelists. And um, I don't know if everyone knows that Nicola is also an urban planner who has a PhD in this. It's wonderful, I think, to see that the discipline is, you know, uh, so open to these kinds of new philosophies that, uh, you know, you're um, discussing and bringing to the table. And Melissa, I'm just continuously blown away by your creativity, and um, it's it, it was an inspiring talk. Um, I'll just uh, share my screen. I'm going to play a video, and uh, one moment. So yeah, I'll just play it. It's about 20 minutes. Hi, uh, my name is Gassia Uzunian, and um, I'm based at the University of Oxford. Just to give a short introduction to myself, I uh, started a group called Recomposing the City in 2013 with the architect Sarah Lappin, and we've been supporting different projects across sound art, architecture, and urban design. Um, and we've been collaborating with Tetra Mundi for a while. Uh, this was a workshop that we hosted in 2018 in Beirut called Urban Sound and the Politics of Memory. And uh, mo more recently, we've been uh, doing a project called Scoring the City, in which we invite architects to create urban scores that respond to the social and spatial conditions of a particular site. Uh, so you can check that out. Um, and then today's paper is from a new project, which is called Sun Cities. It's based at Oxford. It's a five-year ERC project. And this chapter is, I hope, will become a chapter in a book that I'm writing called Sensing the Sonic City, Hearing Urban Life. The 2020 lockdowns triggered an unprecedented quieting of cities. What the Boston Globe called the great diminuendo and what the Guardian described as an unprecedented wave of silence that followed in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic was measured in seismic terms. 185 seismic stations around the world registered up to a 50% drop in anthropogenic noise. The most pronounced drops occurred in densely populated urban areas where seismometers typically register human activity as a near continuous signal. Lockdown measures uh, resulted particularly in a reduction in high frequency seismic ambient noise. There was a concurrent drop in audible noise uh, that was picked up by noise monitoring microphones. And this was also picked up by people who reported living in a suddenly quieter world. Outsourcing projects captured changing pandemic soundscapes. The global sound mapping project Cities in Memory launched Stay Home Sounds, inviting people to share recordings of pandemic soundscapes. One contributor shared a three minute track titled Rastro de Madrid with no people. Madrid's vibrant El Rastro flea market, normally home to over a thousand vendors, sounded like a quiet back alley. Some lamented the disappearance of once chaotic urban soundscapes. New York Times heard a city out of rhythm. Others celebrated the newfound quiet in cities like Bangalore and Barcelona, which are normally plagued by noise pollution and wondered how this acoustic sustainability could be taken into the future. Listening in this context took on new emotional weight. As one writer observed, my ears have become attuned to the shifting soundscape of my neighborhood, and each sound elicits a different emotional response in me than it used to. Birdsong feels uncanny, sirens a lit match to anxiety. 
It was reported of Bogota, Colombia, one of the most congested cities in the world, that the usual sounds of traffic had all but disappeared. In their place, a new soundscape had emerged, one characterized by the sounds of domesticity and emergency, the scrape of the plates in the na- neighbor's kitchen, the gush of a sink, the occasional ominous scream of an ambulance. Many city dwellers also reported hearing sounds that had always been there, but that had previously been masked by noise, in particular the sounds of non-human life. One contributor to Stay Home Sounds shared a recording of bees from London, what he had first believed to be the sounds of industrial machinery. The sounds of non-human life were more audible, more noticeable, and in many cities actually more present. The seismic drop in noise levels led to a rewilding of cities. As reported in the New York Times, pandemic lockdowns have given nature a breather all around the world, bringing animals to unexpected places. Cougars toured the deserted streets of Santiago. Wild boars have strolled through the lanes of Haifa. The twin effect of the quieting and rewilding of cities inspired numerous artistic and musical responses. Um, Today, I'd like to focus on the work of Catherine Clover, whose practice has long been intertwined with the voices of urban birds and the idea, contra science, that they are language users. Clover, who was born in London and who's based in Melbourne, has a particular interest in common urban birds, who she says are gregarious, loud, and social birds who have a near ubiquitous presence in cities, but who are increasingly viewed as pests. Uh, Clover draws attention to the voices of urban birds, not only to signal their presence in our shared urban environments, but to find what we have in common, how we might find an open-ended place for communication and understanding. The desire to find such a place of understanding has emerged in various ways in Clover's work. In Calling the Birds, uh, she documented her interactions with a group of silver gulls at Port Melbourne Beach. She transcribed uh, phonetically their sounds and discovered that they resembled common words in English. And so she said that through the process of listening and transcription, quote, the gull and human voices become less distinct and less separate from each other, and that this represented a blurring of the boundaries between two forms of communication, two languages. More recently, Clover has formed cross-species choirs that are predicated on the idea of communicative exchange between birds and humans. For one instantiation in March 2020, she invited a group of around 15 people to voice text-based scores that comprised transcriptions of pigeon calls. Within minutes, the group transformed into a pigeon choir, uh, voicing phrases like kuruku kuruku and Bakataku, Bakataku. So they shared a moment of becoming closer to birds through voicing what could plausibly pass as a shared language. Um, as such, pigeon choir could be seen as what Donna Haraway has called kin making through what Clover calls voicing. Um, And it's significant that this kin making happens through the realm of the voice. The voice has traditionally been uh, theorized as species specific, as community specific, and even as family specific. So it's probably the most uh, recognizable sonic marker of kinship. Um, It marks people as being related through shared language, speech patterns, accents, prosody, intonation. Um, But so inviting people to voice pigeon sounds and find in them something familiar, uh, Clover compels a sensitization to the voices of creatures with whom we cohabitate, but whose voices we typically ignore or repress. As Haraway says, pigeons are contested subjects, they're treasured kin and despised pests, companions in work and play and carriers of disease. Clover told me in an interview that when making pigeon sounds, um, it creates a sense of connection where we're just a part of things and that whole hierarchy is flattened and we are addressing these creatures as language users. During the coronavirus pandemic, um, 
Clover created several works that explored the idea of birds as language users. For Song Cycle, she installed on two of Melbourne's most prominent billboards her transcriptions of the calls of two urban birds, the red wattle bird, um, which is called Yanguk in the Aboriginal language Woiwurrung, and the common starling, which was introduced by British settlers in 1857. And these are her transcriptions of those calls. Several of Clover's works explore the tension uh, figured in the encounter between the indigenous inhabitants of a place and more recent arrivals, a tension that in Australia is rooted in histories of colonization that have been characterized by the extermination, mass incarceration, expulsion, dispossession, and disenfranchisement of Aboriginal peoples, as well as the destruction of natural habitats, ecosystems, and wildlife. Clover's ear is deeply tuned to the ongoing repercussions of colonialism, which her work suggests can be found, among other places, in birdsong. Following the logic that songbirds acquire songs through mimicry and learning, the song of an introduced bird like the common starling would have influenced the song of a native bird like the young guck, and vice versa. As Clover says, like we do, songbirds learn their language. It is not innate. Thus, the introduction of a new species of bird into an environment already inhabited by other birds contributes to what we might think of as an evolving birdsong ecology in which the songs of native and introduced birds meet, commingle, and transform one another. Ornithologists and cultural theorists use similar terms to describe such moments of encounter and exchange. Ornithologists call this a hybrid zone, whereas some cultural theorists in examining human migrations call this a contact zone, quote, a zone where peoples, commodities, and cultural ideas mingle and tangle and recombine. It's been said in biology that the study of the hybrid zone is especially fruitful when examining birds, among all other fauna, and is particularly when examining birdsong, since song acquisition is considered to be a cultural trait versus being genetically encoded. If birds acquire songs in part by mimicking other birds who happen to be in the vicinity, then birdsong can be thought of it as encoding patterns of bird migration and encounter. Since in Australia or Wurundjeri country, uh, country um, the migration of certain birds has been part of a larger colonialist project, then we can think of birdsong as encoding histories of colonialist migration, as well as the dynamics of violence and dispossession that those particular migrations entailed. To my mind, Clover not only imagines, but attempts to hear and reveal, through listening and transcription, birdsong ecologies and the social, cultural, and political histories they encode. By putting a native birdsong and an introduced birdsong into close proximity and therefore into dialogue, as she does in Song Cycle, Clover gives form to this hybrid zone, one that has deeply shaped the city of Melbourne itself whether a person is aware of it or not. It is significant that Song Cycle is located in the heart of the city, since, as Clover tells me, it is important to recognize that even the most developed parts of the city are Aboriginal land. So by having this particular combination of native and introduced birdsong on in the city's most you know developed most settled and most urbanized core she's subtly signaling the idea that this too is aboriginal land in a different lockdown project wild bird and admiration pond birds in isolation clover created an instagram account where she invited people to in explore the increase in the audibility of bird song during the covid 19 isolation and to share their stories of encounters with birds um, one person shared an encounter with uh, over a hundred crows who had gathered on the gum trees outside her house uh, this was vanessa tomlinson writing from brisbane and she wrote that um she, a, um, an individual would have a chance for their say and then a chorus would respond occasionally a breakout group would go to the second tree for some in-depth discussion before reporting back to the main session 
Often there would be problems with language as an individual crow would have a unique way of articulating something. This was negotiated by other crows at first mimicking the language and then assim assimilating it into their own vocabulary. Um, she said that at first she was uh, bothered by this noise, but then she listened to the entire five hour session. I felt this was a commentary on us, the changing world, the new opportunities, the new responsibilities. Vanessa's account would likely be seen as a misinterpretation by scientists since the prevailing scientific view is that birds do not communicate in the way she describes. And yet by inviting people to share a range of interpretations of birdsong and by affirming those interpretations, a form like wild bird pod allowed for plural and divergent ideas about bird communication to emerge and aligned. As such, it fits with Clover's larger project of embracing what, following Stephen Feld, um, might be thought of as acoustomologies, sonic knowings, where scientific studies of bird vocalization tend to focus on such quantifiable features as the regularity, frequency, syllable length, and variation in bird call, Vanessa heard in the annual parliament a communicative exchange, and she found in that exchange ethics and a politics, a commentary on us, the changing world, the new opportunities, the new responsibilities. Each of the stories on Wild Bird Pod stemmed from particular and situated acts of listening, acts that were contingent, momentary, embodied, localized, and culturally and historical, historically specific. As such, these stories might be thought of as representing different auditologies, ways of knowing that emer emerge specifically through listening. Although Felt's concept of acoustomology does encompass sound and listening, um, I use the term auditology here to distinguish between acoustic and auditory ways of knowing, whereas an acoustomology could be read as the knowledge contained in or transmitted through sound, an auditology shifts the place of knowing from the thing itself to a process of encounter and engagement with that thing. As such, an auditology is necessarily contingent and relational. I also use this term here since discussions of urban soundscapes, as well as of birdsong, are typically wedded to describing the thing itself, so the sounds themselves, and do not always examine or even consider the processes of listening, or the politics of listening, or the ethics of listening, um, that characterized those encounters with those sounds. It's worth noting that Clover herself prefers to use the term unlearning in describing her practice. So this signals her commitment to questioning knowledge hierarchies, particularly those that privilege Western and scientific knowledges over local and indigenous ones. For Clover, listening is the key methodology for unlearning. She listens not in order to know more, but to confront and transform her own habits and ways of knowing. Rachel Carson famously opened Silent Spring by describing a, wor a world marked by the absence of birdsong, what she called a spring without voices. For Carson, a world devoid of birdsong was a powerful symbol of environmental crisis, um, what was not an imagined future, but an unconfronted reality. In a conversation with the philosopher Vincent Desprez, uh, Donna Haraway used the term phonocene to describe the sonic conditions of environmental crisis. She's also used the term to describe a post-anthropocentric model of sound and listening that embraces non-human and more than human perspectives. Donaway, uh, Donna Haraway um, heard the sound of the phonocene this past summer in exploding wildfires, the sound of decomposing bodies, and the sound of birds falling out of the sky. Um, this mass die-off of birds in the southern United States uh, as caused by wildfires. She said the phonocene is the sound of those birds on those flyways um, as their migrations were rerouted, and it was the sound of the wildfires that had driven them to their deaths. The COVID-19 pandemic has been described as a paradigmatic example of an Anthropocene disease because it resulted from interlocking natural, social, political, and economic systems. In the, the, uh, phone, during the pandemic, the phonocene was audible in the sounds of public alerts, ambulances, sirens, 911 calls, oxygen machines, life-saving apparatus, as well as the sounds of disease and death. Perhaps counterintuitively, it was also heard in the increased presence of birdsong. 
Whereas birdsong has traditionally been considered a marker of biodiversity and thus environmental health, during the pandemic it was a sign in which uh, plague and environmental degradation were so extreme that humans had to withdraw from public life and birdsong dominated in the public sphere. So as this example shows, there's no such thing as a sound of climate crisis or a sound of the phonocene. Um, an absence of birdsong might uh, index environmental disaster, but so might an abundance of birdsong. So instead of thinking about what these sounds index, we might think about what they reveal about the wider environmental, social, and political ecologies in which they emerge and operate. Um, Donna Haraway has asked, how might we hear the phonocene in ways that matter? Her question suggests that listening could be a tool not only for indexing crisis, but for world building. Drawing on Haraway's question and Clover's practice, a question we might ask in the wake of the pandemic is, how might we hear cities? How might we hear cities in ways that matter? How might listening to non-human others enable us to unlearn our usual modes of urbanism and enact new ones which are attuned to the voices of such minor uh, urban acoustic communities as birds, uh, whose voices have paradoxically been amplified and multiplied by the pandemic. As Clover's work shows, listening to non-human others can offer a route towards understanding the history of encounters, of migrations, of the uneven exchange that characterized um, our shared histories, as well as the built environments we continue to inhabit and create. They can also invite us to uh, consider plural and non-hierarchical ways of knowing, alternative acoustomologies and auditologies. Listening to non-human others can sensitize us to our urban kin. It can awaken us to the commonness that we share with those others who are, of course, also ourselves. And as we're talking about non-human others, it's worth also considering those human voices that have been dehumanized and who are considered less than human. So those people who society deems pests and who are despised. Listening to non-human others in the context of crisis, whether pandemia or climate crisis, invites an understanding of listening as worlding or even listening as repair. And there I reference Alex DeLittle and his project. Um, so this is not hearing as a way of registering sounds or describing soundscapes, but an urgent mode of listening that registers and responds to disruption and trouble, that stays in the contact zone and questions its dynamics, that asks us to think critically about who and what and how we hear, that invites us to rethink, undo, and remake the worlds we inhabit and create. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gassia. Um, so for those, Gassia mentioned that very quickly at the beginning, for those of you who are concerned, Gassia is not a ventriloquist. She started a video of her talk uh, to make sure that uh, the perfect conditions were, were there. So it might have been a bit disturbing for those joining uh, in the way. Um, uh, thank you very much for the three of you for, for, for your presentations. They were really fascinating. And, uh, and also I see uh, great connections uh, between all of them. Um, I mean, there's already a question in, in the chat, so I will come to it in a minute and I won't monopolize uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the speech. Um, first, an anecdote is that we talked a lot about Anatsing and Vincent Desprez, and actually I just realized that I saw them once giving a talk and it was in this room, uh, so they were sat on the, that very sofa, so Anat Singh and Vassian Depré uh, together for a very nice evening at Gatilleric two years ago, uh, which was really, really enlightening. Um, it's, uh, I see also, um, uh, also really interesting aspects in terms of encoding or decoding, in terms of attunement, in terms of um, um, uh, providing a classification or an understanding of sounds or D or unlearning this classification. And it's stroke, I mean, different aspects uh, were very present to me whilst I was listening for you to your three panels. The first one is how, as Melissa said, bees do not listen with ears, they listen with, with, with the body. And uh, as just as you said that, and John mentioned this morning, 
We have the Parisian metro going underground just below us, I think a few meters down. So it's not so much that we hear it, it's that you, we can feel it in our bodies when, 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 the, when the carriage goes through. So it's obviously, it gives a very interesting uh, aspect and a very interesting echo, uh, but not intended to, to Melissa's presentation, uh, to, to hear this. And also, as Garcia as well mentioned a few minutes ago, it's uh, in relation to, to bird songs in, in the city. Um, it's not so much that they, um, it's not so much that we had more of it uh, during lockdown. It's just that we, they were more present uh, simply because the noise produced by humans had disappeared or had decreased. And obviously it's also linked to what Nicola mentioned about decentralization of, of uh, human sounds and also to the notion of attunement. And that's really interesting is that how do we move away from a human focused uh, approach to, uh, to sound? And you gave a lot of questions and a lot of leads uh, that we can exploit uh, to do that. But it's still very interesting to realize for us how it's very, very difficult to um, disconnect or disconnect our human experiences of, of sound to the, the ones we perceive. And a final element in relation to sensuality, and it's really interesting how when we talk about sound, sensuality always comes back. Even though when we talk about visual aspects, we don't necessarily talk about the sensuality of, of, of seeing, the sensuality of gaze. When we talk about sound, it, it always comes back because it probably is that uh, it's much more present in our, in our bodies and we, we have a much stronger relationship to it. We also are probably much more used to classify sound in what we like and what we don't like and stuff, aspects that we find pleasant, others not. When I listened to Melissa's bees, uh, for me, I f it was very unpleasant. And um, it took me a few seconds to realize that it remind, put me back in the dentist's chair of hearing the, the, the tools that you use to uh, dig through a hole in, in, your, in your teeth and how you always uh, classify, how you always uh, provide norms uh, to understand and link back the sound that you know or that you don't know to something that you know. And this is a mechanism, I think, which is way less present with visual aspects of approaching uh, at the city, I'd say. Um, okay, I, I should probably stop there. And obviously, it's it's one of those, it's not a comment, it's not a question, it's a comment kind of uh, a way to, to, to come after your three fascinating uh, discussions. Um, there is a question, there was a question from uh, Chris Cortado, um, I mean, that's, the, that's the handle, that's the nickname, obviously, uh, for Nicolas. Uh, he or she or they, they write in the chat uh, that if we ascribe sonic agency to human-made machines on their own, then we could come to the conclusion that the embodied sonic presence of humans is already decentralized and in fact marginalized by the ubiquity of machine sounds, especially in urban environments. So wouldn't we, wouldn't we need to also, we, were, uh, we should, we, don't we need to also recenter and focus on the um, embodied sonic presence of humans among its fellow non-human urban dwellers? Uh, this is a question for for Nicola. It's a bit long. If you want, it's a bit long. If you want to read it properly, you can go on the chat on the Getty Lyric website. Nicola, please, would are you inspired no. by this question? And could you provide us with some with some leads uh, to answer that? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Actually, uh, it's um, I, I think that this question also was um, uh, was was made uh, just before the, the the other two presentations, and I I think that the other two presentations. Uh, gave uh, more insights, uh, also gave more um, uh, suggestion to me to, to answer or at least to try to, uh, to give some, uh, some, more, um, some more reflection to, to, uh, to, to these. Um, I, I wouldn't say actually that the, the human presence is decentralized and marginalized because these two adjectives are referring to, um, uh, to, to somehow um, uh, a decentralized role in the human 
um, in human activity, but actually, as we know, is not. I would say that there is um, human activity and human agency is uh, more and more ubiquitous. So it's ubiquitous is everywhere. Uh, so th that's why I wouldn't say marginalized because somehow it's like uh, more and more everywhere uh, human presence and uh, also through the machine uh, as I say the, the human made machines so but apart from from that uh, of course I agree that we need to 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 focus on the embodied sonic presence of humans and to let's say the impact that many uh, many uh, human sounds are uh, are producing, especially in regards to other non-human uh, species, and this is the case of the of the bees, as um, as uh, accounted by Melissa, and at the same time is the case of the birds, as accounted by Gassia. So I think that these two case studies, which are much more uh, um, empirical than mine. Uh, presentation can give uh, like specific uh, context to to what this uh, what does this mean, uh, and of course there's uh, many uh, researches that are that are dealing with, uh, for example, the the impact of human sounds, human activity on the behavior of um, of uh, animals, for example. And of course, we we need to be aware of that. We need to study more uh, these impacts, uh, especially because these are. Uh, uh, let's say negative impacts because they are affects their lives. They uh, affects their uh, the way they 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 move into the environment and they uh, reproduce and uh, and so on. Uh, so this is to say that uh, I I am um, I'm really uh, I mean I, I I confirm what he, what he, uh, this uh, this question says when when we need to uh, focus on the embodied sonic presence of the humans uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, especially, um, and especially, I I I don't feel that uh, the human process is marginalized, but rather it is uh, more and more ubiqu ubiquitous. Yeah, I hope I under I understood well your question, and I thank you again. I'm it. I'm sure you have. Yes, uh, Gasia, Melissa, you want to comment on that, or or otherwise, I've got questions about shipping bees and and uh, and uh, and uh, shipping birds. <laughs> yes. More than more on this, uh, I, I just I found as Nicola just mentioned, it's really interesting how you, well, both relied on well on traveling, uh, let's say uh, traveling animals uh, that are birds and and bees, um, and I was wondering, um, and obviously we saw as well different mechanisms. Uh, I was I suppose su as surprised as you, Melissa, when you first heard about it about those bees being being shipped. So I don't know if you could. If, if you're willing, if you, if you could elaborate on, on that relationship between shipping bees and, and that relation to uh, attunement and to, to sound. I mean, how did that unlock your approach, uh, approach to this? Because I, it's fascinating in your paper that you mentioned those two elements. You could leave out the shipping bees aspect completely, but it's something that you research as well, uh, re uh, shipping animals through post, through another infrastructure of communication. Um, I'd love to talk about it. I'm not an expert at all, um, but it was absolutely part of the moment. Um, so that was kind of one of the points of my I, my talk, and perhaps this can um, tie into to your quest, your comments, your first, your opening uh, response. Um, we're so used to having, you know, oh, it's an interesting sound. It's acousmatic. Where does that sound come from? How does it sound like a dentist chair or a Morse code or whatever? But um, I'm really fascinated in the process. So the process of the recording or, um, you know, engaging that box on the table. Um, and there, these are stories that um, from my research pr researcher perspective, from my training as a classical musician and then yeah, and in terms of how I should analyze, classify, index sounds, maybe that box isn't so important, but that box is already always what's, what I'm interested in. And I think that that um, is why I start working on maybe what some people would call ground level stories. Um, so that box, that resonating box was totally a strange, um, actually quite magical because of its sonography. I mean, it was completely dramatic to come in and find a buzzing um, box. It made me, um, I think it makes everyone a little bit 
um, not everyone, but maybe some of us a little bit sad saying, oh, these bees are, are going in the post. We, we lost a couple of boxes. Uh, what happened to those bees? Um, the, thinking that you know the postal system is right now completely um, almost um, extinct. Um, and I think this actually sparks into some of um, in, you know some of the idea of movable colonies. So that's also why I talked about the movable frame. Um, I can't remember her name. There's a wonderful researcher at the Max Planck Institute who works on milk and honey and through these movable boxes in Israel and how you know the kind of colonialization of milk and honey um, brought through these boxes that would move bees. Um, I think of other, you know, amazing documentaries talking about, you know, moving on uh, semi trucks, whole bee colonies from one place to another to work um, to, to make honey all year round. So this mo motion of, of transportation, of course, is huge. I think of amazing books talking about the uh, movement of cattle. Um, and we can think about, you know, how cattle was moved and across in steamliners across in the 19th century. So, yes, that whole infrastructure of trains and boats and moving animals um, is a part of this story. For me, um, I trace, I mean, it's a long story. Um, I'm a 19th century historian, so I like going back to the 19th century moment. Um, it was, uh, I also, I remember I was talking to someone else and stories pop up about someone saying, oh yeah, I remember hearing boxes of tweeting birds uh, in, the post, in the post office when they used to ship birds to repopulate to hunt. I can't remember who told me this, it was an anecdote, but um, there does seem to be a tradition of this. And it also, I want the last, the last anecdotal link I can make um, was going to Norway and, and you know, the history being in a fjord and the history of getting a road and having you know the postal trail in in the late 18th century kind of uh, created through the mountains, um, you know from from Oslo to Trondheim and being and seeing how um, Enlightenment um, historians had uh, uh, map sorry Enlightenment uh, geographers had drawn a straight line through the mountain and so the trail is abandoned now but it goes like this up the mountain, and and the importance of what that did uh, in terms of bringing food into a region that can't produce food very easily. So um, as I was sitting there trying to figure out what amazing sounds were around me, what, um, what changes were happening to the fjord, what pollution was going on in all this story, this postal road and this kind of sending animals by these technologies uh, really did emerge into my story. And I really want to embrace them, but that's all I have to say. That's already quite quite a lot to deal with. I mean, there are, there are so much yeah interesting aspects uh, of this um, uh, well migration patterns. I mean, Gassia, you also mentioned that in your in your, in your presentation on 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 um, I mean, especially in relation to song bird songs and how they are revealing encoded patterns of of uh, of birds migration and the way they are perceived and um, I've been trying to obviously pin down the exact question I am going around this this aspect for some time and you know how the topic of migration is really uh, interesting and fascinating and and and, and close to to my heart um, so I was just wondering as well um, yeah how do you uh, what what do you do with this? Uh, obviously, being being aware of this in relation to an urban environments, which is the 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 topic of of the project that you've that you've started, I believe, last year. Um, and how do you deal with those? And I know obviously that you've done projects in Beirut, and you 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 haven't limited yourself to to the UK. That that's for sure. Um, and um, yeah, how do you deal with that aspect of of uh, migration, uh, a question of um, question of encoding of of birds, some question of relationship to to sound in cities, and what you've learned from walking with different people in different mm -hmm. places, uh, and also accept my apologies for not very it's, well. It, no, don't worry, uh, don't worry at all. <laughs> it's just, you question, know, um, I, sure I think you, you know these are ideas that are also you know somewhat new to me when I uh, first. Um, you know, encountered the work of Clath Clover, I, I have to say I was really quite um, 
uh, taken by how she is thinking about birds as language users, but also then as um, I find, you know, it, it's in my, to my mind, it seems that her wor work, because she is thinking about things like native bird song and introduced bird song, and, you know, in that song cycle, especially how she puts them next to each other, and she's uh, pointing out that the introduced bird, this common starling, was part of this colonialist, um, you know, project in Australia and in Melbourne specifically. Um, you know, to my mind, um, her work then speaks to the ways in which, as I said in the presentation, bird song is almost like a recording device. It's almost because it's happening through this form of uh, mimicry and learning. Um, it is encoding, you know, those uh, patterns of migration as well. And so for me, it was, you know, kind of thinking that about her work, it, it kind of revealed, you know, the ways, the way in which we also, our language changes, our speech patterns change, our, you know, we can find this as well, you know, in our migrations, the way we hear each other. Actually, when we went to Beirut, it was the first time I heard other Armenian people who sounded exactly like how my family sounds. And I was really kind of, um, you know, I was like, wow, okay, this is kind of where we come from, this specific kind of place and community, um, because I just had ever heard it exactly like that before and um so it, it's interesting to me then to think about the voice as a recording you know device as well and as something which is recording history you know shared histories collective histories uh those you know memories are inscribed somehow in the voice as well um and in the voices of uh, these birds. I, I, I thought that was really fascinating. I, I started looking at a few, you know, scientific studies on uh, bird vocalization. Um, and, 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 you know, they do trace these kinds of um, shifts in those patterns of those bird calls. And I just thought, well, that's kind of an interesting aspect of it, that they're also recording these kind of troubled, uh, very troubled, actually. Uh, histories. Um, so yeah, uh, and, and maybe there's some nice uh, resonances with what Melissa was saying as well about uh, technologies of capture. Uh, she is a historian of sound um, and sound technologies, you know, who's looking at the 19th century, you know, also the, in the ways in which these technologies are sometimes prefigured and <laughs> different kinds of gestures of recording before they're, um, you know, embodied in those apparatuses. Uh, but we also have now, you know, maybe if we think of voice and birdsong as technologies of recording, I think, you know, it, it opens another, uh, hopefully, avenue for um, thinking about these things and researching these things. Um, you know, sometimes when I speak to my grandmother, I kind of think, wow, she's 92 years old. I'm hearing something that came from that time, <laughs> you know, and it's still, yeah. Um, persisting and it, there's something in just the sound of her voice that she brings from that time um okay sorry i don't mean to get kind of uh you know uh wonky there but uh justinia i also wanted to say you know in case people don't know justinia was the editor of migrant journal which um maybe you could tell us a little bit about that um i i know we're close to time so i'll just yeah. stop by saying thank you no no i think we're 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 we we're getting uh, at the end of the time we, we have. That being said, I mean, actually, yes. Uh, so I was editor of of a, of a magazine, and we've we've been meaning to do something about sound, which sound, which when it comes to paper is is obviously very very difficult. I mean, you're all very familiar with it, and there are so many um, there are so many aspects to 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 play with. So I've got I've got a box, a physical box, and a digital box. I've got stories about sound, especially in terms of memory and how a song uh, being played, a song being sung um, in uh, nowadays United States uh, is actually a sound being brought back from Africa and obviously uh, slavery in the 16th century and something that brings about to African-American today actually has its roots uh, in, in very ancient uh, you know, 16th or 17th century uh, sounds and tunes. And uh, But the, the point on which you, you've uh, finished, Cassia, is actually uh, it's a beautiful one, both in terms of um, rethinking uh, birds as uh, uh, mimicking, as, as recording uh, devices. Um, and it also connects back to, to Melissa's and, and Nicola's uh, uh, presentations as uh, they uh, were also, and something we haven't discussed and we don't have time, but the, the issue of uh, decolon decolonization of, of sound, the issue of perception, the issue of 
what is an what is a noise what what is a noise what is a nice sound what is not nice sound and then we go back and to the idea of what is nice urban urban sound management and the question of sterilization or anesthetization of of sound um, there's so much to to unpack that and it's all there are also topics that we we touched upon in the in the previous years in this colloquium and hopefully in the next next editions as well um, so yeah i mean i think it's it's a great way to it's a great way to to finish uh, uh this panel um your three presentations were were, were fascinating and uh, nicola melissa and garcia um and um and i'm sure we can obviously uh, uh look up the the research that you've done on this or that and the papers you will publish very 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 soon and it also reminds uh those who are online that as Jen, john mentioned this morning uh, we will also do a publication based on that colloquium so it's a way as well a way for all of us to to go on with that with this conversation um yes thank you very much for it i, I i'm sorry there's a question in the chat that i forgot to read out loud so please uh nicola melissa and uh, gasia you can you can go up on the chat and and maybe answer that or follow up by email thank you again so much we are way over time uh thank you very much very much for your presentations it was a pleasure to to have you with us today thank you testing is this one on there we go il y a tellement de fenêtres alors chat il y a qu'une personne euh... ah qui manque OK OK mais euh... Les, euh, oui, les surréalistes sont représentés, en tout cas. Alors, moi, je ne vais pas devoir partager l'écran, je ne pense pas. Euh, il ne faut pas que j'ai le stream. <rire> Fin de la journée, je commence à être un petit peu <rire> dans le tourbillon. Ah, je leur demande. OK. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Do you just want to switch your uh, microphones and cameras on uh, so we can just do a quick test that you're coming through? One. Aha. Hello. Is this OK? Sound level wise? Yeah, good for us. Um, just another reminder, it's like my obsession of the day. <laughs> Does everyone, did everyone see an, like fit, uh, see this option for optimizing for the video? Um, mm -hmm. When you share the screen, just to make sure the sound comes through properly. Um, that's great. Um, so yeah, everyone said a word and been heard. Hello, this is Miriam, just testing. <laughs> Hi, Miriam. 
Are you, are you all on separate cameras or are any of you together? We are all on separate cameras. And I think my one colleague is just, she's having some trouble connecting, but um, she should be getting back online. So there'll be <laughs> myself and um, Anjali Nair will be sort of the main two yeah. spokespeople, if you will. But um, sure. yeah. So I'll come around um, and just, I'm actually going to, if it's okay, just ask you to briefly um, introduce yourselves so that we kind of hear from everyone before we then kind of come to the main spokespeople. So I'll ask you in the order that you're on the screen there, um, Sarah, Natasha, then all of the surrealists, uh, then Natasha. Um, and you can just kind of quickly say hello and, and introduce yourselves. And then we'll kind of do another round to come to these starting points and um, that first question that I asked you, oh, actually, I need my email open to remind myself what order I said we were going to do the circular game. Um, so then, yeah, we'll do, we'll come around and do those starting points as a second uh, thing. And then I'll kind of start the game passing a question to, to Sarah. Um, and then we'll kind of go through that and then see if we kind of fall apart into general conversation or if we kind of, you know, reach something really clear and, and focus on that, we'll, we'll improvise with that as it comes. So I think we're good to go. So give me a thumbs up if we're live, we're live. Um, hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for sticking with us or rejoining us or joining us for the first time um, in this final discussion of um, crafting a sonic urbanism, listening to non-human life, uh, presented by Teatro Mundi and the Institut de Recherche Interdisciplinaire sur des Enjeux Sociaux. Um, and kindly hosted by La Gaité Lyrique in Paris, uh, where I'm sitting now. I'm the final person remaining, just saying goodbye to Justinien Trivillon, who hosted our last panel, Goodbye Justinien, um, where we're going to also hit curfew uh, with this final panel. So, um, and uh, we're expecting news of a lockdown tonight. So kind of strange uh, setting, but really, really happy to gather together with um, the wonderful people who are about to introduce themselves. Uh, and we all, with whom I am humbled and honored to share uh, an exhibition, which we presented on Teatro Mundi's website um, in the run-up to this colloquium. Um, when we did the open call, we were expecting to be able to be together, even to have two days together with performances and screenings and all of this kind of thing. And of course, we had to adapt, as we've done so many times over the last year, adapting, changing, improvising um, and remaking our plans. But actually, I'm really, really happy with, with what came together. And I hope that um, most of you watching have had a chance to... Um, uh, most, most of you watching now have had a chance to watch the films uh, at Teatro uh, Mundi. You can go via the homepage, if not, uh, or I've just put the link on the chat um, on the Gaiti Lyrique streaming um, uh, page um, where you will be watching us uh, now. But essentially, the people who, who are joining for this discussion uh, proposed um, films and and as their contributions. And so we invited them to kind of um, share those uh, on our website um, leading up to the, to the event and hopefully also opening up uh, and kind of uh, bringing people into some of the questions and, and atmospheres and feelings that we've been, uh, and stories that we've been talking about today uh, and really kind of remembering how important all of those things kind of beyond uh, the empirical are uh, these kind of yeah these atmospheres these collective sensations these stories that help us kind of be in connection or, or kind of sense these disturbances um, of other voices and, and other forms of life uh, around us as humans and cities so um, yeah I will present myself and then just uh, just ask the other people to quickly tell you who they are. There's quite a few people uh, on the call, um, as we have one collective, who uh, the Surrealists, who submitted their film. Um, but yeah, I'm John Bingham Hall. Um, 
I am director of Teatro Mundi, uh, introduced the day, uh, but I'm also, you know, in terms of myself, I suppose, uh, a kind of lost and reformed sound practitioner in a sense who studied music um, uh, many moons ago and then became an urbanist. Uh, and then through Teatro Mundi actually had the chance to kind of refine a, a kind of sonic practice uh, from my, my music days and start to use it um, to both represent and uh, and respond to questions but I think even more so to become um, aware and to use recording as a form of awareness which is something very much talked about and very well known within kind of you know lots of sonic forms of practice but which is so true and for me has been so useful to kind of rem go back to recording as a as a way of listening and paying attention and opening up new questions some of which uh, you know through the film that I, I've shared um, which I made uh, on the trip to Beirut that Gassio was just talking about that we collaborated on two years ago and published a number of works coming out of that. Um, but that actually kind of in a long and meandering way led to, for me, uh, to this colloquium and the questions that we framed uh, for it. I keep looking at my computer. I was told off for it earlier because I'm so used to speaking to Zoom, but I realized that the camera's over there. Anyway, that's all from me just for now. So I'd just like to, um, ask you all to present yourselves. Um, I can't, we don't have the thing now that said what the order was, but I think Sarah perhaps first. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, am I on the screen now? Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes, um, I'm Sarah Rodriguez. I've lived in London quite a few years. Now I'm back in Porto and actually on the verge of moving to the countryside. So I'm in an interesting position from the urban to the rural landscape so it's interesting to be in this colloquium right now um, I also studied music um, and fine art so I kind of had a mesh between the two um, and I've graduated last year from the MFA in fine art at Goldsmiths I work a lot with audiovisual composition um, performance as well so in between these kind of visual and sonic worlds um, and I'm very interested in kind of um, contemporary notions of autonomy, regeneration in opposition to forms of power and control that, that we're all part of and embedded kind of the social, ecological, contemporary concerns that we're living through. So that's a that's brief, <laughs> condensed introduction. Yes. Perfect. And uh, Natasha. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm um, currently based in Nottingham in the UK. Um, but I've been working between Essex um, on the East Coast and, and Nottingham. Um, and the uh, video that I made um, for this colloquium was um, a, a, vi a, yeah, a video essay um, kind of specifically addressing some of the things that the, um, the conference um, kind of made me think about in, in, in relation to the work that I do. Um, so um, as well, I'm I'm an artist um, and um, often work with performance and sound, um, but think a lot about place specific practices and what that might look like. Um, and at the moment, I'm working between contemporary art and archaeology and thinking about um, the different forms that field work um, can take and the potential of collaboration between um, contemporary art and, and archaeology um, yeah but again a bit like a bit like Sarah I'm kind of living in a city at the moment but a lot of my research uh, happens out, uh, out in Essex which is um, there's lots of sort of salt marsh and arable land but also um, sort of some industrial landscape as well what we would call kind of peri-urban landscape, like really connecting city and rural as well. So yeah, we look forward to coming back to Essex um, and all of the uh, surrealists, please feel free to introduce yourselves. Oh, we can't hear you right now, Miriam. Um, I don't know whether it's that, whether it'd be better without the microphone that you had there. 
Yeah, let's try. Is this That's better? That's much better. That's perfect. We'll just do without the, the headphones. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Miriam. Um, I'm part of the Surrealists. Uh, we are a creative research collective based out of um, Parsons School of Design at the New School. Um, so I'm in my just about to graduate. We're all actually just about to graduate the MFA program in transdisciplinary design at Parsons. And so, yeah, I'm typically based in Brooklyn, um, enjoying all of the, the urban wildlife that Brooklyn brings. And yeah, I'll throw it to my other classmates to introduce themselves. Maybe I'll throw it to Anjali next. Hello, I'm Anjali. Um, yes, I'm also about to graduate from transdisciplinary design and my background is in music cognition um, and I also play in a few punk bands. Um, I've recently been really interested in sound design and urban ecologies and so it was a real pleasure to work on this project with my, with my fellow surrealists. Um, and I guess I'll throw it to Hannah. Hi everyone. I'm I'm Hannah. Um, I'm British German, but I'm based in New York at the moment. So my background is working with lots of different community organizations. Um, and apart from my work with the Surrealists, I am investigating what kind of a queer economy or economies plural could be and could look like um, through the method of cake at the moment. So that's what I'm working on. And I will pass on Uh, to Maria, I think Hannah got muted at the end there. Uh, but yes, like my colleagues have said, we're all in the transdisciplinary design program. Uh, my background is in urban design and landscape architecture, um, and then a little bit of your typical visual graphic design. Uh, so this uh, this particular colloquium really sp spoke to me, to my interests, um, and so I'm very happy to have been able to collaborate on this. So. Sorry, and uh, finally, Natasha. Hi, I'm Natasha Nicholson uh, from Charlick and Nicholson Architects and also the Southwest Creative Technology Network where I've been doing a data fellowship um, for the last year. Um, I come from architecture, um, but uh, with a real fascination for sound and really um, been involved in various um, experiments and bits of practice around that over the last three or four years. Um, starting perhaps with a project called The Tail in Torbay in, in Devon, um, a project of sound installations that I volunteered for. And then I started to do some recording myself um, and also by way of Tune City, which some of you might know of um, the project that I went to in ancient Messini in, in Greece uh, in 2018. Um, so lots of um, inspirations um, and I'm very interested in the relationship of sound to architectural practice and place in the city and that's what um, and I had 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 some involvement um, studying the the Cresson um, the language of everyday sounds and really enjoyed um, ex using that as my as my guide to the city and exploring sound so that was my route to um, join this colloquium and I'm very glad to be here. Thanks so much all of you. Um, yeah it's really wonderful to have people coming from artistic practice, from design, from experimental music, from punk, from cake, from architecture um, and uh, Arno Esquere who is who was the uh, he's the director of the organization that co-organized and uh, co-organized the, the colloquium with us um, he very, very generously uh, in an interview um, kind of a couple of days before the colloquium put Teatro Mundi in a way that I um, hadn't managed to, which is that it's not so much about kind of taking from artistic practice into urbanism or indeed the other way around so much as identifying questions that people are coming at from all of these different perspectives and kind of together we start to actually build this bigger bigger picture. So I think that's um, it's an incredible mix of people and you've all come at the question of this uh, of this colloquium in such, I mean, I was absolutely 
blown away by the films, um, by the speculative fiction, by the incredibly kind of deep scientific ecological research through, through arts, through the way of weaving theory into this kind of sonic meditation. So I'm just so, so grateful to you for sharing those. Um, and what I've asked uh, the um, speakers to do is, so we're just gonna start with, um, talking a little bit about those films, but kind of really focusing on, um, in a way, the issue they were responding to. And um, people are invited to uh, just share a short kind of clip of the film that just helps uh, make that, just kind of bring back to the foreground what those uh, issues were. Um, and then I've proposed a kind of little game of sorts um, that is something we kind of tried out in a panel recently. And I've asked each person to um, look at each other's videos and, and each person to one other person is going to just pose a kind of question or, or bring up a sound, a word, a concept that either seems unstable or interesting or they don't understand and just ask them one by one which is, uh, you know, partly we're kind of going round in circles, like uh, spiraling in, in this, uh, after those introductions, we'll come around again, and then that will be a kind of third circularity. And hopefully in doing so, we can kind of also actually come to and distill a set of concepts that, you know, sometimes what we don't understand or what seems uh, unevident or unstable, uh, once we kind of bring it all together, perhaps become the most, uh, some of the most crucial strategies or, or concepts that we really need to take forward uh, from a conference like this um, as we use it as a way to kind of um, expand and and think further than we you know started so yeah firstly I'm going to come back around and just ask you to yeah just say a few words about the film that you submitted and yeah particularly that kind of problematic or ethics um, or um, the uh, you know strategies um, that it kind of responds to for this kind of interspecies society, which we're kind of trying to find a way of getting out through this conversation. So yeah, I'll come back to Sarah. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the project, The State of Things started in uh, 2017 in Madeira Island. And then I, so, so I had uh, musicians take part from, from Funchal and then it got relocated to Porto. So kind of did the project again. Um, and in that sense, it had a series of questions to do with uh, the musical memories from musicians, but then also focusing on particular sounds of the city. So what they remembered as a prominent sound to them. Um, so it was very interesting for me to, to also relate back to the idea of sound as memory, as in maybe like an episodical memory or something that, that really stayed with them. Um, because we're obviously in, in a room, they're not living their city life when they got interviewed. So, so they specifically brought back something that they clearly remembered. And then, um, so this was during a series of one month. And um, every time I interviewed one participant, there were almost 30. Um, I went back to the city to try and find these sounds that they were mentioning. Um, and obviously, because most of them were quite prominent sounds, I could um, easily get hold of one another. So in each interview, um, I asked them to not only try and um, think through the sound and try and interpret it without having listened to it again, but from, from memory. And then I would give them a bank of sounds, a selection of sounds that I had recorded from other participants who had been part of the project. And they would pick a sound that would also feel quite related to them. And then with headphones, they would try and imitate or copy that sound as much as possible. And this could be either through um, their voice or through their instrument that they're most comfortable with. Um, yeah, and so, and this, um, is that too long? Should I continue explaining? <laughs> I guess maybe um, we can, we'll see some of it, but I suppose like for you, what's that, um, yeah, what kind of prompted you to, to okay. want to kind of explore that like retranslation of these sounds into voice? Um, yes, and so as I was saying at the time, um, it was really to try and understand um, the livability of a place like um, like the city of Porto and to understand what sounds are actually most prominent and how that translate also into, I guess I picked musicians because they're they're very related to sound and somehow they make their own translations of, of, of what they want to um, um, give back 
as, as kind of sonic creations. And so I wanted to know how the city really influenced these sounds and how it kind of co-creates, you know, in a kind of social and cultural level, what we produce. And it was really interesting that um, actually these two uh, bird species were the most prominent, one of the most prominent things, which were the gulls and the pigeons, which actually came up in other conversations. So I'm very interesting to kind of unwrap that a little bit. And also the kind of um, infrastructure of the city was really prominent to the point that they said they couldn't record sometimes because um, there was just so much noise. And it was mainly to do with uh, transportation methods and also construction. Um, and so I just picked a couple of samples from the video which, which play with these things. And also the relationship to the girls in the city and them as some kind of uh, um, imposter figure that, that kind of comes and takes over. Yes. Shall we see the clip? Yes. Um... Pela cidade, sendo que os primeiros, as primeiras pessoas, ou as minhas, as primeiras entidades da cidade que, pois já, as primeiras entidades da cidade que faziam, que invadiam o silêncio eram as garrotas e os pombos. E eu, essa música chama-se Seagulls and Pigeons. Thanks so much, Sarah. We'll come back to um, all of that. Sure. So, Natasha. Um, so, um, when making or when responding to the um, to the call out, um, I was thinking about how um, often um, spaces I could kind of can it when they're undergoing development or when there's a proposition to um to um for sort of large kind of build work or construction to go on often um some of the places are described as being or some of the potential sites for that those works are considered um empty either of um kind of any, any you know human population or or otherwise um and for me um that the sort of the particular um, instance I'm working with is um, with is, is on the estuary uh, in in Essex, um, and um, it's seen with um, um, Boris Johnson's kind of proposal for a sort of a floating airport at some point in the estuary, and the idea, well, no, no you know no one lives out there um so that was one of the things that i was thinking about of, of how um the idea of these empty spaces or the idea that um these places are kind of a, a, a peripheral space and and how both of those ideas are, are, are problematic in different ways um um so for me 
it was considering how um, we often perhaps might think about what what is what is kind of audible um, audible to humans, um, but the my original um, the the original plan was that I would go back to Essex and I would collect lots of field recordings and I'd make and I'd make this work, um, and then with COVID that's not quite been quite been possible. So I've used an archive of of, of field recordings, but they include um, sounds recorded with contact microphones and hydrophones, um, coil receivers. So it's really trying to think about the those places and the, that that kind of sonic landscape is in what what is also kind of beyond human human hearing and, and thinking about how um that could be that could be disruptive or unsettling um and um i guess the legacy of those of, of the the sort of um continued sort of return of sounds um once they're broadcast or transmitted and and how um there's sort of a, a, a legacy of, of that in some in in some ways as well and um that through trying to think of a place kind of sonic sonically um you kind of realize that actually it's um kind of so densely layered but also really regulated um and thinking about kind of radio and how how regulated that space is but also um how expansive that is um and kind of um kind of non non-human forms of hearing that might also um understand those those places in, in quite a different way to how perhaps we would we would describe them so it's not a very not a very articulate <laughs> introduction I'm afraid but perhaps if I show a clip that maybe uh that maybe does the job better than I can say it yeah go for it and please remember that all important optimize for video little box when you get the sharing menu up just so we hear the sound really well Thank you so much. Um, I'll come on to the surrealists. All right, so <clears throat> this piece was kind of based off of some real life examples. Um, one was uh, the idea of these rogue rewilders. So people that were um, kind of incubating butterflies and releasing them much to the chagrin of scientists that were trying to study um, the butterfly population. So they're kind of messing up the scientists calculations. Um, it was also came out of um, some study that we were doing around soundscape ecology and um, just the 
effect that noise pollution has on um, kind of non-human inhabitants of cities. So um, different birds or insects have to kind of modulate and change the frequencies that they are um, communicating at in order to be heard because human noise is kind of taking over um, these various frequencies that they would typically inhabit. Um, other creatures like robins end up having to communicate at night instead of during the day, like when they normally would. So it's just sort of interesting how, you know, to what extent um, humans are kind of taking over, you know, the soundscape and how are other creatures kind of um, dealing with that. So uh, we did, we created this speculative fiction um, as a way to explore kind of an alternate universe where you could get into some of these ideas. And there are four main groups um, that we focused on. So one is the resounders who are kind of sonic vigilantes. So they're the rewilders, if you will. Um, they're taking things into their own ears and they are trying to um, heal damaged landscapes and ecosystems in cities by um, bringing in the sounds of healthy um, ecosystems. So it's kind of like, you know, you're transplanting healthy sounds into unhealthy areas. So their idea is, you know, through this sonic apothecary and sonic prescriptions, they can actually heal different urban landscapes. But of course, not everyone agrees with them. So the Shushers, who are another faction in the story, believe in the sanctity of silence and think that the resounders are, you know, just basically charlatans who are adding to the noise. Um, the loud fellas, a different group, believe that everything is fine. They think, you know, there's no issue here. Um, why? What is soundscape ecology? That seems like a hoax. Uh, they kind of need to see it to believe it. And then finally, the Bureau of Night Skies and Sonic Spectra are, you know, sort of trying to manage things in a top down manner. So they're, you know, uh, divvying up the the various, the sonosphere, if you will, trying to uh, fairly allocate sound to the many inhabitants of the city. Um, so what we did in exploring this and kind of building out who each of these perspectives are, what their agendas are, what each group kind of values and believes in, is um, in the process of every each group being so myopically focused on their own kind of perspectives and views, they are ironically kind of still driving drowning out the creaturely voices that they claim to be, you know, maybe advocating for, you know, in the case of the resounders, for example. So um, I think for us, what we where we landed on, we didn't necessarily want to propose any one solution or claim that the resounders are right or a different group is right, but more just trying to hold the complexity and um, consider what are the ways that we humans are trying to manage some of these um, ecological questions when we don't really have control over everything, we don't really understand how our interventions, what kind of impact they're going to have in the long term. Um, and so maybe there's, there's something to just having kind of a wider field of attunement and perhaps that's that's something that we need to focus on and maybe thinking that humans are not the main protagonist of the story and that we need to understand we're maybe more of a side character if anything um so yeah so that's a little bit of context and then i think maria you're gonna share the clip for everyone yes i am doing that right now All of these discordant groups miscalculated the global time signature. Each thought themselves protagonists of a story. Thank you so much. It's like a really good movie trailer, actually, that <laughs> um, I look forward to the feature film version. Um, so finally, coming on to Natasha. Hi, um, I'm getting some background noise in my headphones. I, I'm not sure why. Um, OK, we'll look into it. All right. Thank you. Um, so my film is called Interspecies Intersections, um, listening in and sounding out new urban narratives. Um, I've chosen a, a short clip from the beginning of the film. 
Um, see. Okay. Um, I'm so sorry, we couldn't actually hear the sound. Do you want to, to play it again? And um, like, um, I think you need, you need to share, click that button that says optimize for video. So it shares the sound, uh, it streams the sound directly rather than coming through the headphones. Um, uh, okay. If you unshare and then reshare, you'll be able to, to do that. Otherwise, um, it's totally up to you. Okay. If you're happy to just continue as well. That's that's fine as well. Okay, well, I've got this. Okay. Okay. Um, I wanted to tell a story to invoke an atmosphere. The lockdown experience was revealing. It seemed to spotlight the power imbalance between us and other species, how displaced and disregarded they are, and interesting in lockdown that we feel disempowered, contained, and not free. Um, my position is that it's right to challenge <clears throat> the privileging of human agency in relations with other species. Interspecies cohabitation requires more than an accommodation of the other. It requires both sides to speak and to be heard. Acoustic methodologies are founded on listening and sounding, and this is an effective way to seek understanding between ourselves and any other. When the other doesn't use the spoken word, a human protagonist will need humility, empathy, and imagination to engage in this process. I imagine a city where the needs of natural species and ecosystems are cultivated as part of its healthy and democratic function, nudged towards natural logic, rhythms of dawn and dusk, gathering of birds at the roost, and sound is the means to reveal and connect. From my lockdown windows, I saw how fragmentary and incidental my sonic experiences of other species were. It reinforced my interest in the collective, the whole species rather than the individual. I'm interested in the big sonic marks that can be made by species, for example, the, the roost, and how these can be let into the urban experience. I present the evocative sonic effect words from the Guide to Everyday Sounds from the Cresson School as an invitation to a methodology I've used myself to explore sound and spatial ideas in the city and to delve deeper into the sonic world. The sonic effect focuses on the experience of the listener in relation to sound rather than the sound itself. I'm particularly interested in the dynamic form as humans and non-human species move in shifting relationships through the city space. And I explore particular intersections of species as sound collage, herons, parakeets, and marsh frogs to 
we begin to show how specific sonic interactions and material or spatial configurations could be cultivated as we tune into the sound of other species and encourage their sonic presence in the city in a developing proximity. That's it. Perfect, thank you. Um, I was just realizing, I mean, I should probably, um, yeah, do the same. Uh, I, I took the liberty of sharing my own film in, in this exhibition, partly because, you know, um, yeah, for me, uh, this kind of experience, uh, Gassia and I went to, to Beirut together as part of a collaboration between Teatro Mundi and Recomposing the City, Gassia's research group. And um, we um, brought together a workshop asking people to think about the um, politics uh, of memory. And so really interesting to, to see questions of kind of memory coming through. But while I was there, I guess I just took a walk through the city um, with, a, with a sound recorder. I took a whole day and it actually didn't have a kind of question that I was asking at the beginning, but I had a question by the end, which is kind of in a city where we heard so often um, that there's no public space, that there's uh, no parks, or at least that it's so limited, I was just overwhelmed by how much life, uh, how much birdsong, how much greenery, um, in a lot of informal ways, in ways that also relate to the kind of history of conflict within the city, but then in new ways that relate to kind of appropriations of nature as kind of part of um, new forms of development, like green walls and things like this, all the kind of ways that, uh, that trees and birds not just kind of inhabited, but also carved out uh, publicness um, in, the, in the city. So I'll just share literally a few seconds of... Oh, and I've made the mistake that I've asked you all not to make. There we go. Okay, my computer's not handling it, but... Um, yeah, essentially, um, if that's trying to come back to life, because I've just had to download the video. But um, the question I kind of emerged with at the end is, yeah, again, not not so much um, how can we or could should we kind of bring nature back into the city, but kind of how in, in ways that we're not kind of paying attention to is, um, yeah, our, our forms of non-human life kind of carving out and actually making a public that we're in, that we're able to inhabit. Um, so I'm actually going to give up trying to share that. And um, I wanted to, yeah, come back to this circle round once more. Um, and uh, with these kind of um, questions, sounds, concepts uh, that you're going to pass on from, uh, from one to another to, um, yeah, to just kind of unpack these and also look for some of the connections uh, between them. Um, and so I'm starting by asking Sarah, um, like I was struck by so many sounds in your um, film, particularly how it kind of crescendoed towards this cacophony of construction and the ways that that seems so kind of like embedded into people's bodies. Um, the other sounds, perhaps that they were kind of thinking of something out there. And then actually when they started to vocalize the construction sounds, it was so kind of like, yeah, there's a certain violence to that. Um, but however much I was kind of looking into all the sounds, I kept coming back to actually something very obvious, which is a word in the title of your piece, which is the word state, um, because um, it has actually, it has so many meanings in English from the notion of the nation state to the form that something takes that at any given time that can shift to, you know, in more kind of like slang English that like, if things are a state, the state of things that they're a horrible mess actually. Uh, and we call something a state to say that it's kind of not working. Um, and so I kind of, you know, when you, you say the state of things, it's so kind of open. And then in your description, you talk about the state of, of sonic urbanism. And I kind of wondered from those like vocalizations and translations, yeah, like what you, what you meant by that, what you see the state of things of sonic urbanism as. Um, yeah, as you say, it's quite an open notion, the state of things. Um, and I hadn't specifically thought about the state as a nation state, but it's interesting to think how how the nation or how the how the political powers also shape the the urban reality, the physical reality of of a place. Um, 
and it wasn't necessarily a, a pejorative term, but it was, uh, yeah, also thinking about state as in, in a matter of flux, as I say, I, I, I mentioned Porto 2018 because it is a particular place and time. So I wanted to also um, see how things were then and to take that document possibly into um, viewing it back in 10, 20 years time. And so you can actually sense the transitions. And um, when I did the project also in Madeira, people actually mentioned sounds that had been already lost because um, I didn't mention that it was actually um, an audio, um, an installation in space. So I went back to the specific places that people mentioned and I mapped them on the floor. So the speakers would actually sound the um, different spaces according to the, the kind of coordinates. So, so yeah, in a way it was kind of a mapping to see what was, um, what, what possibilities were emerging from that, what was actually um, coming to light through these, through these questions. And, um, and yeah, in a sense, when we're speaking about um, uh, interspecies communication, and I'm not, and this is all through a kind of human vehicle of a translation, right? So it's it's voices, it's instrument. I'm not actually um, showing you any of the sounds made by other other species and matter, but I really wanted to kind of um, yeah work with these modes of translations and try to um, try to create a new attunement. To to these sounds that we might hear and might be on our unconscious and affect the way that we live and how other species live but we're yeah to kind of um create a bod a bodily kind of transmission of that and um as i heard in the previous talk which was really interesting um about the pigeons and about um clover's work how how by trying to attune to them we create a kind of new um, sensibility towards these sounds and actually a lot of interesting things came up like saying, oh, I'm trying to remember the different calls of the gulls because I know they have different calls or when they're calling for their babies or, um, so yeah, the, the, a lot of different kind of uh, sensibilities came up about how these sounds were affecting. And as you say, the construction was really, really powerful and, and, and it came up so many times that it was, it's very interesting to see how it's a disruptic factor and to see what kind of entities are creating that disruption that affects both humans and and all species that are kind of trying to together in this urban evolution. So that idea of state as kind of referring more to that notion of flux and mm. a, a state that can change, I guess, like um, now that you describe it that way, I'm thinking of the fact that you didn't kind of record those sounds and say these are the sounds of Porto because the way that they registered in people's bodies is a state that's subject to change and also in the kind of previous panel there was that really interesting um, kind of point around um, the voice as a recording device but then I suppose one that doesn't fix things like the, the one, one that kind of it changes and it evolves how you kind of retell those things so like by focusing on the retelling of these sounds through voice, it also kind of gives justice to the kind of unfixedness of a soundscape in terms of like how it keeps kind of like being retranslated through different bodies and experiences. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah, that's a really nice way of putting it. And yeah, how we assess a kind of reality that's not never really fixed, right? It's it's kind of has to do with people's perceptions and how we um view the world and sense the world so i wanted to kind of uh capture that in what is being translation what is being translated and what so the way we kind of um are able to to apprehend these these different occurrences also shape how we see the present or how we shape the future and so it's important for these moments to be yeah in flux <laughs> uh sarah do you have your word for natasha oh I know it was a word or a sound and I kind of opened it up a bit. Um, That's fine. Into, into my thoughts. I was really interested in this kind of, um, Natasha, when you come up with the with these maquettes and how the different so sonic effects and, and changes in the environment can change your apprehension of sound. Um, and I was actually wondering about the sounds that were um, that were given to us in that section because I saw that you mentioned they were from the, um, they used BBC sound effect archival material. And I was wondering if those mm. were taken from that or if they were physical recordings because um, the, the sounds themselves, and I thought that was interesting, also have some 
some sort of relation to a maquette so it doesn't feel like necessarily specific environment because you also say that you like mm -hmm. the idea of collage and how so it's like you're inviting the listener to go out and do these kind of uh, sonic collages or apprehend it for themselves but that the that the sound itself in in these specific moments were kind of uh put together as almost yeah maquettes of a possible reality yeah yeah um th that um that came up about to some extent by chance um but you're right that those those are from the sound effects library um but it's interesting the way you describe it because i i tried very much with the drawings to strip them right back because mm -hmm. you know any any sort of visual um visual content can be very distracting to tuning into sounds can't it and so I, I deliberately even on the street that the parakeets fly down which is of course lined with trees and that's why they're flying down it um, I didn't represent the trees but I, I described them in words so I was hoping it was a sort of like a skeleton of a of a place and a skeleton of a construction of that intersection um, where as, as, the, as the, the viewer or the listener, you would sort of paint in the detail yourself through different seasons or whatever. Um, yeah. So, yeah, but, but, but I, had, um, I had imagined um, doing a, a binaural recording of the um, parakeets flying to roost or something. And um, I went out several times to try to be there at exactly the right moment when this event occurred. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and it's, I, I mean that that's one of the interesting things about the idea of a of an intersection or a construction like that is is that of course it, it you know it it hardly ever happens you're hardly ever in that place at the time when when this happens so there's something quite special about that I think that you can it's that sort of waiting game isn't it that yeah. a, a, a a place where if if those birds were to fly through or if that was to happen it would be kind of extraordinary but it it doesn't happen. When you want it to you know yeah. no of course and it, yeah, <laughs> that definitely relates to when i was going to record these sounds that people spoke about and i couldn't really capture so in the videos uh, the seagulls are never actually eating rubbish but funnily enough i was walking down the street yesterday and for the first time i actually saw the seagulls eating rubbish and i actually recorded on my phone <laughs> <laughs> because of this conversation today so i thought that was very timely um and i also had a question john can i ask more questions Go ahead. Why okay. not? <laughs> I also had a question. I, I think it's, yeah, it's, uh, as you say, the, the strip back drawings are very interesting in the sense that you do kind of color it in or you put your imaginary of places and time to, to that very stripped down version, which I enjoyed. And, um, but I was wondering in your work as an architect that if you, um, if you do think about these sonic effects a lot of the times and if the materials you use and consider, um, come into play and if that happened before if you had any specific kind of anecdote um, well I've, I have been doing some work um, uh, recently on um, the materiality of signal blocking which is sort of related to your to your question so through some of the work that I've done around sound thinking very much about the skin of a building um, and how sound or radio waves for that matter or you know any of these things can pass through or not pass through that skin and it's quite a different way of thinking about architecture um, also because meshes and the kind of materials that you you use in that instance are um, acoustically fairly transparent aren't they and so it, it, it's quite interesting in terms of that of what that does to architecture and the city I think um, it, it would become possible if, if this this great this great thing of um, reducing traffic noise happened um, because then you could introduce a whole different language of materiality as well as enjoying all these sounds that we can't currently hear properly. <laughs> Natasha, I don't know if you were uh, tuned in for the panel earlier, Lively Materiality, but Matt Parker was talking about crystals as both kind of um, these materials that are part of, uh, you know, very intensifying kind of communication technologies, but they're also kind of being thought of um, a kind of wellness industries that are talking about certain materials that can also block or protect um, uh, these the, this radiation and these waves but then also the fact that honeybees in cities were producing more propolis and whether that was a kind of like a, a speculation on whether that was a 
um, a response to kind of blocking signals. So all of this kind of mix of mythology mm. and materiality and reality around this kind of like whole realm of, of life of kind of waves and energy transfer that's kind of invisible. Uh, it's really interesting. So maybe one to pick up on mm -hmm. there in terms of <laughs> architecture and um, because Matt's coming very much from a kind of sound and music point of view, I believe. Um, but I'm going to ask um, Natasha, do you have a word, question or concept to pass on to uh, Natasha? Yes, um, and it relates a little bit to what we were just talking about. So really, the, the, the thing that um, I absolutely loved about your film was the, um, the layering of sound, this sort of entity that you created um, from all these um, different sounds. And I, I didn't know um, until I heard you say where some of these came from, but I, I could very much um, hear, I found particularly on the second and third listening, um, the, 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 the distinctions in the sounds and the construction of that really came through very powerfully. On the first one, I felt sort of overwhelmed by this ambient um, experience. Um, so it, it was it was the sounds, the, the creaking of oars and, you know, the pistol shrimps or the Geiger counters and um, the, the sort of natural sounds, the winds, and then these um, other um, electromagnetic maybe sounds, you know, very suggestive. And um, it felt to me, and I, so my question, it sort of relates to how, how, you, how you think about this as an entity, because it felt like a sort of living uh, data store almost that you'd created it it felt in, in my listening to it it felt by the end of it that the other things the visual material and everything were just related to this um sort of entity of sound that went through the whole film and i i picked up i i'd, I'd like to, to know what what you would say about it um that it's it spoke very much of time um you know, past time and future time, as you were talking about, was sort of held within this thing. And also scale, you know, the micro scale, the microorganisms were suggested in the images to the macro scale um, and, and these things. And then at the end, you said something really interesting about, was it a landscape of care or an idea of, of care in the uh, interspecies um, construction and I wondered if you could just say something about that about how you felt about this whole um, entity of sound that you created and its its meaning and things like that yeah um thank you that's a really good um yeah really good question and it's um the 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 way that I'd um oh it, it's 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 really good to hear as well that you kind of felt that the sound was was kind of foregrounded in it or that that, that perhaps mm. that felt like the um the core of the um the the video um and i tried to keep the the visuals um try to i tried to create because often with with listening or when when making sort of a sound based um work I think that there's always this sense that you need to also create space within that to sort of kind of allow people to um be able to to listen and 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 I think with with this um there's kind of a dent that I approached it was sort of kind of ignoring that one in a way and kind of it having this sort of density to it as if you know what would what 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 could it possibly be like if you could hear all of the things, all the kind of frequencies, and at the same time, um, and how, how sort of abundant, but also really um, overwhelming that might be, and and um, perhaps not quite being able to sort of locate your yourself within it. Um, so, um, mm. in terms of um, yeah, and it 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 is a a combination of um kind of non-human sounds but also non-human animal sounds but also geologic uh vibrations mm. and radio frequencies um um which are, are kind of operate operating on so there, so there and, I, and i suppose as well with the idea of the um the, the sort of proposal of sort of nu nuclear power is uh, it, uh, is kind of a 
it goes into sort of a deep future as well as a kind of deep past and 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 thinking about how that how those sort of materials um or how how that sort of materially and conceptually kind of resonates um and how perhaps using using sound um um is maybe a, a sort of another way into sort of thinking about about those things and thinking about the um the kind of contamination or leakiness between these different um kind of layers within within the landscape and the the point you raised um towards the end was um again thinking about the idea of care um and it comes from um Thora Pitchers Dottir and Bjorna Olsen um who are archaeologists um who were proposing that perhaps if we think about care not as um a human um activity I think is that how they describe it perhaps um but that it's 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 a sort of um it's a it's a it's not a sort of human only kind of capacity um and that perhaps um by sort of thinking about thinking about care being something that is a capacity that can be recognized and nurtured across species um that there can be this sort of learning um that happens um and i think you know there's things within that as well that kind of watching the other the other visit videos and and presentations it kind of seems that there's these threads that are running through everyone's um contributions mm. yeah so i don't know if that quite <laughs> answers <laughs> yeah thank thank you thank you um it it definitely does and and i think um perhaps have, having something that encapsulates those things um a sort of entity of sound makes it possible to have the the conversations across um you know interspecies and you know between the different um modes of communication in there so thank you that was great yeah i think it's an incredibly um clear kind of image and set of sensations that um just as kind of natasha picked up on the way the sound becomes there's a hugeness to it that kind of actually really for me helped um make this kind of the enormity of, of this kind of nuclear material that can so easily kind of disappear but that, that is there kind of living uh in this kind of long time producing living in the in the kind of sense uh that we developed it in in the kind of lively materiality panel that kind of like existing producing kind of like um uh in ways that are picked up and kind of you know leak into all sorts of other forms of life and that it actually really helped me kind of grasp a sense of that in a way that I don't think I've kind of really thought of before and it's incredibly just to add in a kind of contemporary um a current link in France there's a big um debate because obviously like France is hugely hugely reliant on nuclear power which is one of the ways that it's kind of in some definitions kind of done quite well in terms of green energy. Uh, there's like 80 70 or 80% or something of France's energy comes from nuclear, but then this kind of generation of power stations are, are coming to the end of their lives. So, so there's this big debate on, do we kind of reinvest in nuclear um, and can we really call nuclear green? And then, you know, like, uh, or is there gonna be this kind of big switch towards ge like genuinely renewable energies? And I just think this kind of work could actually be so important in that in that debate about kind of rendering tangible and sensible um, what's at stake in in that. So, I just wanted to kind of um, add that in. Um, but perhaps we can come back to it if you would like to ask um, the surrealists. Yeah, great. Um, so, um, yeah, I really enjoyed the use of the speculative fiction and also to try and, and try and think about kind of the amount the sort of conflicts as well um with you know within within thinking about these things um and uh one of the things i was going to ask you about about in, in particular um 
was the the bureau of of night skies and the you you spoke about um this kind of need to regulate and perhaps the intentions of that being um being good but also it being perhaps this um this top down um and also the the impossibility of actually being able to to manage or regulate these things and and I think you you talk about contamination as well so I was thinking about regulation and contamination and also then listening to Nicola's presentation earlier um and um that idea of this the the uncomfortable or the the unfamiliar sounds and how that um those those kind of going going with with that and seeing that um seeing that disturbance as open up opening up political possibilities um and for me kind of hearing that presentation again made me think again of your of your video um so i don't have a question as such but i wondered whether you might elaborate more on this idea of zoning and regulation and the sort of impossibilities of that yeah, this was definitely kind of a central theme that that kept coming up and something that struck me about the sort of real life example that it was based off of with the people, you know, unleashing butterflies because they felt like, you know, we we sort of can't wait for this, you know, slow moving government and maybe slow moving scientists. We, we need to take kind of urgent action. So there's definitely an interesting tension there about, um, you know, what is what are the best approaches? What is the best way to manage in a time of climate crisis? And, and I imagine it will kind of keep we'll keep seeing examples of this of different different groups that have different different viewpoints and it's not necessarily a bad thing to have different viewpoints but it can you in a weird way you sort of lose sight or lose lose hearing of um you know what the the main kind of crux of what what you're all aiming for so you know with the bureau um we had come up with a number of different you know sort of backstories with the bureau and um the i, I don't maybe I'll let Anjali speak a little bit about the the sound walk, the idea of the sound walk that the Bureau is doing. But um, we just wanted to, yeah, think through, okay, what are the ways that currently, like in, in the United States, there's like an amazing, um, crazy chart that sort of um, divvies up all of the, you know, spectrum of like, you know, uses for radio waves, but also machinery. And it has all of these different, you know, kind of users of sound or um, sound frequencies and yet it misses all of the creatures that that use all those frequencies as well. So we created kind of an insane chart that would try to map on, you know, the other creatures. If you had to really like literally, okay, we have to divvy up the, the bandwidth, um, you know, as equally as we can. And of course it would be impossible and it probably wouldn't work. So that was something we wanted to just kind of play with was like the strange ways as humans, we were trying to concretize, um, systematize, you know, put things in boxes and charts but of course that's not really the phenomenon that you're thinking about so it's it's just an interesting tension there and then Anjali I don't know if you wanted to talk about the sound walk and the inspiration kind of behind that the audio that you did for for the bureau um yeah I don't have a ton to say about the sound walk other than that we were thinking of the ways in which the bureau might try to observe and collect samples and information. And so, um, yeah, the, the uh, bureau piece that was in the video is actually part of a longer piece that was constructed from like an actual sound walk that I did um, in Brooklyn um, and just sort of the various sonic encounters that this agent would have and try to monitor and control. But sort of to add to what Miriam was saying, yeah, I think there's, I think especially with government, there's a tendency to want to regulate uh, and control things that they can't really control. And that's sort of like a way that the government maintains power. So I think that was, we wanted to embed that into the narrative. There's sort of a lot of layers uh, to the story that I think we're looking forward to developing further. And I think that is definitely one of them. And also thinking about how, uh, in terms of sharing bandwidth, how that type of system could be corrupted by those who are already in power and those who already have the loudest voices um, in the public sphere. 
Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think this kind of these characters and these sets of characters are so again actually make so clear at things that you know we're trying to get at so much with these kind of like different perspectives that people are coming through and actually just seeing these kind of you know like um playing it forward that far somehow makes it so much clearer these kind of like tensions between um the different standpoints and as you kind of said at the beginning Miriam like um that actually there's such an kind of an irresolution between you know like um the power system you know like there are kind of different solutions that in a way almost might get to a similar point like this idea of kind of public-led city-led rewilding versus this idea of kind of guerrilla rewilding or even in Paris we kind of have publicly sanctioned guerrilla rewilding where like you adopt a patch of earth around a tree and then you're allowed to kind of grow what you want within kind of constraints um <clears throat> so kind of yeah it really renders um kind of comprehensible but also like f funny and uh, funny as well like these kind of like uh relationships that are playing out now I thought it was brilliant uh to do that um you. no you're welcome I wasn't just buttering you up so that you can ask me <laughs> <laughs> something um but would you yeah, like to yeah John I think yeah I think your piece is actually really great to sort of end on and open up a wider discussion. Um, I found um, the whole piece to be very meditative. I thought the pacing was really spot on in terms of sort of the big questions that you were asking in between. Um, I think as a, as a viewer and listener, I got to really sit with them and think about them. And one theme that kept coming up was this idea of decoration, using other species as decoration or using them in a way that is beneficial to humans. And uh, that bringing up the question of what if these non-human life forms were actually stakeholders and what would that mean and what would be the inevitable complications in trying to make them stakeholders? Like, does that inevitably, um, center human perspectives or human ways of understanding the ecology and soundscape because we were we were talking about the example of I think it was in New Zealand that a maybe New Zealand that a river was granted citizenship um, and thinking about what that actually meant how the river gains agency but only through sort of this existing human framework um, and so going from there, I found the, the term public acoustics to be really interesting as perhaps um, a way to respond to th those types of questions. And yeah, we were all sort of curious to hear you speak more about public acoustics and the concept of trees as public acousticians. Yeah, thank you so much. I feel nervous now because, yeah, I realized really, you know, this was a kind of meditation and a starting point of, of questions for me. And I definitely haven't answered them. And I suppose um, bringing this colloquium together feels more like now we have all of this on the table and can kind of go and start to actually try and, and answer some of these things, even if the aim is more this kind of mapping out of what there is at stake, of who's working on it in different ways. But I suppose I maybe coming back to a point in the um, introduction, I was talking about what rewilding practice uh, more than space itself. Um, so I suppose that means um, allowing or kind of um, recognizing limitations and kind of allowing those to reach certain points and see where they get picked up by other species, perhaps, um, you know, you're totally right that, that that issue of kind of translating into human frameworks, um, a set of rights and kind of imagining that they can be kind of put in the same framework. Uh, so yeah, perhaps it's instead about kind of sitting back and realizing that all life forms kind of express preference in certain ways. Um, and that might not be able, you know, again, I was kind of mentioning at the beginning, like listening is a metaphor for something that goes beyond a focus on sound as a particular kind of realm of materiality. It's more about kind of um, 
trying to just be able to um, receive communication in, in multiple different ways that then kind of realizing that actually, you know, all life forms are kind of already seeking out to seeking the ability to live in their kind of rightfulness or to, to in, inhabit their rights. Um, it, they're just kind of doing it in ways, you know, by refusing to grow and actually kind of absence of life forms in certain places, perhaps um, it, it is evidence of their refusal to exist within that kind of setting. And, and it's a, that already is an expression of preference. So, you know, looking at looking at places within the city and not just thinking, well, that life form isn't here and therefore that's not at stake. Actually kind of thinking, well, why, why are things absent? Why are things present? Um, and kind of what work is already being done rather than kind of like, you know, what can we invite or bring in, you know, recognizing the work that's already being done, I suppose, um, and that's in kind of network with with the work that we do to construct um, our, our living environment in all sorts of different ways. So that's the kind of first bit. And then you mentioned public acoustics. Um, yeah, I guess I'm really interested in acoustics as infrastructures to be realized through sound rather than as kind of soundings or things to kind of listen directly to. And yeah, in a way that one's more simple in the sense that kind of trees um, do, a, I, I don't know, I've never studied it scientifically, but I guess they do a bunch of things like they kind of create a white noise, the way that like their leaves blow in the wind that kind of maybe blocks out or kind of creates a buffer within which we can hear each other's voices quite clearly like the fact that there's a lot of trees probably means there's not a lot of you know kind of other certain types of machines or um, just a kind of correlation between trees and, and spaces that you can hear and acoustic conditions with it within which um, you can hear uh, yourself each other and therefore also start to kind of either through your ears or through kind of other forms of reception, maybe tune into these expressions of preference, these refusals or noticing this work that's kind of being done in other ways. And, you know, it's all classically like this kind of thing that is, you know, you construct this way of thinking it and talking it in a setting like this. Of course, the, the challenge is to really inhabit that when walking out of the door after this, you know, panel. So I think that's, that's the interesting um, thing there. And, um gosh like we've come to 10 minutes before the end of this um discussion which is so rich and so wonderful um so what i'd like to do is just kind of trace the the circle uh, again just to kind of bring these concepts we've collectively perhaps um developed back to the to the center whilst inviting people to add in concepts thoughts questions you know collectively perhaps summing up some of the conversations from the day in the chat please do that you know I'll try to bring them in if I've got time or they're also that's a kind of parallel conversation which is a value in itself um, but yeah just kind of tracing background from kind of states as things that change and not fixing the way uh, we think the city sounds but kind of uh, finding ways to kind of render it audible at certain points uh, coming on to skeletons I thought that was a really nice um, a really nice word Natasha that you used of also kind of not overly uh, marking or kind of um, dictating a, a, and um, the way that uh, Sarah kind of suggested asked are they invitations to listen to it reminded me of um, the work that Gassier and I have been doing around scoring um, as a kind of um, infrastructure or framework for for listening so states in flux skeletons and scoring then a kind of abundance and excess and kind of completely uh, sound that's beyond the human and what we can ever imagine hearing through directly through our own ears then the impossibility of kind of regulating um, of of planning um, and the uncomfortable um, which relates relates back to the previous panel as well the importance of kind of recognizing that uh, once we start tuning in and listening, um, it's not all pleasant things that we're going to hear, you know, it's also things that might be contesting us and our presence um, and, yeah, the impossibility uh, and the kind of perhaps inevitability of failure of forms of like management or 
uh, and the humorousness almost of that, the kind of like pathos of like all of us trying to kind of intervene and, and on some level kind of failing in, in where that comes from and, and what its effect is. So yeah, for me, they're kind of all really, um, they all start to kind of sketch out elements of, a, of an actual kind of sonic urbanism. And I think that's really interesting. Would you like, do you have any, um, anything to add in there? Um, Gaiti Lyrique has just posted, reminding us all that there will be performances uh, after this. Um, so while you're thinking of, of uh, what you'd like to add in, I'll just kind of second that reminder. In a minute, I'll ask um, Gassia will come and um, join me come and join me on Zoom um, and we will uh, just kind of reflect on the day a little bit, but also um, present those performances, which will then be happening at 6.15 Paris time on a different link that you is in the chat now. That's also on the Gaiti Lyrique uh, Plan Écran homepage that we will post everywhere we can think of posting. So yeah, that's just a little public service announcement. But yeah, coming back to um, the, the group here um, for you, from all of this like yeah what are you seeing as the kind of strategies or problematics for either a sonic urbanism or the way that that sonic urbanism is perhaps trying to construct uh, or could try and construct a trans species urban society using some of these tools um are we going in a round but maybe no I not at all we're freeform now um but maybe i'll just i'll just say something that i've been kind of thinking about um maybe it's not so positive but it kind of comes in the scheme of things, which is, um, um, I think Alex Delil mentioned also uh, Maury Schaffer's work on the sounding, tuning into the soundscape, tuning of the soundscape, um, and also some problematics within that. But in that book, he kind of um, thinks about the kind of how different forms of power have been materialized through sounds. So who sounds the loudest actually is the kind of status quo of power and how that's been going on with um, urban cities in the past, for example, uh, complaining about the city criers and other modes of kind of uh, sonic expressions that have been silenced. Um, and thinking about kind of other species that have been silenced by other modes of, of sonic interventions in the urban soundscape. And, and a lot of kind of species extinctions of what can be heard. And, and through my piece, I was thinking about what can be heard by the human. But as we enter this kind of new era of nanotechnology and um, yeah, this kind of micro world of things, um, where do we position ourselves in terms of not being able to hear them or the forms of power that we're also not able to hear anymore. So it's kind of a negative form of, of power that is kind of underlying everything. And also just on top of that, which is already a lot to think about. But actually I was thinking of Natasha, uh, Nastasha's work within that and the kind of nuclear power and the, the sounding of like infrasounds and to, to detract various species and, and the kind of consequences it also has on, on how it operates. Um, but also I'm also thinking about in a negative term, um, what we're, able, we're not able to hear in cities, but how the cityscape is complicit in, in other forms of, of repression and uh, violence that operate in other spaces like um, certain rural spaces or monocultures that produce the food that we eat. Um, and so I'm kind of really interested in how we can bring back somehow possibly to the city um, the, the functions that we need for performing life that are kind of closer to us and that we can listen to or attune to in a, in a more practical way so that we're not um, alienated for what's actually happening in other in other spaces, sonic and, and material in all senses. So that's my kind of <laughs> out there question. Yeah, I mean, just to, um, there was a question earlier in the chat uh, for the previous panel uh, from Sara El Saman, but um, I think actually it's just quite relevant to what you were saying. And it's nice to kind of bring it in as well um, that, um, we've talked about listening as a way of bridging worlds. Um, could this contact zone evolve into a zone of dialogue without the human soundscape um, being the loudest? So I think it speaks a bit to what you were just saying of kind of can, you know, what actual back and forth can there really be and what, it, what will the power structure be within that kind of, in that zone as well? Um, did anyone else want to come in there at all? I, 
I was just going to say briefly, because it, it, it relates a bit, but in, in the work that I was doing, considering um, the collective of a species, I, I was interested in, in that, in the idea of getting to know a species as a collective, rather than I felt I was generally identifying with species before I started thinking about it as an individual, you know, a, a bird singing or something like that. And I, I was quite interested by the idea of, you know, why, why don't we make spaces um, where um, a large number of species would like to live, you know, like the frogs in my film or the, or the roost, you know, why does the roost have to be um, in, a, in, in a park, you know, away somewhere, nobody knows where it is. Maybe you could um, uh, invite those kind of um, sonic experiences, you know, um, into, into more into the heart of the city. And I was, I was interested by that idea. I, I, I don't know if, if we could do it, but I think it's, it's interesting. And, and it, it would it would change something, of course, but it also, um, you know, when you think back in time, cities were much more, um, they had much more sort of cracks and crevices and places where creatures could live, you know, where birds could nest or, and um, the architecture's got a lot to do with it. The, the way that we make buildings now, there are no spaces for, for creatures to inhabit. And it's interesting to think how you break that down, but maybe do it in a different way. And I, I, I just love this idea of sort of big, big sounds, big wild sounds like that, like the passenger pigeons, you know, coming back into the city. Yeah, actually aiming for kind of noise, aiming for noisier cities, actually, in a way, kind of aiming for, there's a lot of silence and a lot of, of kind of absence, actually, in cities, even if there's certain forms of sound that we find very um damaging and therefore we experience cities as noisy because of the quality of those particular sounds not necessarily i guess because of the overall kind of volume of, of noise and i actually think thinking about this and through through today i'm really at that point of kind of you know wanting us to live amongst more yeah as you say bigger uh noise and bigger as a kind of very sorry i'm looking at the <laughs> bigger as a, a very um broad term in terms of a you know more diverse as well as just kind of um, more expansive and, and louder even perhaps. Um, perhaps no need to, to leave, but perhaps I could just ask um, you to bring Gassia into the, um, into the call, uh, into the Zoom, Gaitilierik team. Um, could you just please bring Gassia in if you're um, happy to do that, Gassia, and then um, we can perhaps just reflect a little bit more kind of together on the day um, and as I said Gassi is going to also just um, present the performances that are going to come on a little bit later this evening. Um, while Gassi joins, um, are you there? Yes. Um, yes Johnny. Just, hi Gassi, good to see you again. Um, yeah I mean there's way too much to kind of try and, and speak uh, from the day and part of, oh, this is a perfect segue into a, into a plug, but part of the, the follow-up work will be for us to um, develop a, a third, uh, to bring together a third edition of this book, Sonic Urbanism, Sonic Urbanism 2, which was the political voice. And uh, this will be the third book edited by and beyond uh, collective. Uh, of uh, editors, designers, um, and perhaps expanding even more on, on the way we do that. So the work has just kind of begun in terms of bringing these ideas together, going beyond perhaps publishing things exactly as they are and, you know, us developing those thoughts. But just to kind of list, I mean, I've got this list of things that have come up in the day from technologies of attunement, um, architectures of non-human dwelling, um, Going back to the, the pigeon towers, I was then thinking about um, what political economy making these architectures re will require if we start to kind of build for non-humans, uh, what, e what economy will be that, that be based on? Will it be social housing for non-humans or will it be a kind of return of an urban agrarian economy of vernacular informal structures that are built as kind of part of other activities and economies like the pigeon towers, questions of public and private, how non-humans traverse um, what we perceive as public and private, what their own you know, senses of public and private are. 
Um, the fact that politics, you know, all of all of this really is a kind of discussion of um, politics, uh, who is we, who is listening, what struggles are shared between whom, who or what is exploited in, in ideas of kind of, um, yeah, perhaps even ideas of rewilding, are there, are there exploita exploitations um, within that? Um, and that the same outcome can be got to by a lot of different means, um, and those means are very much kind of political in a sense. Animals hearing humans, not just the other way around, expanding our ethics, uh, the transformed spatiality that comes uh, from taking account of a broader definition of life, even beyond animals and plants towards kind of energy flows, uh, waves, and how they kind of completely shift um, our idea of containment, solidity, boundaries, borders, coherence, um, the vitality of non-humans, uh, the importance of stories, and the inextricability of stories from song, I noticed throughout the day that um, many of us have kind of been weaving together speech and sound and, and music in ways that are almost like epic poems, um, you know, kind of helping us to create new mythologies that challenge perhaps scientific knowledge in the way that Gassia was mentioning. Um, yeah, challenges to human modes of constructing meaning. Um, importance of challenging ideas that these encounters will always be smooth or evident that there will be conflict there will be disturbance um, and that will you know kind of navigating that will be part of this shift um, becoming curious about all of the kinds of life and liveliness that surround our uses and misuses of animals I think I was thinking there about food production and Melissa's work on kind of um, invoking a curiosity of something that then might be quite disturbing this kind of you know the the voices of animals whilst they produce the food uh that that we um take pleasure in but then also thinking of animal pleasure uh hearing um disease disease and crises in the way that gassi was talking about hearing a shift in soundscape because of a, a kind of anthropocenic disease of COVID-19, but then also um, hearing crises within the natural world and, and kind of tuning into uh, quietness as actually a kind of evidence of that crisis perhaps. Um, and then coming back to things that echoed into this conversation as well, voices as recording devices um, that pick up, make and translate cultures, whether those voices um, be those of birds, which have a culture that shifts, languages that shift um, according to their surroundings in, in the ways that human languages do as well. And then sounds from uh, the past or the way that past sounds live in the present um, or kind of using sound to tap into uh, things like nuclear waste that kind of is this deep past that's still kind of emanating energy and, uh, and pollution in different ways. So, incredibly rich and just like um so yeah so exciting and kind of uh like terrifying as well <laughs> in in the action that it, it calls us to but yeah i really hope we can kind of all go away with um some more of these these kind of textures built into our practices and, and thinking so that's um that's my view on the day <laughs> um Gassia, did you have anything to add or would you like to uh, just kind of talk a bit about the performances that are going to be coming up um, at 6.15 Paris time? Um, just to say thank you. I mean, I was uh, so um, captivated by this last panel and the work of these brilliant filmmakers. And I was just thinking, John, you mentioned the um, next publication of this uh, colloquium series, the Sonic Urbanism series that you've been putting out. And you had also mentioned that um, we may at some point in the future assemble and together and um, real space. <laughs> uh, so I think it would be so lovely to kind of gather and uh, screen and watch some of these um, incredible films, I think, together and reflect on them. Um, I think, you know, one reflection on the day is that the idea of disturbance has been coming up a lot. And, um, you know, I think we're living in an extreme moment of disturbance and flux and crisis and emergency. And we're all uh, filtering this through our bodies and our lives. And it's coming out as well in, you know, these discussions. Um, I really value uh, what Tetramundi has done in terms of bringing together these, you know, many, many different threads 
through this realm of sonic urbanism, non-human others, it inspired me to think about, you know, these collaborations with non-human others. It's something I hadn't really thought about before in the kind of sound art world, let's say, um, you know, but also, you know, listening the kind of politics uh, of listening in cities and um, yeah, these uh, moving, as you said, John, beyond kind of sound as object and sonic environments as objects, but as uh, really like political and cultural and social ecologies. And I think this was an early question of yours, you know, what is what makes a sociable acoustics? Anyhow, um, but going back to this kind of uh, theme of disturbance, you know, I, I just wanted to say this idea that sound is also a disturbance, <laughs> you know, that's an idea that's been circulating uh, in Western cultures for sure since the time of Aristotle, who was ta talking about sound as a disturbance of the air. And I just think it's very interesting that we have, um, you know, these philosophies of sound, which are thinking about sound as at, at once a very powerful and fragile you know, medium, it's kind of uh, penetrating a, a space, uh, permeating a medium, um, corrupting and even destroying objects. People used to think that sound waves would, you know, destroy objects. Um, but then it's also this oscillating, vacillating, kind of quavering, trembling <laughs> medium. And um, my point that I'm uh, trying to make is um, this kind of interdisciplinary, I think, um, assemblage that we have here. Uh, I heard, you know, in the kind of breakout room, someone saying, I don't consider myself an expert in sound. But actually, I would say it's really for me, this non expertise that we could all <laughs> embrace, you know, I, I don't really consider myself an expert either, even if that's kind of my field or discipline. Um, because it's actually something which is, I think, continuously in flux, something that we're continuously reevaluating. Uh, so I would just you know, encourage us to embrace that kind of position. And that's something that Catherine Clover's work, I think also invites us to do in this idea of unlearning. And that's also something I think that John, you are very interested in. You actually hosted a really nice workshop one time called Unlearning Through Listening. Um, in any case, so um, I've been inspired by today. There's going to be a, I think really lovely uh, group of two performances tonight. And I'm just going to quickly introduce them. Um, so it's starting at, is it uh, 6.30? Um, 6.15 sorry, uh, 6 Paris 15 time. Paris time. So, so 5.15 UK and then wherever else you may be. And um, so the first performance is going to be called, uh, it's called Radio Gardening in Lagos. And it's involving uh, a number of artists and uh, makers and thinkers. Monai de Paula Antunas, who's an artistic researcher and director and founder of the Archipel Stations Community Radio. Sital Solanki, who is a founder of Matata'ur, a relational practice focused on building and bridging kinships between ourselves, materials, the immaterial and the virtual. T-Shine, who was born Inola Babatunde, who is a singer, rapper, and chanter based in Lagos Island, and who's a headliner for the Street Lights Collective. Uh, Tushar Hathia Ramani, who's a creative design and cultural curator, who's concerned with ecosystems and the commons in urban landscapes. And they're going to present uh, Radio Gardening Lagos, which is going to be a live radio stream simultaneously from two cities, Lagos, Nigeria, and Blanca in Spain. And what they write is, our performance is a live transmission of a compilation of sounds, which they collected via Telegram, the software Telegram, and using the plant wave device. Uh, they're going to be live via Telegram voice chat function and connected to their itinerant studio based now in Blanca using audio hijack, um, which allows them to create different live stream outputs, including YouTube live. And they're going to then uh, broadcast the performance on their web radios, which are Archipel stations and street lights radio. Um, and uh, the second performance is going to be a live uh, reinterpretation of a, a work called Sunny Side. Um, by Mathilde Mirelesh. She's a recordist, sound artist, and researcher who's making use of field recordings to compose site-oriented projects and whose work takes the form of concerts and installations as well as, as, well as digital releases. And she does community-based uh, sound work as well. Um, and this is a really, for me, uh, fascinating work because she recorded this during lockdown 
from her home in Belfast uh, on Sunnyside Street. And that's why it's called Sunnyside. And she's trying to draw attention to kind of the sounds of domestic life during lockdown, but as kind of amplified through these um, different kinds of recording technologies, some that are recording the electromagnetic uh, frequency spectrum that we can't normally hear. She makes those audible or using contact microphones, but also picking up kind of incidental, accidental sounds that are just happening to be, you know, sounds of human life, sounds of non-human life from inside the home. And that's probably an experience that a lot of us, you know, are <laughs> now deeply familiar with kind of uh, resensitizing ourselves to the, you know, uh, sounds of the home, but also so she's drawing attention to how then the home is um, connected to other kinds of urban infrastructures and what's coming in, the water and the electricity and the internet activity. And so, um, so there's going to be two, uh, as I said, performances in that slot. And uh, what Mathilde wanted me to mention was that uh, please feel free if you have wireless headphones, for example, do put them in. You're very welcome to roam around your own domestic space if you're in one or whichever space you happen to be in. So don't feel you have to uh, sit at the computer. You can run around and uh, explore. It'll feel a bit different, I think, if you're doing that. And um, there will be, as John said, a chat, which I will be hoping and trying to animate <laughs> in the Gaete Lyrique um, website. There's a kind of chat function. Just if others are having this uh, issue too, I, I first couldn't see it, but so you have to kind of log in and then you have to refresh and then you can kind of, it'll come up there. Um, please, please hang out because otherwise I will be animating nothing. <laughs> so it'll be lovely to see you all there. And just to say thanks again, this was wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Garcia. Yeah, I'll be there. Hopefully um, some of the other participants through the day might join us there. Um, and just another reminder that it's a different link. So there's a, a new link on the Gaete Lyric site um, with the performances, uh, the same setup, the stream with the chat next to it. So um, yeah, and hopefully the artists will be able to, um, or some of them will be able to kind of regather there on the chat afterwards. And we can kind of continue the exchange, perhaps as we all have a drink somewhere, wherever we are, depending what time zone you're in, um, <clears throat> I certainly will be. And um, yeah, I mean, I thank you so much for, for those um, thoughts you just brought in as well, Gassia. It's uh, difficult to kind of end a day like this and to kind of think what the, the last word for such incredibly like urgent, rich, um, broad, you know, and incredibly beautiful, uh, like um, contributions, work, uh, research, and and artistic projects. So just yeah, a huge thank you uh, to you all. Um, have a little break. Join the new link at six fifteen uh, Paris time in fifteen minutes time, and enjoy um, the performances. And just. Uh, shouting out to um, the Radio Gardening in Lagos whole team and to Matilda, huge, huge thank you uh, from me as well for doing these. I'm so excited to hear these two incredible experiments kind of come to life. So um, that's it from, from me here at Gaiti Lyrique. Thank you so much to the team here as well who are all ready to go home. Uh, good night and enjoy the rest. Thank you so much.